Yes, I do, he said, marveling at how calm his voice sounded. They're battleships from a group called the Trade Federation. Members of your republic? Cardas hesitated. Technically speaking, yes, he said. But these days they seem to be largely ignoring our laws and directives. He forced himself to meet Thrawn's gaze. But you already knew where they were from, didn't you? The whole markings follow a similar pattern to those on the Bargain Hunter, Thrawn said. I thought there was a reasonable chance they were from your Republic. But they don't represent the Republic itself, Cardas added hastily. The Republic doesn't have any army of its own. So you've told me, Thrawn said, his voice suddenly cold. You also told me the Republic doesn't condone slavery. That's right, we don't, Cardas agreed cautiously. Then why did I find evidence of slavery aboard the ship that was pursuing you? The rings of tension around Cardas's chest tightened a few more turns. He'd forgotten all about Praga. I also told you there were some cultures in our area that do keep slaves, he said, fighting to keep his voice steady. The huts are one of them. And the Trade Federation? No, Cardas said. Well, not that I've ever heard anyway. They're so heavily into droids they probably wouldn't know what to do with slaves if they had them. Cardas nodded toward the display. Which could be a serious problem for us right now. Each of those battleships carries over a thousand droid starfighters not to mention a few thousand battle droids and the landers and carriers to move them around. Then this is an invasion force? Cardas winced. I don't know, he said. I don't think so, not with only two of them. But they could be here to attack us. I don't know why they're here, Cardas insisted, sweat gathering around his collar. It was one thing to listen to Thrawn talk about preemptive strikes against vicious conquerors like the Vigari. It was something else entirely to stand here and see him mentally lumping the Trade Federation, or even the entire Republic into that same category. Why don't you ask them? A faint smile creased Thrawn's face. Yes. Why don't we? He swiveled around. Communications, identify their main command frequency and create a channel, he ordered. These people speak basic, I presume? Yes, Cardas said, frowning. Surely the commander wasn't going to try something this potentially tricky in a language he'd barely learned, was he? But they'll also have protocol droids aboard that can translate side bisti. Thank you. But I'd prefer to see their reaction when they're hailed in the language of the Republic, Thrawn said. Ready, Commander, the comm officer called. Thrawn tapped a key on his board. This is Commander Mithran Urodo of the Chiss Expansionary Defense Fleet, he said. Please identify yourselves and state your intentions. Doriana was still fumbling with his tunic belt as he hurried through the open blast doors onto the bridge. What's this about an attack? He asked as he crossed the walkways to where Kev stood in front of his command chair. Soothe yourself, Commander Stratus, Kev said. It is not as serious as was first thought. This is Commander Mithra Nurodo of the Chiss Expansionary Defense Fleet a voice said from the comm speaker beside the vice lord's chair. Please identify yourselves and state your intentions. He has been repeating that message for ten minutes, Kev said contemptuously. But then, what else can he do? Explain, Doriana growled. After being hauled out of bed, he was in no mood to put up with Nymoidian smugness. You can start by telling me who he is. How should I know? Kev said scornfully. But he is a braggart beyond anything I have yet seen. He seated himself in his chair and touched a control, 
and a tactical overlay appeared on the main display. Behold, he said, waving his long fingers. He dares to threaten us with three small cruisers and nine fighters. Most likely they are pirates with a sense of bluff as large as a dug's pride. The message repeated. I hear no threat in that message, Vice Lord. Doriana pointed out, trying to suppress his growing annoyance. He'd been dragged out of bed for this. All I hear is a local asking what we're doing in his territory. The threat is implied, Commander Stratus, Cav countered. It is built into all warships, as much a part of them as weapons and shields. Doriana looked at the tactical, then at the corresponding telescope display. Even knowing where the ships were, it was incredibly hard to pick them out of the starfield behind them. Superb stealthing, which meant that Cav was right. They were warships, all right. Maybe he's got more firepower hanging back in reserve. No, Cav assured him. We have done a complete sensor scan of the entire area. Those twelve ships are all there are. This is Commander Mithran Urodo Dash. Shall we consider this an unscheduled drill? Cav added as the message continued to play in the background. Let's try talking first, Doriana suggested, sitting down on the couch beside the other. The fact that this Mithran Urodo spoke basic might very well mean he was a pirate with some familiarity with some of the outer reaches of the Republic. But it could also mean this was a trick by person or persons unknown to smoke out the truth about the Darkvenge's mission. Open a hailing channel, he ordered. Open. Doriana reached over to Cav's station and keyed the control. I greet you, Commander Mithran Urodo he said, stumbling a bit over the unusual glottals at the section breaks. This is Stratus, Commanding Special Task Force One. My greetings in return, Commander Stratus. Mithran Urodo's voice came back. Please explain to me the purpose of your task force. We intend no harm to you or your people, Doriana said. But I'm afraid the details of our mission must remain confidential. I'm afraid in turn that your reassurances are insufficient, Mithran Urodo said. Beside Doriana, Cav muttered something. I'm sorry, Commander, Doriana said, throwing a warning look at the Nymoidian. Unfortunately, I'm under orders. Why do you waste time this way? Cav demanded. Cursing under his breath, Doriana lunged for the mute control. With all due respect, Vice Lord, what do you think you're doing? What do you think you are doing? Cav countered. They are no more than a parasite fly fluttering against the window. Let us destroy them and be done with it. If you don't mind, I'd first like to find out who they are and where they come from, Doriana said, summoning every bit of patience he could muster. We can learn that from their charred remains. Kev said, drawing himself up to his fill height. And you are not in command of this fleet, Stratus. I am. Yes, of course, Doriana said, shifting quickly to a more soothing tone. But it was too late. The Vice Lord had decided to take offense at the unintentional slight, and had also concluded this was a quick and easy victory ripe for the plucking. With a Nymoidian, that was a bad combination. The time for talk is over, Cav announced. With a decisive jab of his finger, he cut off the calm channel. Order the Keeper to launch half its droid starfighters. He called across the bridge, gesturing toward the Second Trade Federation battleship. Three groups will attack the intruders, the rest forming a defense screen around the task force. And order a transfer of command. I will control all the starfighters from here. Yes, Vice Lord, one of the Nymoidians said. Do we launch our starfighters as well? We will hold them in reserve, 
Kev looked at Doriana. In case they have reinforcements on the way, he added almost grudgingly. Doriana sighed silently to himself. He would have liked to find out more about this Mithran Urodo and his chis before they were slaughtered. He could only hope there would be enough wreckage left to examine. Here they come, Kardas said, pointing at the display. Droid starfighters, you see them? Yes, of course, Thrawn said calmly. All vessels, pull back. Kardas, you said droids can think and act on their own. Do these droid starfighters also have that capability? I don't think so, Kardas said, trying to unfreeze his mind and think as the spring hawk began moving backward. The sight of this many incoming Trade Federation starfighters was enough to rattle anyone. No, I'm sure they don't. They're remotely controlled in groups from one of the battleships. Calm? Thrawn called. Have you located and identified their control frequencies? Yes, Commander, the comm officer reported. The control appears to be secured with a rolling encryption system. I estimate maximum range to be 10,000 vis via. Pull us back to 11,000, Thrawn ordered, turning back to Kardas. 10,000 vis via is approximately 16,000 of your kilometers. Does that sound like the correct operating range? Kardas spread his hands helplessly. I'm sorry, but I don't know. No apologies needed, Thrawn assured him. At any rate, we'll know soon enough. Enemy fighters still approaching, one of the crewers warned. Main group is holding back. Interesting, Thrawn said thoughtfully. The main body appears to be forming a defensive screen around the larger vessels. Considering his numerical advantage, this commander Stratus seems unusually cautious. That's typical of the Nymoidians who build and run these things. Kardas told him, feeling a frown creasing his forehead. Now that he thought about it, though, Stratus's voice had sounded human, not Nymoidian. Could the Trade Federation have started selling or leasing their battleships? Attackers pulling back, the censor officer called. Reforming into an outer screen between us and the fleet. Apparently, we were correct about the 10,000 Visvia range, Thrawn concluded. Excellent. So what do we do now? Kardas asked, eyeing the swarming starfighters uneasily. For a moment Thrawn sat silently, his eyes narrowed as he gazed at the displays. We try an experiment, he said at last. Whirlwind, move to deployment position. Fighter 4, probe attack, course 115 by 381. There were two acknowledgments, and Kardas watched as one of the other two Springhawk-sized ships broke away from the group, heading to starboard, while one of the nine fighters headed off the opposite direction. What kind of experiment? He asked. With so many fighters to control, I suspect the system designers didn't have room to be overly clever, Thrawn said. Let's see just how clever they were. Incoming! One of the Nymoidians in the control pits called sharply. Single fighter, vector 042 by 088. The fool, Kev said with a snort. Does he think us inattentive? Outer group, intercept and destroy. Doriana watched the displays as the three groups of droid starfighters reformed from their outer picket screen and swung to intercept the lone alien fighter. But they had barely settled into their attack vector when the intruder broke off, swinging around in a tight curve and hurrying back to the safety of distance. Return them to patrol, Cav ordered. Does this Mithrado not realize how badly he is outmatched? 
Maybe all he wants is to sit back there out of range and watch us. Doriana pointed out. I don't need to remind you that we can't afford to have witnesses around when outbound flight gets here. Do you suggest they are Senate spies? Or they might be from the Jedi, or from Palpatine, or from someone else, Doriana said. All I know is that no one this far from the Republic should be speaking basic. He comes at us again, Vice Lord, the Nymoidian at the censors called. Same fighter, same vector. Same response, then, Kev called back, leaning forward to study the displays. Perhaps he is trying to judge exactly how far our control extends. Be careful, Doriana warned. If they figure out how to jam the signal, those starfighters will go dormant. And will self-destruct a few minutes later, Kev said impatiently. Thank you, Commander Stratus. I am familiar with my own weaponry. See again he pulls back, no wiser than he was before. Unless he's a decoy, Doriana said, searching the other displays. Don't forget the cruiser that detached itself from the group the same time the fighter did. I have not forgotten, Cav assured him. But that one has merely traveled along our flank, and has made no attempt to attack or move closer. Doriana shook his head. He's up to something, Vice Lord. Whatever it is, it will gain him nothing, Cav said. Outbound flight is not due for another nine days. That is more than enough time to choose how we will deal with this annoyance. On the display the retreating fighter suddenly flipped over and again charged in. Vice Lord Dash, a Nymoidian began. Same response, Cav cut in. But this time there was a note of satisfaction in his voice. I see now his plan, Commander Stratus. He hopes to drain the starfighters of their fuel and then drive in unopposed. What he does not realize is that I still have all the Darkvenge starfighters in reserve, plus half of the Seekers. Maybe, Doriana murmured, his vague sense of uneasiness deepening as he watched the same scenario play itself out for a third time. Surely Mithran Urodo could come up with something better than to just run the same simple-minded attack over and over. And always on exactly the same vector. Was he trying to find a weakness in the droid starfighter's attack formation? Once again the starfighters chased the intruder away. Once again, the alien ship flew out of range and flipped over for another run. The show repeated twice more and Doriana was just checking the chrono to see how close the starfighters were to their 25-minute fuel time limit when Kev abruptly slammed his fist on the arm of his chair. I weary of this game, he said. You order the Keeper to move toward the aliens. Careful, Vice Lord, Doriana cautioned as the Comet operator turned to his board. Let's not be too quick to split up the fleet. I have been more than patient. Cav countered. It is time to end this. Signal the Keeper to advance, and to launch the rest of its starfighters into shield configuration dash. Hold it, Doriana cut in. Suddenly the scenario had changed. The fighter was again retreating with starfighters in pursuit, but this time the rest of the alien force had leapt forward driving hard toward the gap that had opened up between them and the main task force. And so they make their final mistake, Kev said with satisfaction. Signal the starfighters to attack, the Nymoidian acknowledged and tapped at his board. But to Doriana's disbelief the droids didn't respond. Instead, they continued in pursuit of the retreating fighter. Order them to attack! Kev snapped again. What are you doing? Call them to the attack. They do not respond. The other Nymoidian called back. Impossible. Cav insisted. They cannot possibly be jamming our signal. They're not, Doriana said grimly. If the starfighters weren't getting a signal, 
they'd have shut down and gone dormant. But they're still flying at full power. But they are flying away from us. How can this be? Cav demanded in clear bewilderment. Never mind the how, Doriana spat. Here they come. I don't believe it, Cardos murmured as he watched the droid starfighters ignore the incoming Chiss ships completely as they headed mindlessly toward deep space. How did you get them to do that? The command signal uses a rolling encryption. Thrawn explained as the Springhawk shot forward past the now-vanished outer defense screen. But with so many fighters requiring signals, I knew the rotation would have to be a limited one. It turns out that there are only three separate encryption patterns for this group. I simply recorded the version the droids would be expecting next, then broadcast it to them with enough power to override whatever their masters in the battleship were trying to send. But how could you figure out all? Cardas interrupted himself as it finally clicked. With your fighter always going in on the same vector, and the droid's command always the same come out of this formation and attack the enemy on this vector code, the only part that ever changed was the encryption pattern itself. Which allowed us to isolate the command we wanted and duplicate it. Thrawn confirmed. The secret to successful analysis, Cardas, whenever possible, reduce matters to a single variable. Ahead, the nearest starfighters in the inner screen were starting to shift positions, moving from their general defense pattern onto intercept vectors. I don't think that's going to work on the rest of them, though, Cardas warned. They're coming from different initial formations, and there are probably entirely different codes and encryptions for them. That doesn't matter, Thrawn assured him. All I needed was to get past the outer group and into closer range. He tapped a key on his board. All vessels, attack pattern Demopari. Here they come, Doriana muttered, his fingers digging tensely into the couch cushion beside him. On the face of it, there was still no way Mithran Uroto's pitiful collection of patrol ships could do anything against the combined might of the Trade Federation Task Force. No way at all. But the alien commander had just gotten past three groups of droid starfighters without firing a shot, and that was supposed to be impossible, too. Whatever Mithran Uroto had in mind for his next trick, Doriana had a strong suspicion he wasn't going to like it. Yet even through his apprehension, a small detached part of him was looking forward to seeing what that trick would be. He didn't have long to wait. The incoming aliens were widening their formation now, sacrificing the protection of overlapping shields to gain extra maneuvering room. Swarms of starfighters from the nearer parts of the defense screen were breaking their own formation in response, sweeping in over a wide, three-dimensional wave front toward the intruders. The two groups were nearly within laser range of each other. And then each of the alien fighters launched a single missile. There was a subtle flicker in the indicator lights of the Darkvenge computer command board as the starfighter sensor information was collected, compiled, and analyzed, and the proper response formulated. The response was translated into a hundred updated commands, which were then sorted, encrypted, and transmitted back to the primitive droid brains riding in their armored casings. A sliver of a second later the starfighters responded to those commands with a rain of concentrated laser fire that blew all nine missiles into shrapnel. A foolish waste of effort, Kev commented. The range was clearly too great for dash. Hold it, Doriana said, frowning at the displays. There was something still moving along the shattered missile's lines of flight, filmy spots of nearly invisible haze that seemed to be growing larger as they sped toward the incoming starfighters. Call them back, he told Cav urgently. But it was too late. Even as the alien attack formation abruptly came apart, with all eleven ships shooting off in all different directions, 
the hazy spots intersected their target starfighter groups. There were multiple flashes of subdued light. They do not respond! One of the Nymoidians called from the computer board. Nine groups of droids have gone silent. Connor Nets, Doriana snarled, digging his fingers even harder into the cushion. Nine groups of starfighters, neatly and efficiently knocked out of action. Out of action, but not out of the fight. Their momentum was still carrying them onward. And as he watched in helpless fascination, they slammed squarely into other groups that had shifted their own vectors to chase the dispersing aliens. There were more multiple flashes, this cluster much brighter than the last. And suddenly the gaping hole in the task force's defensive screen no longer had any starfighters left to fill it. This is impossible, Kev said, his five-cornered hat bobbing as he swung his head back and forth around the bridge. How can he do this? Get the rest of the starfighters into space, Doriana ground out. Now. Kev didn't need any prompting. Order Keeper to activate all remaining droid starfighters, he called. They will launch when ready. And move all those already launched to intercept. Wait a minute, Doriana objected. You can't leave our other flanks unguarded. Against what? Kev retorted. This is the battlefront. If we do not defend it, there will be no other flanks left to guard. He gestured across the bridge. Obey my order. Here they come, Cardas murmured, wondering if Thrawn had finally sliced off more than he could serve. The Chiss had dispatched those first few groups of droid starfighters with relative ease, but tricks like that only worked once against a given opponent. And now all the rest of those hundreds of starfighters were sweeping around the flanks of the Trade Federation fleet, heading straight toward them. Unless that was exactly what Thrawn had been waiting for. Cardas shifted his eyes across the displays, looking for the cruiser that had slipped away from them just before the fighting started. If the main Chiss force was merely a diversion. But the whirlwind wasn't charging in from the side for a sucker punch attack. It was still sitting quietly in space, apparently being held in reserve. He looked back at the incoming starfighters. I hope you've got one great father of a shock net up your sleeve, he warned. We'll certainly have to consider creating such a device if we begin facing opponents like this on a regular basis, Thrawn said drilly. Tell me, what happens to these droids if their communication signals are cut off? If the dash? Are you talking about jamming? You disapprove? No, of course not. Cardas said. But Trade Federation command signals are supposed to be unjammable. They can change frequencies and command patterns instantly the minute you block off one part of the spectrum they just shift to another. And if you block the entire spectrum at once? Cardas stared at him. The man was serious. You can't blanket the whole area, Commander. He ground out between clenched teeth. It's too big. The minute you start, they'll know what you're doing and send a set of contingency orders to everything outside your jamming. Those droid starfighters may not be smart, but they're certainly capable of downloading enough general commands to keep them functioning until they've pounded us to dust. Only if there are any starfighters still outside the jamming, Thrawn pointed out. But it seems our opponent has taken care of that problem for us. He pointed. Even as we close the distance, he is converging all his starfighters into this one small area. Cardas stared at the displays. Thrawn was right the Trade Federation commander had abandoned the rest of his picket area to bring all his starfighters to the attack. Didn't he realize the possible implications of what he was doing? What about your own communications? He asked. If you jam the whole spectrum, you'll be out of touch with your people, too. 
Fortunately, my warriors are capable of more than simply downloading general commands, Thrawn said. Let's see which side's battle philosophy proves the more versatile. Leaning forward, he took a deep breath. Full spectrum jamming now. For a long, horrifying second the Darkvenge bridge was filled with a screech like something from the restless undead of ancient Coruscant legend. Then the Nymoidian at the calm slapped at the switch, cutting off the wail and leaving only a distant ringing in Doriana's ears. What in the name of Dash? Vice Lord, we are being jammed. The Nymoidian called, staring at his board in obvious disbelief. All starfighters have gone dormant. Doriana stared out the viewports, his stomach tightening into a hard knot. The starfighters had indeed locked down, each of them now flying mindlessly in whatever direction it had last been pointed. And swerving with ease through the drifting obstacle course, blasting away at the helpless starfighters as they went, Mithran Urodo's alien ships were headed straight for them the fighters in screening formation ahead of the two cruisers. Get our starfighters back online, Kev ordered Totley, jabbing a hand toward the Nymoidians at the command board. Get them back. We are trying, one of them called. We have opened laser communications to as many as we can. But those calm lasers were line of sight, Doriana knew and with a sinking feeling he realized that this limitation was growing ever tighter as expanding clouds of dust and debris from the shattered starfighters began to block even this last gasp communication method. A few of the starfighters were coming back to life, but they were targeted and destroyed by the aliens before they could organize into an effective fighting force. What about the other ships? He demanded. Why aren't they attacking? Someone called, and Doriana saw an arm point upward from one of the pits. The hard cells have launched their missiles. About time, Doriana muttered, feeling a cautious hope rising within him as five clusters of three missiles each shot toward the attackers. The attackers reacted instantly, five of the fighters abandoning their thrust toward the battleships and curving toward the outside of the Trade Federation formation. The missiles, locking in on the movement, followed. Good, Kev said with satisfaction. The next salvo will draw the rest of the fighters away and leave the cruisers undefended. Then our own quad laser batteries can destroy them with ease. Maybe, Doriana said cautiously, following the fleeing alien craft with his eyes. They were cutting in and out through the masses of drifting starfighters clearly trying to throw off the pursuing missiles homing locks. But to no avail. Techno Union hardware was among the best in the Republic, and the missiles maneuvered their own way through the clutter with case as they continued to close the gap. The aliens reached the edge of the starfighter cloud and curved tightly back into it again, driving inward toward the main ships. Again, the missiles matched the maneuver. The fighters straightened out, and then, in near unison, each dropped a small object aft toward its pursuers. And Doriana stiffened as a well-remembered hazy cloud erupted from each of them, unfolding directly in the path of the incoming missile clusters. More Connor nets! He snapped. But there was nothing the onlookers could do. The nets enveloped the missile clusters and flashed their killing jolts of high-voltage current, destroying homing electronics and drive systems alike and leaving the missiles as dead as the drifting starfighters around them. Only once again, Mithran Urodo hadn't been content to merely protect his own ships from attack. Even as Doriana's hands curled into helpless fists, their inertia sent the missiles slamming into the Techno-Union ships. There were multiple blasts as sections of whole metal shattered outward into space. And then, like a minor sun going off at close range, one of the ships exploded completely. What dash? 
Kev gasped. No. Not from a single missile cluster. This is impossible. Everything Mithranurodo does is impossible, Doriana retorted bitterly. The missiles must have hit a weak spot. What kind? Where could it be? Doriana snorted. Just watch his ships. They'll be targeting the same spot on all the rest of them. He was right. Within minutes the alien fighters and cruisers had successfully dodged the desperate flurry of missiles the Techno Union ships were now throwing at them and had efficiently destroyed every one of them. The spot, Doriana noted with morbid fascination, was the line junction to the massive external fuel cells. We must escape, Cav said, his voice shaking. Helm prepared to jump to light speed. Wait a minute. Doriana protested, grabbing at his arm. The specter of defeat loomed before him, along with the fate of all those who failed Darth Sidious. You can't just abandon the fleet. What fleet? Cav snarled. Look around you, Stratus. What fleet? Doriana felt his throat tighten. He was right, of course. All six of the Techno Union hard cells were gone, half of them destroyed by their own missiles. The seven escort cruisers, never intended to operate against such enemies without capital ship support, were being systematically hunted down and eliminated. Only the two Trade Federation battleships were still in any condition to fight or run. But with their communications still blocked, there was no way to order a general retreat. If the Darkvenge left, it would be leaving alone. Jump calculated, the helmsman called. Make the jump, Kev ordered, glaring at Doriana as if daring him to argue. Do you hear me? Now. The hyperdrive does not respond, the helmsman said, his voice bubbling with sudden panic. It claims we are too close to a planetary mass. Doriana twisted around to look at the row of status boards. That was what the reading said, all right. But there were no planetary masses nearby, or even any sizable asteroids. Malfunction? No malfunction, Cav murmured, his voice dull and fatalistic. Merely more chis wizardry. A fresh flicker of light caught Doriana's eve, and he looked back out the viewports. Across the field of carnage, droid starfighters were starting to explode as too many minutes without communication passed, and they began to activate their self-destruct mechanisms. Through the scattered bursts of fire, Doriana saw the Keeper suddenly lurch as the upper surface of its starboard ring half erupted in a hundred small explosions. Vice Lord! Someone called. I know, Kev said with a tired sigh. The starfighters I ordered prepped are exploding. Doriana nodded, his own bitterness long since faded into a deep sense of the inevitable. The reinforcements would have been flying through the hangar bays when Mithranurodo's jamming began, and they went dormant. Tumbling helplessly at high speed down a curved corridor, they would have slammed into bulkheads or storage racks or other equipment. There they'd lain, tangled and broken while they waited for their own self-destruct Kronos to run down. Then it is over, Cav said quietly. Lifting his hands, he carefully removed his five-cornered hat and set it with equal care on the floor in front of him. We are all dead. It would seem so, Doriana agreed mechanically, feeling his forehead creasing as a strange fact suddenly struck him. With all the death and debris and charred hulks of ships floating all around them, the Dark Venge itself had yet to be so much as scratched. He took another, longer look at the status boards. Except for the inexplicably dormant hyperdrive, everything else seemed perfectly functional. Or maybe not, he added. 
I think Mithra Nuroto has something else in mind for us. Kev snorted derisively. And what precisely gave you that impression? Puzzled, Doriana turned back. To find that one of the alien cruisers had suddenly appeared outside the viewports. It was hovering bare meters away from the transparisteel, its missile racks pointing into the bridge in silent warning and clear command. Close down the midline quad laser batteries, Vice Lord, Doriana said quietly. Then seal the main hangar exits and shut down all the droid starfighters. He took a careful breath. And then, he said, Prepare for company. 17. The final turbolift door slid open, and twenty meters down the corridor Cardas saw at last the open blast doors of the battleship's bridge. Twenty meters of corridor lined on both sides with armed, tense-looking battle droids. Thrawn didn't even hesitate. He strode forward calmly, his two warriors equally sedate as they walked at his sides. Swallowing hard, not wanting to walk that gauntlet but even less willing to cower in the turbolift car all alone, Cardas forced himself to follow. There were dozens of droids on duty on the bridge, most of them service and monitor units seated or plugged into the various stations in the control pits. Standing in the center of the quiet activity were just two actual beings, waiting together beside the vacant helm chair, a tall Nymoidian in elaborate robes, and a more sedately dressed human male. Again, Thrawn didn't pause, but headed down the walkway toward them. He stopped three meters away, and for a moment seemed to size them up. Then, deliberately, he swiveled to face the human. Commander Stratus, he said, nodding his head in greeting. I am Commander Mithra Nurodo. Stratus does not command this vessel, the Nymoidian said stiffly before Stratus could answer. I am Vice Lord Cav of the Trade Federation. And you, Commander Mithrado, have committed an act of war. Vice Lord, please, Stratus said. His voice was calm but there was a warning edge to it. Recriminations will serve no useful purpose. Do not think you have gained anything with your audacity, Kev continued ignoring him. Even now, I could destroy you where you stand. He gestured, and from behind them came a sudden metallic racket. Cardas spun around his heart freezing as a pair of droidica destroyer droids rolled into view and came to a halt just inside the bridge blast doors. They unfolded into their tripod stance, and a second later Cardas found himself staring down the barrels of four pairs of high-energy blasters. Vice Lord, you fool! Stratus bit out urgently. What do you think, Dash? We're in no danger. Carefully, hardly daring to breathe, Cardas turned his head. Stratus's eyes had gone wide, his throat muscles tight as he gripped the Nymoidian's arm. But Thrawn merely stood quietly, his face expressionless as he studied the droidikas. The Chiss warriors had their hands on their weapons, but following their commander's lead hadn't drawn them. Interesting design, Thrawn went on. That shimmering sphere a small force shield? Uh. Yes, Stratus said cautiously. I assure you, Commander Dash. Thank you for the demonstration, Vice Lord. Thrawn interrupted, turning his glowing red eyes back to Cav. But now you will send them away. For a long, terrible moment Cardas thought the Nymoidian was going to defy Thrawn's order the way he'd ignored Stratus's rebuke. The Chiss and Nymoidian locked eyes, and for half a dozen heartbeats the bridge was silent. And then Cav's entire body seemed to wilt, his eyes dropping away from Thrawn's stare as he half lifted a hand toward the droidikas. Looking back over his shoulder, 
Cardas watched in relief as the destroyers folded up again and rolled their way off the bridge. Thank you, Thrawn said. Now, as I asked you before, please state your intentions and those of your task force. A task force that no longer exists, Kev put in, his voice hovering between anger and dejection. That loss was your doing, Thrawn countered. All I wished was a civilized answer. He turned to Cardas. Is that correct? Civilized? Or just civil? Cardas told him, feeling his face warming at being suddenly dragged into the middle of the conversation. Or polite? Civil, Thrawn said, as if testing the word against some unknown set of guidelines. Yes. All I wished, Commander, was a civil answer. Yes, I know, Stratus said, his eyes on Cardas. May I ask your companion's name and origin? I'm just a visitor, Cardas said quickly. The last thing he wanted was for these people to know his name. That's all. Not quite, Thrawn corrected. Cardas was simply a visitor. Now he's my translator. His expression hardened. And my prisoner. Cardas felt his mouth drop open, and for the second time in two minutes felt his heart freeze. I'm what? You arrived uninvited in Chiss space. Thrawn reminded him darkly. Now, less than three months later, an invasion fleet from your people has appeared. Coincidence? I had nothing to do with this, Cardas protested. And we're not an invasion fleet, Stratus added. Make me believe that, Thrawn said, his voice darkening even further. Both of you. Cardas looked at Stratus. Suddenly, in the wink of an eye, this whole side trip had taken on a very bad taste. Commander? He entreated. Stratus's eyes flicked to him, then back to Thrawn, a thoughtful expression suddenly appearing on his face. Very well, he said, gesturing toward the side of the bridge. There's an office back there where we'll have more privacy. Thrawn inclined his head slightly. Lead the way. Doriana led them to Cav's command office, his skin prickling with anticipation and the stirrings of fresh hope. An hour ago it had been all over, the mission a failure, Doriana himself among the walking dead. Even if their attackers allowed them to return to the Republic, he knew the payment Darth Sidious would demand for his failure. But now, suddenly, all that had changed. Maybe. Please make yourselves comfortable, Doriana invited gesturing his guests to seats facing the desk as he circled around the massive carved wood structure and sat down in Cav's equally elaborate chair. Out of the corner of his eye he saw the Vice Lord glowering at him, but he had no time now for petty Nymoidian pride. May I offer you some refreshment? The two Chis guards, as Doriana had expected, remained standing. Standing in the doorway where they could watch everyone in the room as well as keep an eve on what might be happening on the bridge proper. All right, Doriana said, focusing his full intellect on the task at hand. This was it. Let me tell you about a project called Outbound Flight. He started at the beginning, describing the project's origin and its mission and making sure to emphasize the dreadnought's size and weaponry. Interesting, Mithran Urodo said when he'd finished. What does this have to do with us? The fact that Outbound Flight is a danger to both the Republic and your own people, Doriana told him. You remember my mentioning a group aboard called the Jedi? These are beings of great power, but who are also dangerous troublemakers. 
In what way? They have very rigid ideas of how people should act and what they should think and do, Doriana said, watching Cardas out of the corner of his eve. This would have been easier without the presence of someone who actually knew something about Jedi, but Mithraneroda would have been instantly suspicious if Doriana had asked that the young man be left out of the conversation. Now he was going to have to walk a narrow line between making the Jedi look dangerous to Mithraneroda and at the same time not saying anything Cardas would know was an outright lie. And Cardas did indeed seem a bit surprised by Doriana's assertions. But at the same time, he could also see a growing uncertainty in the young man's face. The Jedi's arrogance, coupled with their inability to do anything about the growing chaos and stagnation, had people all across the Republic wondering if perhaps their alleged guardians of the peace were more noise and bluster than genuine effectiveness. They feel they have all the answers, he continued, and that everyone else should submit to their concept of justice. Yet you say they are traveling to another galaxy, Mithra Nerodo reminded him. Again, how then does this affect the Chiss? Because before they leave they intend to explore some of the unknown parts of our own galaxy, Doriana said, wishing the Chiss were as easy to read as Cardas. So far, he didn't have a clue as to what kind of impression this was making on him. If they arrive in Chiss space, they'll certainly attempt to impose their will upon your people. Attempt is the correct word, Mithranirodo said, his face hardening. The Chis do not simply accept alien concepts without careful consideration. We certainly do not submit to domination. By anyone. Of course not, Doriana said, his cautious hope glowing a little brighter. So species and professional pride were the hooks into Mithra Nerodo's heart. Excellent. But I warn you not to underestimate them. The Jedi are ruthless and subtle, and I dare say their power is beyond anything you've ever encountered. You may be surprised at what we've encountered, Mithra Nerodo said, his voice grim. Abruptly, he stood up. But we will discuss such matters later. Right now, there is other business that requires my attention. Of course, Doriana said, rising to his feet as well. What do you wish us to do in your absence? For the present, you will both remain on this bridge, Mithra Nerodo said. I will send for you when I wish to see you again. In the meantime, I will send aboard a team to examine your vessel and its equipment. Never! Cav snapped. This ship is the property of the Trade Federation. Quiet! Doriana cut him off glaring at him. Didn't the fool understand anything? We will, of course, render any and all assistance they may require. Thank you, Mithra Nerodo said. They will have new orders for you when they are finished. You will obey those orders. Doriana nodded. As you wish. Mithra Nerodo looked at Cav and Doriana could sense the tension between them. But the Nymoidian remained silent, and after a moment Mithra Nerodo turned to Cardas. Come! They left the room, the Chiss guards falling into step behind them. Doriana watched until they had disappeared through the bridge blast doors, then turned to Cav. With all due respect, Vice Lord, what in the name of your grub mother do you think you're doing? That is my question for you, Cav countered. Do you simply turn your back downward and give over our lives and property to this primitive backworld alien? Look around you, Vice Lord, Doriana said grimly. This primitive alien just wrecked our entire task force. And unless I missed it, he didn't lose a single ship of his own in the process and you wish to make him even stronger by offering him access to Trade Federation secrets?
Listen to me, he said, enunciating his words carefully. It was as if he were back on Barlock, trying to walk those idiot Bralfi through a simple assassination scheme. We've failed our mission. Even if Mithranur Odo turned tail right now and left us in peace, there's no way in the universe our single battleship could take on outbound flights six dreadnoughts. We would have no choice but to return to the Republic and face Darth Sidious's anger. And I can assure you that you would wish you had died today, torn apart in agony by the Chiss fighters. He lifted a finger. Unless. He let the word hang in the air. Unless? Cav asked, his voice subdued. Unless, Doriana said. We can persuade Mithranur Odo to destroy outbound flight for us. For a long minute the room was silent. I see, Kev said at last. Do you think you can do that? And if you can, do you think he can achieve that victory? I don't know, Doriana had to admit. He's no fool, and he surely knows my description of outbound flight and the Jedi was horribly slanted. Odds are he cut off the talk so he could go off and get Cardassa's take on the whole thing. But why would he listen to a human he believes to be a spy? Cav objected. He doesn't, Doriana said, smiling tightly. If he did, he certainly wouldn't have said so right in front of the man. I think he just wants us to believe that so that we won't think he'll listen to Cardas' advice. Cav shook his head. This is too complicated for me. Yes, I know, Doriana said. That's why you have to leave everything to me. Everything. Kev rumbled something under his breath. Very well, he growled. For now. But I will be watching you. You do that, Doriana said. Just keep in mind that your life is worth a lot more than your pride. Perhaps, Cav said. But you say Mithrado does not believe your warnings about the Jedi. How then will you convince him to destroy outbound flight? I have more in my persuasive arsenal than just lies about the Jedi. Doriana said. Trust me. Very well, Cav inclined his head. For now, Dot. Cardas had been sitting alone at the computer desk in his Springhawk quarters for three hours, struggling through pages and pages of technical chin text and scans, when Thrawn finally arrived. My apologies for my long absence, the commander said as the door slid shut behind him. I trust you've kept yourself occupied? I've been studying the tech team's reports as you requested, Cardas said stiffly, turning back to the computer. It was rude, he knew, but he wasn't in a very hospitable mood right now. And? And what? Your assessment of the Trade Federation's capabilities? Thrawn asked patiently. Cardas sighed, feeling like a ship with a misfiring euro. Right before the battle Thrawn had accused him of lying about widespread Republic slavery, and then, right after the battle, he'd accused him of being a spy for the Federation. Now he wanted a military assessment from him? Those droid starfighters are top-line weapons, he growled. I read a report a few months ago speculating that the only reason they didn't completely wipe out their attackers at Naboo was that having to control all those ground troops at the same time overloaded the computer systems and made the starfighter control more sluggish than it should have been. Here, they weren't running any ground troops. In my humble civilian's opinion, if you hadn't knocked out their communications the way you did, they'd have cut us to ribbons. Agreed, Thrawn said. Fortunately, expansionary fleet vessels are equipped with more powerful transmitters than those of the regular defense fleet forces, since we seldom have a normal colony systems network of boosters and repeaters to draw on. What about Vice Lord Cav and Commander Stratus personally? 
Why are you even asking me this? Cardas demanded, giving up and swiveling around to face him. I thought you didn't trust me. Thrawn shook his head. Not at all, he said. If you and your companions were spies, you'd have used your access to the base's computer to study our technology and learn the locations of our worlds. Instead, you've merely worked on improving your language skills. May I sit down? Yes, of course, Cardas said, scrambling out of his chair and extending a hand. Preoccupied with his own uncertainty and bruised pride, he hadn't even noticed the utter weariness in Thrawn's face and posture. Are you all right? I'm fine, Thrawn assured him, waving off the proffered hand as he stepped over to the bunk and sank down onto it. It's simply been a very long day. You look more than just tired, Cardas commented, peering at him closely. Is something wrong? Nothing serious, Thrawn said. I just received word that Admiral Arlani is on her way back. Cardas frowned. It had been barely five weeks since Arlani had taken the captured freighter away with her. They're finished studying the Vigari ship already? I believe she's cut short her role in the examination, Thrawn said. That was why I made a point of accusing you of espionage in front of my warriors. After today's events she will undoubtedly be questioning them, and I wish to have a plausible reason on record as to why you and the others were still in Chiss space. My apologies for any distress that may have caused you. Don't worry about it, Cardas said, frowning. You think Aralani's suspicious of you? I have no doubt. Thrawn said. Particularly given the reports she's been receiving from Krusty. But who at your base would have Dash? Cardas broke off as a horrible thought struck him. Thras? Your brother? Who else would have felt it necessary to keep her informed? Are you saying your own brother is trying to sink you? Cardas demanded, still not believing it. My brother cares deeply about his blood family, including me, Thrawn said, his voice tinged with sadness. But he's disturbed by what he sees as my self-destructive behavior. And as a syndic of the Eighth Ruling Family, his duty is to protect that family's honor and position. So he calls an admiral down on you? If Admiral Arlani is here to reverse my orders... I'll be unable to do anything that will lead to further trouble, Thrawn pointed out. Or so he reasons. With a single course of action he thus protects both me and the Eighth Family. Cardas thought about the Vigari attack they'd witnessed, and the people pinned helplessly under fire in their whole bubbles. And meanwhile, people like the Vigari will be free to go their way. Indeed. Thrawn pressed the palm of his hand against his forehead. Still, until the Admiral arrives, command remains mine. What's your impression of Vice Lord Cav and Commander Stratus? With an effort, Cardas dragged his mind away from the images of the Vigari's living shields. For starters, I don't think Stratus is really in command. I just can't see the Nymoidians handing their own ships over to a human that way. Unless the human is somehow higher in authority than they are, Thrawn pointed out. Or if the human is an agent for such a person. Stratus itself is of course an assumed name. Could be, Cardas agreed. I do think that they're telling the truth about not being an invasion force, though. Even if their storage rings are packed to the shock webbing with battle droids they can't possibly have enough for a planetary occupation. Then you conclude their mission is indeed to ambush this outbound flight? I might if I knew what outbound flight was, Cardas said. But I've never heard of it, and I don't necessarily trust Stratus's opinions. Thrawn nodded. 
Perhaps Kento or Ferrisai will have more information. Maybe, Kardas said. We're heading back to Krustai then? I need to be there to welcome Admiral Arlani, Thrawn reminded him. My people here can finish the examination without us. What if Cav and Stratus decide to kill all of them and make a run for it? They won't, Thrawn assured him. First of all, they can't simply jump to hyperspace, no matter how much the Vice Lord might like to. Not with the whirlwind pinning them in place. Aha, Kardas said, his face warming with embarrassment. With everything else that had happened, he'd completely forgotten the cruiser Thrawn had sent off to the side before the battle began. Apparently, the Chistex had figured out a way to tuck the Vigari Grey projector inside a ship's hull. But even if they could escape, I don't think they would, Thrawn continued. Stratus very much wants me to destroy outbound flight for him. Kardas felt his eyes widen. Is that where this is going? What did you think all that talk of weaponry and dangerous Jedi was all about? Thrawn countered. I just, I mean, I thought he was trying to get you to let them go. Kardas said, stumbling over his own tongue. You aren't thinking, Dash? I will do whatever necessary to protect those who depend on me, Thrawn said, his voice carefully precise. No more. But no less. He stood up. But that isn't your concern, he said. Once again, I thank you for your assistance. No problem, Kardas said, standing up as well. Was it his imagination, or had the commander staggered slightly as he got back to his feet? You'd better get some rest. It won't be fun for anyone if you collapse from exhaustion before Arlani even has a chance to throw you in the brig. Thank you for your concern, Thrawn said drilly. I'll try not to disappoint her. One last question, if I may, Kardas added as the commander stepped to the door. How were you so sure that those droidikas wouldn't gun us down? Those dash? Oh, the rolling droid fighters, Thrawn said. It wasn't difficult. Everything about the bridge design spoke of a people who would never willingly put themselves at more risk than absolutely necessary. That's Nymoidians, all right, Kardas agreed. You could get that just from the bridge design? Architecture is merely another form of art, Thrawn reminded him. But even without those indications, the triple blast doors we passed through would have told me these Nymoidians are not warriors. Which is why they have battle droids to fight for them, Kardas said. But isn't gunning us down exactly what cowards like that would do? Thrawn shook his head. Vice Lord Cav was too close to the line of fire. He would never have ordered the droidikas to attack. Kardas grimaced. A bluff. Or he was making a point, Thrawn said. These combat droids are a new concept to me, but one worth careful thought, he grimaced. I sincerely hope the Vigari haven't visited a world where they might have picked up such weapons. Probably not, Kardas said. The Nymoidians keep them pretty close to home. We shall see. Thrawn touched the control, and the door slid open. Sleep well, Kardas. For a few minutes Kardas gazed at the closed door. So Thrawn had now assured him that he didn't really suspect him of spying. That was reassuring. So what was the... So what was the truth? Were he and Kento and Miles just pawns in some sort of political game? And if so, what was the game? Maris, Kardas knew, trusted Thrawn's honor. 
Kento just as strongly distrusted his alienness and the fact that he was a military officer. Cardas himself no longer knew what to think. But one thing he knew. Things were heating up out here, and he had the uncomfortable feeling that the bargain hunter's crew had overstayed their welcome. Somehow they had to find a way out. And they had to find it soon. The first Yulier knew of the trouble was when he rounded the corner to find the other two members of his watch shift standing outside the monitor room door. What's going on? He asked as he came up to them. Got a special tour going on, Siv, the senior officer, told him. Mining and some sprouts. Some what? Some of his junior Jedi, Algren said scornfully. They swept in ten minutes before Grassling's shift ended and threw everyone out. And we're not allowed in. Yulier asked, not believing it. Siv shrugged. He told Grassling he'd let him know when they could come back in, he said. I haven't actually asked myself. Yulier glowered at the door. Jedi. Again. Mind if I try? Siv waved a hand. Help yourself. Stepping to the door, Yulier slapped the release. It slid open, and he stepped inside. Jedi Master Manning was standing to the side of the main board, in the middle of a discussion about how the monitors and control systems worked. His eyes turned questioningly to Yulier as he came in, but he didn't miss a beat of his lecture. Seated at the board itself were four children, the two shortest having to kneel on the seats in order to see. It was like a scene out of a second-tier classroom, except that this wasn't a scribble board or even a training mock-up. This was the real, actual control system for one of the reactors that kept power flowing to Dreadnought 4. Manning finished the sentence he'd been on and lifted his eyebrows toward Yulier. Yes, Yulier? He asked. No offense, Master Manning, Yulier said, coming closer to the others. But what in blazes are you doing? The lines around Manning's eyes might have tightened a little. I'm instructing the young Padawans in the basics of reactor operation. Yulier took another look at the children. Ages five to eight, he guessed all of them with the bright eyes and bouncy curiosity of children everywhere. But there was something more there, he saw now. An underlying layer of seriousness that was definitely not characteristic of children that age. Some Jedi thing? Much as I appreciate their desire to learn, this is no place for children, he said. And if I may say so, you're hardly the one to be instructing anyone in the subtleties of reactor operation. I'm simply giving them an overview, Manning assured him. You shouldn't be giving them anything, Yulier countered. Where high-energy equipment is concerned, a little knowledge is worse than useless and dangerous on top of it. Whose stupid idea was this, anyway? Manning's lips tightened slightly. Master Kbayoth has decided all Jedi and Padawans need to learn how to control outbound flight's critical systems. Yulier stared at him. You're joking. Not at all, Manning assured him. Don't worry, we'll be out of your way in another half hour. You'll be out of our way a lot sooner than that, Yulier growled, reaching between two of the children to the calm control. Bridge, Reactor Control 3. Commander Omano, please. One moment. Yulia looked over at Manning, wondering if the other would try to stop this. But the Jedi was just standing there, his eyes lowered in a sort of half-meditation look. Commander Omano. Reactor tech for Yulia, Commander. Yulia identified himself. There are unauthorized personnel in our control room who refuse to leave. Omano's sigh was a taint hiss in the calm speaker. Jedi? Yulier had the sudden sense of the floor preparing to drop out from beneath him. 
One of them is a Jedi, yes, he said carefully. They're still not authorized to dash. Unfortunately, they are. Omano cut him off. Master Kbeoth has requested that his people be given full access to all areas and systems aboard outbound flight. Even though he'd suspected what was coming, the words were still like a cold water slap across the face. With all due respect, Commander, that's both absurd and dangerous, Yolir said. Having children in the dash. You have your orders, Tech Yulir. Omano again cut him off. If you don't like it, you're welcome to take it up with Master Kbeath. Omano out. There was a click, and the calm went dead. Yulia looked up to find Manning's eyes on him. Fine, he said, meeting the Jedi's gaze head on. If they thought he was going to bow and scrape just because they wore those affected peasant robes and carried lightsabers, they had an extra bonus thing coming. Where do I find Master Kbeath? He's down in the Jedi Training Center, Manning said. Storage Core, Section 124. Yulier stared at him. Your school's in the Storage Core? What's wrong with the Dreadnoughts? Manning's lip twitched. Master Kbeya thought it would be best if we were as far away from distractions as possible. Distractions like parents and family and normal people? Probably. Deep inside him, Yulia's annoyance was starting to turn into a genuine, simmering anger. Fine, he said. I'll be back. Well? Aldrin asked when he emerged into the corridor. Omano's knuckled under, Yulia told him tartly. I'm going to go talk to the big clough himself, and see if I can talk some sense into him. Captain Pakmilu? Pac Miller doesn't seem to be running the show anymore, Yulia growled. I'm going to seek Bayath. Either of you want to come along? They exchanged glances, and Yulia could almost see them shrinking back behind their faces. We'd better stay here, Siv answered. Whenever mining finishes, we are supposed to be on duty. Sure, Yulia said, feeling his lip twist with contempt. Why did everyone go instantly spineless whenever Jedi were involved? See you later. He took a turbo lift down to Dreadnought 4's lowest level, then made his way forward until he reached one of the massive pylons that attached the Dreadnoughts to the storage core beneath them. Four of the six turbo lift cars that ran through the pylon were off somewhere else, but the other two were waiting, and a few minutes later he arrived in the storage core. The core was arranged in a series of large rooms, each nearly filled with stacks of crates held in place by multiple wrappings of crash webbing. A relatively narrow section at the front of each room was empty, providing a walkway and work area for sorting the crates. At each end of the walkway were a pair of doors leading into the rooms forward and aft of it, one of the doors person-sized, the other the much larger access panel required for transfer carts. The turbolift let him out in section 120, Yulia saw from the small plaque attached to the crash webbing. Manning had said the Jedi school was in 124, and he headed aft. Neither of the doors into 124 was marked with any special notice of its new classroom status. Stealing himself, trying not to think about all the legends about Jedi power, he walked up to the smaller door and touched the control. Nothing happened. He tried again, still nothing. He moved to the larger cargo door, only to find that it, too, was sealed. Stepping back to the smaller door, he curled his right hand into a fist and pounded gently on the metal. There was no answer. He knocked again, gradually increasing the volume level. Were they all out making nuisances of themselves? What do you want? He jumped, turning to a calm display that had been set up to his left just inside the cargo netting. Kbeath's face was framed there, glowering at him. I need to talk to you about your students and their teachers. 
Yolier said, feeling his resolve starting to erode beneath that intimidating gaze. They're in a reactor control and monitor room where they have no business dash. Thank you for your interest, Kbayoth interrupted. But there's no need for concern. Excuse me, Master Kbayoth, but there's every need for concern, Yulier insisted. Some of those systems are very delicate. It took me four years to learn how to handle them properly. Your ways are not the Jedi ways, Kbayoth pointed out. That's a nice slogan, Yulier growled. His anger, which had faded somewhat during the trip down here, was starting to bubble again. But devotion to platitudes is no substitute for tech school. Kbeath's dark look went a little darker. Your lack of faith is both thoughtless and insulting, he said. You will go now, and you will not return. Not until those children are out of my reactor room, Yulier said doggedly. I said go, Kbeath repeated. And suddenly an invisible hand was pressing against Yulier's chest, pushing him inexorably away from the locked door and back toward the other end of the section. Wait! Yulier protested, batting uselessly at the pressure against his chest. He never realized Jedi could do this through a calm display, without actually being there in person. What about the children? Kbeath didn't answer, his image following Yulia with his eaves until he was nearly to the far door. Then, simultaneously, the display image and the pressure on Yulia's chest vanished. For a long minute Yulia stood where he was, his heart pounding with tension and dissipating adrenaline, trying to decide whether he should go back across the room and try again. But there was obviously no point in doing so. Taking a deep breath, he turned and made his way back up to Dreadnought 4 and the reactor room. Manning and the children were gone when he arrived, and Siv and Algren were at their stations. Well? Siv asked as Yulier silently took his scat. He told me to go away and mind my own business, Yulier told him. This is our business. Don't tell me, Yulier said tartly. Go tell him. Maybe we should talk to Pak Milu, Algren suggested hesitantly. What for? Yulia growled. Looks to me like the Jedi are the ones running the show now. Algren cursed under his breath. Terrific. We leave attorney run by bureaucrats and corrupt politicians, only to end up in one run by Jedi. It's not a tyranny. Siv disagreed. No, Algren said tightly. Not yet. 18. Outbound flight, Kento repeated, frowning off into space as he slowly shook his head. Nope. Never heard of it. Me either, Maris seconded. And you say this Cav and Stratus want to destroy it? Cav and whoever, Cardas said. Thrawn thinks Stratus is an alias. Fine, Cav and Master no one, Kento said impatiently. So why do they want to destroy it? Kardas shrugged. Stratus spun a big loop pastry about how dangerous the Jedi are and how they want to take over and make everyone to do things their way. But that has to be a lie. Not necessarily, Kento said. A lot of people out there are starting to wonder about the Jedi. They're certainly helping to prop up the Coruscant bureaucracy, Maris pointed out. Anyone who wants genuine government reform will have to persuade the Jedi to change sides. Or else kill them, Kento said. Maris shivered. I can't believe it would ever come to that. Well, Stratus sure wasn't talking about persuasion, Kardas said. What about these dreadnoughts? You ever hear of them? Yeah, they're Rendili Star Drive's latest gift to the militarily obsessed, Kento said. Six hundred meters long, 
With heavy shields and a whole bunch of upgraded turbo laser cannons, most of them clustered in four midline bubbles where they can deliver a terrific broadside volley. Normal crew runs around 16,000, with room for another two or three thousand troops. I hear the corporate sector's been buying them up like Transland Day souvenirs, and some of the bigger core worlds aren't far behind. Has Karuskin been doing any of the buying? Maris asked. Kento shrugged. There's been talk lately about the Republic finally getting its own army and a genuine battle fleet. But they've been talking that way for years, and nothing's ever come of it. So with six dreadnoughts, we're talking up to a hundred thousand people aboard outbound flight? Cardas asked. Probably no more than half that, Kento said. A lot of the standard jobs would be duplicated among the ships. Besides that, you want to build an extra elbow room on a long-term colony ship. That's still a lot of people to kill if all they want is to get at a few Jedi, Maris pointed out. Don't worry, I'm sure your noble-minded Commander Thrawn won't fall for it, Kento said sourly. But even if Thrawn doesn't cooperate, Stratus still has an intact Trade Federation battleship on hand, Cardas reminded them. That's a lot of firepower, and they might have more of them on the way. So what do we do? Maris asked. We do nothing, Kento said firmly. It's not our job to look out for this outbound flight. But we can't just sit here and do nothing, Maris protested. No, we can run like scalded hawkbats, Kento retorted. And I'm thinking this would be a real good time to do just that. But... Maris, Kento said, cutting her off with an uplifted hand. It's not our problem. You hear me? It's not our problem. If the Jedi are going to go flying off into the unknown regions, it's up to them to figure out how to protect themselves. It's up to us to figure out how to get ourselves out of here. That is, if you think you can drag yourself away from all this nobility and culture. That's not fair, Maris protested, her eyes hard even as a touch of pink colored her cheeks. Whatever. Kento turned back to Cardas. You're his confidant these days, kid. You think you can sweet-talk him into letting us have that Vigari loot his brother locked away? He jerked a thumb at Maris. Or should I ask Maris to do it? Rack dash, Maris began. I don't think sweet talk is going to be the issue, Cardas said hastily. The tension between Kento and Maris was starting to drift into the red zone again. He can't give it to us unless his brother and Admiral Aarlani both let him. So how do we get Aarlani back here? Maris asked. We don't have to, Cardas said grimly, glancing at his chrono. As a matter of fact, Thrawn's probably welcoming her onto the base right now. Great, Kento said, brightening. Let's get our hearing, get our loot, and get out of here. I don't think so, Cardas said. She's here to see whether or not Thrawn should be relieved of command. There was a moment of stunned silence. That's insane, Mavis said at last. He's a good commander. He's a good man. And when did either of those ever matter? Kento muttered. Oh boy. And she was already dead set against giving us the Vigari stuff. This is not good. Can't you for one minute forget about your loot? Maris asked crossly. This is Thrawn's career and life we're talking about. No, I can't forget about the loot, Kento countered. In case you've forgotten, sweetheart, we're already two and a half months late getting Drixo her furs and fire gems. The only thing that's going to keep us alive when we finally show up is if we have something extra to calm her down with. Maris grimaced. I know. She murmured. So what do we do? Cardas asked. 
What you're going to do is convince them to hand it over, Kento said. And don't ask how, he added as Cardas opened his mouth. Beg, cajole, bribe whatever it takes. You're the only one who can do it, Maris agreed soberly. Anytime Rack or I even step outside our quarters, we have an escort following us around. Cardas sighed. I'll do what I can. And don't forget this is a limited time window, Kento warned. Right now, we have at least half an ally in Thrawn. If he gets the boot, we won't have even that much. Briefly, Cardas wondered what they would say if he told them Thrawn had publicly accused all three of them of espionage. But there was no point in worrying them any more than they were already. I'll do what I can he said again, getting to his feet. See you later. He left their quarters and started down the corridor. Aarulani's welcoming ceremony was probably over, but she and Thrawn were most likely still together. Probably talking about Thrass's accusations, Aarulani hadn't struck him as the sort who would waste any more time with ceremonial niceties than necessary. Maybe he could leave word with one of Thrawn's officers that he wanted to see the commander at his earliest convenience. So you do have free run of the base. Cardas turned. Thras was coming up behind him, his expression giving no hint as to what was going on behind those glowing eyes. Syndic Mitofras Safis, Cardas greeted him, fighting to get his brain online again. Forgive my surprise. I assumed you'd be with your brother and the admiral. Thras inclined his head. Come with me, please. He turned and strode off down the corridor. With his pulse pounding uncomfortably in his throat, Cardas followed. Thras led the way to the upper level of the base, where Thrawn and the senior officers had their quarters. They passed a few warriors along the way, none of whom gave either the syndic or the human so much as a curious glance, and finally arrived at a door marked with Shun symbols that Cardas couldn't quite decipher. In here, Thras said, opening the door and gesturing inside. Bracing himself, Cardas stepped past him into the room. He found himself in a small conference room with half a dozen computer-equipped chairs arranged in a circle around a central hologramic display. Seated on the far side of the circle, resplendent in her white uniform, was Admiral Ayarlani. Be seated, Cardas, she said in Chun as Thras stepped into the room behind him. Thank you, Admiral, Cardas said in the same language as he took the seat directly across from her. Welcome back. She nodded acknowledgement, studying him thoughtfully as Thras sat down in the chair to her right. Your proficiency in Chun has improved, she commented. My compliments. Thank you, Cardas said again. It's a beautiful language to listen to. I only regret that I'll never speak it as well as a chiss. No, you won't, Aarilani agreed. I understand you were with Commander Mithran Urodo on this latest military venture. Tell us what happened. Cardas glanced at Thras, back at Aarilani. Forgive my impertinence, but shouldn't you ask Commander Mithran Urodo about this instead of me? We will, Aarilani assured him darkly. Right now we're asking you. Tell us about this latest act of aggression. Cardas took a deep breath. First of all, it wasn't really an act of aggression, he said, picking his words carefully. It was an expedition to investigate unknown warships that had been reported in the area. Vessels that wouldn't have been reported at all if Mithran Uroda wasn't already inclined to premature military action, Aarilani pointed out. Beside her, Thras stirred in his seat. The expansionary fleet's charter does require observation and exploration in the regions around the Chiss Ascendancy, he said. Observation and exploration, Aarilani countered. Not unprovoked military action, she lifted her eyebrows. Or do you deny military action was taken and Chiss casualties sustained? 
Cardas frowned. Thrawn hadn't mentioned anything about casualties. I was unaware that any Chiss warriors had been lost. The whirlwind did not return from the battle, Earlani said. Oh, Cardas said, breathing a little easier. Of course, the missing cruiser was still at the battle scene, keeping the Darkvenge pinned down with the Vagari Grey projector. But he obviously couldn't tell Earlani that. I still maintain that Commander Mithra Nuroto fought only in self-defense. Did the unknown enemy fire first? The firing of weapons isn't always the first act of aggression. Cardas hedged, once again feeling as if he were walking a narrow board over a pit of Gundarks. The Trade Federation battleships launched a massive force of droid starfighters. I've read reports of battles in which these weapons were used and if Commander Mithranuroto hadn't acted to neutralize them, his force would quickly have been overwhelmed. Perhaps, Earlani said. We'll know better once you've shown us around the battle zone. Cardas felt his mouth go suddenly dry. Around the... You object? Earlani demanded. Well, for starters, I don't even know where it is. Cardas said, stalling for time as he thought furiously. If Earlani found the Darkvenge sitting out there. The location isn't a problem, Earlani assured him, holding up a slender cylinder tapered at both ends. I have the last two months' worth of the Springhawk's navigational data. Cardas fought back a grimace. Terrific. All right, he said. But shouldn't we check first with Commander Mithra Nuroto? We're going now precisely because I don't want Commander Mithra Nuroto to know about it, Earlani said. I've sent him on a security sweep of the nearby systems, which should give us time to examine the battle zone and return. Her eyes glittered. And only then will we ask for his version of the battle. Preparing for first target, Kbea said his deep voice sounding strained as it resonated from the low ceiling of the weapon's blister. Firing now, his hands moved in an almost dreamlike way over the controls, and there was a flicker of indicator lights as one of Dreadnought One's sets of turbolasers delivered a massive broadside blast. Standing near the blister's doorway, Obi-Wan stretched out to the force. On the other side of the Dreadnought, he could sense Lorana Jinsler also firing her turbolasers, while all the way on the far side of outbound flight on Dreadnought 4 Manning and the two Duros Jedi did the same. Whoa, Anakin muttered at his side. That's... intense. Yes, Obi-Wan agreed, eyeing Kbeath closely. This was the Jedi Master's third meld today, and the strain of the procedure had to be getting to him. But if it was, Obi-Wan couldn't detect it in the other's face or sense. He'd always assumed that at least part of Kbeath's unshakable confidence in himself was either an act or else a vast overestimation of his actual abilities. Now, for the first time, he began to wonder if the man might actually be as strong in the Force as he claimed. Spouter control, all test one volleys on target, a voice reported from the comm panel. Pretty good, Anakin muttered. Very good, you mean, Obi-Wan said. Can you sense any of Master Kbeath's commands, or just the presence of the meld itself? I don't know, Anakin said, and Obi-Wan could sense the boy tightening his concentration. Preparing for second target, Kbeath announced. Spotter control ready. Firing now, Kbeath said. Again, the indicators flickered. Target two hit, the spotter reported. One flyer. What's a flyer? Anakin asked. It means one of the shots missed the target, Obi-Wan told him, frowning. There'd been something odd on that last shot, something he couldn't quite put his finger on. Stretching out again to the force, this time focusing on the edges of the meld instead of on its center, he tried to track it down. Preparing for third target, 
Kbeath said. Firing now. And this time, as the indicators once again flickered, Obi-Wan saw it. Kbeath had set up a total of six targets in this exercise. Obi-Wan forced himself to wait until all six had been destroyed, the last four with as impressive an accuracy quotient as the first two. The spotter delivered his final report, and with a shaking jerk of his head Kbeath broke the meld. For a few seconds he just sat there, blinking rapidly as the last tendrils of connection between him and his fellow Jedi dissolved completely away. Then, taking a deep breath, he exhaled a long sigh and turned to Obi-Wan and Anakin. What did you think, young Skywalker? Very intense, Anakin said. I've ever seen anything like it before. When can I try it? Not until after you've completed your training, Kbeath said. This isn't something Padawans should be fooling around with. But I could handle it, Anakin insisted. I'm very strong in the force you can ask Obi-Wan Dash. When you're a Jedi, Kbeath said firmly, his forehead wrinkling slightly as he shifted his eyes to Obi-Wan. You have a question, Master Kenobi? If you have a moment, yes, Obi-Wan said, trying to keep his voice casual. Anakin, why don't you head back to Reactor 2 and see if they're ready for us to help with that cooling rod bundle yet? I'll be there in a few minutes. Okay, Anakin said, his forehead wrinkling briefly as he left the room. Well? Kbeath asked, making the word a challenge. You had D-Force Padawans in the weapons blisters with Master Mining just now, didn't you? Obi-Wan asked. Yes, I did, Kbeath said evenly. Is there a problem with that? You just finished telling Anakin that this was way beyond a Padawan's abilities. Kbeath smiled thinly. Calm yourself, Master Kenobi, he said. Of course they weren't actually participating in the meld. Then why were they there at all? For the same reason your Padawan was here, Kbeath said, an edge of impatience creeping into his voice. So that they could get an idea of what a Jedi meld is like. What kind of idea could they get? Obi-Wan asked. They barely even begun their training. They could hardly see any more than any other non-Jedi could. Again, is that a problem? Kbeath asked. Obi-Wan took a careful breath. It is as if the lure of such advanced techniques goads them into pressing ahead too quickly and too impatiently. Kbeath's eyes narrowed. Speak carefully, Master Kenobi, he warned. Such impatience is the mark of the dark side. I will not have you accuse me of walking that path, nor of guiding others along it. I don't accuse you of anything, Obi-Wan said stiffly. Except perhaps of having overly high expectations of those under your tutelage. Kbeath snorted. Better expectations too high for Padawans to ever quite reach than ones so low they never need to stretch beyond what is already known. Better still high but realistic goals that allow for the satisfaction and confidence of achievement. Obi-Wan countered. Abruptly, Kbeah stood up. I will not have my teaching philosophy dissected as if it were an interesting biological specimen, he growled. Particularly not by one as young as you. Age isn't necessarily the best indicator of knowledge in the Force. Obi-Wan pointed out, struggling for calm. No, but experience is, Kbeas shot back. When you've trained as many Jedi as I have, we'll discuss this further. Until then, I believe your Padawan is waiting for you in Reactor 2. Obi-Wan took a careful breath. Very well, Master Kbeas, he said. Until later. He stalked out into the corridor drawing on the force for calm. He hadn't really wanted to come aboard outbound flight, despite his and Winda's concerns about Kbeath. 
not even with the possibility of finding Vergier as extra incentive. Now, though, he was glad he'd come. In fact, when they reached the Roxoli system in four days, their final stop in Republic space, he might consider contacting Windu to ask permission for him and Anakin to stay aboard outbound flight for the entire duration of its mission because one of the other reasons for taking only infants into the temple was to catch them before they could develop preconceived ideas of what a Jedi's life was like and how quickly they could achieve that goal. If all of Gbaeth's Padawans had been cautious types like Lorana Jinsler, that was an issue he probably never even had to consider. But inexperienced though Obi-Wan might be at training future Jedi, this was one problem he knew all about. And if the eagerness he'd sensed in the children watching the meld was any indication, outbound flights Jedi were going to have their hands full keeping their new Padawans from impatiently pushing their boundaries, possibly right over the line into the dark side. Somehow, whether Kbeoth wanted to hear it or not, he had to get that message through to him. Before it was too late. The Starlings cleared away and a small and distant red sun appeared in the Dark Venge's bridge viewports. So? Cav growled. Patience, Vice Lord, Doriana advised, watching the blue-skinned alien standing beside the helm peering at the small device in his hand. Mithranuroto had left the technician behind to guide them to the location the Chiss commander had specified. A moment later the tech gave a small nod and murmured a few words to the silvery TC-18 translator droid at his side. He says, we're here, Vice Lord Cav, the droid reported in its melodic voice. Cav sniffed. Wherever here is. Here is wherever Commander Mithranuroda wants us to be, Doriana said, not bothering to conceal his disgust with the other. Kev had had plenty of time to come to grips with his task force's destruction, but he was just as angry and irritable as ever. And if he didn't watch his tongue and his temper, he was going to get the rest of them killed, too. Then where is he? Kev demanded. Two incoming vessels, the Nymoidian at the sensors called. One Chiss cruiser, one smaller vessel. The Chiss tech spoke again in the Psy Bisti trade language. They are the Springhawk and a long-range shuttle, the TC droid announced primly. Commander Mithran Uroto will wish to board immediately. Tell the commander his usual docking port has been prepared for him, Doriana said. A few minutes later, Mithran Uroto strode through the blast doors onto the bridge, a pair of Chiss warriors trailing behind him. Welcome aboard, Commander, Doriana said, rising from the couch. Thank you, Mithranuroto said, his eyes flicking briefly to Cav's stiff face and posture. I appreciate your swift compliance with my instructions. As I told you earlier, we wish to be fully cooperative, Doriana reminded him. Excellent, Mithranuroto said. I wish you to begin unloading your droid starfighters. Kev jerked like he'd been kicked. What do you say? He breathed, his eyes bugging even more than usual. Your droid starfighters are to be transported to that asteroid. Mithranuroto pointed out the viewports at a small, irregularly shaped crescent of faint light against the stars. After that, I will require the services of those who program their combat movements. Cav gurgled under his breath, and for once Doriana could sympathize with him. The main strength of a Trade Federation battleship lay in its starfighters, the retrofitted quad laser batteries along the split-ring midline more of an afterthought than serious defensive armament. Removing its starfighters would leave the Darkvenge as helpless as the freighter it had once been. This is outrageous, the Nymoidian protested. I will not consent to dash. Be silent, Doriana cut in, his eyes on Mithra Nerodo. Either he wanted the Darkvenge to be helpless, or dash.
You have a plan for dealing with outbound flight, don't you? I have a plan, Mithra Nirodo confirmed. Whether or not I activate it depends on whether or not you're ready to tell me the truth. An uncomfortable lump formed in Doriana's throat. Explain, please. Your name is not Stratus, Mithra Nirodo said. You're not your own master, but answer to another. And the social threat posed by these Jedi is not the true reason you seek outbound flight's destruction. He lifted his eyebrows. If, indeed, you genuinely do seek its destruction, what other reason would we have to be here? Doriana asked. Perhaps your intent was to rendezvous with them, Mithra Nirodo suggested. If outbound flight is filled with warriors instead of colonists, together your combined forces would have had both the firepower and the personnel necessary to launch an effective bridgehead invasion. I've already told you we're not here for conquest. I know what you told me, Mithra Nirodo said, his face expressionless. Now you must persuade me to believe it. Of course, Doriana said. This was going to be risky, he knew, but he'd suspected from the beginning that Mithra Nirodo would eventually come to this conclusion. It was time to give him the rest of the truth. I believe I can answer all of your questions together. If you'll come with me, I'd like to introduce you to my superior. Deliberately, he looked at Cav. You, Vice Lord, will remain here. He didn't wait for Cav's inevitable protest, but set off across the bridge, leading Mithra Naroto back to the office where they'd first conferred two days earlier. He ushered the chiss inside and sealed the door noting with no real surprise that Mithra Nirodo had also left his warrior escort behind. The commander was supremely confident in his abilities, and had clearly deduced that Doriana himself was no threat to him. At least, not yet. Doriana's special hollow projector was already hooked into the Darkvenge's comm system. Punching in the access code, he gestured Mithra Nirodo to the desk chair. Your first point is absolutely correct. He began, mentally crossing his fingers that the battleship's huge transmitter would be able to punch a signal back to the Republic's holonet system. My true name is Kinman Doriana, an identity I've taken care to keep secret from Vice Lord Cav's crew and other associates. You play mutually opposing roles, then? How did you know that? It was obvious, Mithra Nirodo said. Who are your two masters? My official, public master is Supreme Chancellor Palpatine, the head of the Republic government, Doriana said, the words echoing strangely in his ears. He hardly dared even think such things in the privacy of his own mind. To be saying them aloud, and to an unknown alien, was virtually unthinkable. My true master is a Sith Lord named Darth Sidious. A Sith Lord is a being who stands against the Jedi and their control over the Republic, Doriana explained. Ah, Mithra Nirodo said, a faint smile touching the corners of his mouth. A power struggle. In a way, Doriana conceded. But on a plane far different from the one where beings like you and I exist. What's important right now is that Lord Sidious has access to information sources that the Jedi don't have. And what do these sources tell him? Doriana braced himself. There's an invasion coming, he said. A massive assault force of dark ships, shadowy figures, and weapons of great power, based on organic technology of a sort we've never seen before. We believe these far outsiders, as we call them, already have a foothold at the far edge of the galaxy, and even now have scouting parties seeking information on worlds and peoples to conquer. Stories of mysterious invaders are both convenient and difficult to disprove, Mithra Nirodo pointed out. 
Why do you only now tell me this? Doriana nodded toward the door. Because Vice Lord Cav and his associates don't know, he said. Neither does anyone else in the Republic. Not yet. When will Darth Sidious tell them? When he's turned the Republic's chaos into order, Doriana said. When we've built an army and a fleet capable of dealing with the threat. To announce it before then would do nothing but create panic and leave us open to disaster. How does outbound flight fit into all this? As I said, we believe the far outsiders are currently still gathering information, Doriana said. So far, there's no indication that they even know about the Republic. He felt his throat tighten. Actually, that's not entirely true, he corrected himself reluctantly. One of the Jedi, a being named Vergir, disappeared in that region some time ago. That's one of Outbound Flight's private agendas, in fact, to try to learn what happened to her. I see, Mithra Naroto said, nodding slowly. And while a single prisoner can give only hints of his or her origin, an entire shipful of them can provide all that would be needed for a successful invasion. Exactly, Doriana said. Not to mention all the data files and technology they would be able to examine. If outbound flight blunders into their bridgehead, we could find ourselves facing an attack long before we're ready. And the Jedi do not understand this. The Jedi think of themselves as the masters of the galaxy, Doriana said bitterly. Especially the chief Jedi master aboard outbound flight, Joris Kbeath. Even if he knew about the Far Outsiders, I doubt it would make any difference to him. Above the hollow projector, the familiar hooded figure shimmered into view. The hologram was a bit more ragged than usual, Doriana noted, but the connection itself seemed more solid than he'd feared it would be. Sidious was evidently somewhere much closer than his usual haunts on Coruscant. Report, the Sith Lord ordered. His unseen eyes seemed to catch sight of Mithra Naroto, and the drooping corners of his mouth drooped a little farther. Who is this? He demanded. This is Commander Mithra Naroto of the Chiss Expansionary Defense Fleet, Lord Sidious, Doriana said, stepping behind Mithra Naroto where he would be in view. I'm afraid we've had a slight setback in our mission. I don't wish to hear about setbacks, Master Doriana, the Sith Lord said, his gravelly voice taking on a menacing edge. Yes, my lord, Doriana said, trying to stay calm. Even hundreds of light years away, Light could practically feel Sidious's force grip resting against his throat. Let me explain. He gave Sidious a summary of the one-sided battle with the Chiss. Somewhere during the explanation, Sidious's face turned from staring at him to staring at Mithra Naroto. Impressive, he said when Doriana finished. And only one of your ships survives? Doriana nodded. And only because Commander Mithra Naroto chose to leave it intact. Most impressive, Sidious said. Tell me, Commander Mithra Naroto. Are you typical of your species? I have no way of answering that question, Lord Sidious. Mithra Naroto said calmly. I can only point out that I'm the youngest of my people to ever hold the position of Force Commander. I can see why, Sidious said, a slight smile finally lightening some of his brooding darkness. I take it from your presence here that Doriana has explained the need to stop outbound flight before it passes beyond. Our territory? He has, Mithra Naroto confirmed. Have you proof of this impending alien threat? I have reports, Sidious said. If he was insulted that Mithra Naroto would dare to question his word, he didn't show it. Doriana will detail them for you if you wish. Assuming you're convinced, what will be your response? Mithra Naroto's eyes flicked to Doriana. 
Assuming I'm convinced, I'll agree to Doriana's request to intercept and stop outbound flight. Excellent, Sidious said. But be warned. The Jedi will not accept defeat lightly, and they have the power to reach across great distances to touch and manipulate the minds of others. You cannot allow them knowledge of your attack before it is launched. I understand, Mithra Naruto said. Tell me, does this ability to touch others' minds also work the opposite direction? If I, for example, am impressed enough with the need for them to return home, would my urgency influence their thoughts and decisions? They will indeed sense your urgency, Sidious said, the corners of his mouth drooping again. But don't expect them to act on it. Master Kbeoth will not under any circumstances return to the Republic. To even offer him that possibility would rob you of your only chance for a surprise attack. Perhaps, Mithra Naruto said. Though to those who can touch others. Minds the concept of surprise may be limited at best. Which is why Doriana proposed to use droid starfighters as the main thrust of his attack, Sidious pointed out. Still, with all power comes a corresponding weakness. Amid the clutter of the thousands of minds aboard outbound flight, even Jedi sensitivity will be blunted. And once those same thousands of people begin to die in battle dash, his lip twitched. That handicap will increase all the more. I understand, Mithra Naruto said again. Thank you for your time, Lord Sidious. I look forward to hearing the report of your victory, Sidious said, inclining his head. He sent a final look at Doriana, and with a flicker the image was gone. For a long moment Mithra Naruto sat without speaking, his glowing eyes glittering with thought. I'll need a full technical readout on outbound flight and its component dreadnoughts, he said at last. I trust you have current information? Up to and including even the final passenger listings, Doriana assured him. Now that you know about Jedi power against living gunners, shall I cancel your order to remove our droid starfighters? Of course not, Mithra Naruto said, sounding mildly surprised and I'll expect the offloading to be completed by the end of the day. I'll also need two of your droidikas and four of your battle droids to be packed and loaded aboard my long-range shuttle for transport to my base. I presume that six droids can be controlled by something more portable than this vessel's computer? Yes, there are localized datapad systems that can handle up to 200 droids each, Doriana said, suppressing a grimace. Cav was upset enough at him for simply handing over his starfighters for the Chiss to pick apart. He wasn't going to be any happier about losing his combat droids. I'll pack one in with the droidikas. Good, Mithra Naruto said. I take it only the droidikas come with those built-in force shields. Correct, Doriana said. But if you're thinking about adapting the shields for use by your warriors, I'd advise against it. There's a fairly dense radiation quotient involved, plus Hydewist magnetic fields that turn out to be fairly nasty for living beings. Thank you for your concern, Mithra Naruto said, inclining his head slightly. As it happens, we're somewhat familiar with such devices, though they were generally used with reverse polarity. Reverse polarity? Doriana frowned. You mean with the deflection field facing inward? They were used as intruder traps, Mithra Naruto explained. Many an unwary robber incinerated himself as he tried to shoot a guard or homeowner from the inside. Doriana winced. Ah. But as you say, they proved too dangerous to bystanders and innocents who were accidentally caught, the commander went on. Their use was discontinued many decades ago. He stood up. I must leave now. I'll return later to confirm that my orders have been carried out. Nineteen. Fourteen vessels. 
Admiral A.R. Lani declared, her glowing eyes sweeping the field of debris stretched out before them. Possibly thirteen, if the two sections of wreckage to the right belong to a single vessel that broke apart before exploding. Is that the correct number, Cardas? Thras asked. Yes, that sounds about right, Cardas agreed, his muscles wilting a little with relief. The 15th ship, the intact Trade Federation battleship, was nowhere to be seen. He just hoped that it was Thrawn who'd moved it, and that it hadn't managed to skip out on its own. Of course, I was just an observer, he reminded them. I didn't have access to the sensor information. Plus, there were a considerable number of those. A.R. Lani continued, pointing at the charred sections of two droid starfighters floating past the bridge canopy. Too small to be staffed. They're mechanical devices called droids, Cardas said. These in particular are called droid starfighters. Thras grunted. If the field of battle is any indication of their combat abilities, I would say they're misnamed. Don't be misled by your brother's skill at warfare, Syndic Mithras Safis, A.R. Alani warned. If these droids were as useless as you imply, no one would take the time and effort to build them. I've seen reports of them in combat, Cardas confirmed. Against most opponents, they're quite formidable. Yet I still see no evidence that these weapons or their masters attacked first, A.R. Alani pointed out. I can only repeat what I said earlier, Admiral, Cardas told her. The mere act of launching the starfighters was an overt act of aggression. Commander Mithranurodo responded in the only way he could to protect his forces. Perhaps, Aralani said. That will be for a military tribunal to decide. Cardas felt his stomach tighten. You're bringing him up on charges? That will also be for the tribunal to decide, Thras said. But we'll first need to examine the records of the battle and interview the warriors who were present. At this battle as well as the earlier raid against the Vigari. Aralani added. I understand, Cardas said, his heart starting to beat a little faster. Here was the opening he'd been looking for. Speaking of the Vigari, my colleagues and I were hoping we could settle the question soon about the treasure we were promised, so that we could be on our way. Aralani's eyebrows arched. Now, suddenly, you're in a hurry to return home? We're merchants, Cardas reminded her. This has been an interesting and productive side trip, but the cargo in our hold is way overdue for delivery. A cargo you would very much like to supplement with stolen pirate plunder. Yes, but only because our customers will demand late delivery penalties, Cardas explained. There's no way for us to pay those without the items Captain Kento has requested. You should have thought about that before deciding to stay, Thras said. At any rate, the matter of the treasure will have to wait until the tribunal has made its decision. If my brother is found to have violated Chis military doctrine, he'll have no standing to argue your side of the question. I understand, Cardas said heavily. How long is this hearing likely to take? That depends on how quickly I can collect the details of the two battles, Aralani said. Once I've done so, I'll request that a tribunal be seated. Weeks, in other words. Possibly even months. And what will Commander Mithranurodo's status be until then? I'll be supervising his operations and overseeing all of his orders. Aralani said. She nodded fractionally at Thras. At Syndic Mithras Safis's request, Cardas looked at Thras, a prickling sensation on the back of his neck. Once again, Thrawn's analysis had proved right on the mark. You do this to your own brother? The muscles in Thras's cheeks tightened, but it was Aralani who answered. Neither Syndic Mithras Safis nor I is unsympathetic toward Commander Mithranurodo, 
she said evenly. We wish only to protect him from his own excesses of zeal and ability. From his excess of ability? Kardas snorted. That's a new one. He's a gifted tactician and commander, Earlani said. But without proper restraint he'll eventually go too far and end his days in exile. What good will those gifts do anyone then? And meanwhile, the Vigari are free to destroy and kill? Earlani looked away. The lives of other beings are not ours to interfere with, for good or for ill, she said. We cannot and will not trust in whatever feelings of sympathy we might have for the victims of tyranny. Then trust in Mithran Urodo, Kardas urged. You both agree he's a gifted tactician, and he's convinced that the Vigari are a threat you'll eventually have to face. The longer you wait the more alien technology and weaponry you let them steal the stronger they'll be. Then that is what we'll face, Thras said firmly. And as a syndic of the Eighth Ruling Family, I cannot listen to any more of this. He jabbed a finger at the carnage outside the viewport. Now, describe this battle for us. It was half an hour past the shift change, and D4's number three messroom was crowded as Lorana came in. Taking a long step to the side out of the doorway and the people moving in and out, she scanned the crowd for Jedi Master Manning but he was nowhere to be found. Giving the room one final sweep, she started to turn toward the door. Hey! A child's voice called over the hum of background conversation. Hey! Jedi Lorana! It was Jorid Presser, waving his fork over his head to get her attention. His parents, in contrast, had their eyes firmly fixed on their plates as they continued to eat deliberately ignoring her, and it wasn't hard to guess why. Two days ago Master Manning had briefly taken over Presser's hyperdrive maintenance bay to show to some of the young Jedi candidates, and one of the children had managed to dump a container of inverse couplings all over the floor. Presser had had words with Manning about that, to the point where Kbeoth had intervened and docked Presser two days' pay. Best if she left them alone until they got over it, Lorana decided. Waving and smiling back at Jorid, she turned to leave. And nearly ran into Chaz Yulier as he came into the mess room. Slumming, are we? He asked, making no attempt to hide his own coolness. I'm looking for Master Manning, she said, determined not to respond in kind to his open unfriendliness. Kbeoth had wanted Yulier thrown in D4's brig for his attempt to push his way into the Jedi school a few days ago, and it was only with the greatest of tact and diplomacy that Captain Pak Milo had managed to talk him out of it. Have you seen him? Oh, he never comes here, Yulier said. The officers and other important people eat in one of the nicer mess rooms. Lorana's eyes flicked back into the mess room, focusing this time on the decor. It looked fine to her. Oh, I'm sure it's just like the ones you have over on D1, Yulier went on. But it could have been a lot more interesting if you Jedi had a cubic centimeter of style and creativity among you. What does our style or creativity have to do with this? Lorana asked. For a moment Yulier's eyes searched her face as if looking for a lie. Then his lip twitched. I guess you really don't know, he said grudgingly. We wanted to decorate this room like one of the Coruscant underlevels you know, kind of sleazy in an over-the-top sort of way. The folks stationed forward have already done up their mess rooms and theme styles. And? And your stiff-ass permacrete master Manning wouldn't let us, Yulier said acidly. Some nonsense about a low-culture look promoting rebellious attitudes. Lorana winced. Now that he mentioned it, she had heard about this debate. It hadn't made much sense to her either. Let me talk to him, she offered. Maybe I can get him to change his mind. Any idea where he might be? You might try the senior officer's conference room, 
Yulier said, and she thought she could sense a small crack in his animosity. I hear he spends a lot of time in there when it's not being used. Thank you, Lorana said. I'll get back to you on the decorating. She found Manning alone in the conference room, seated in one of the chairs as he gazed out the small viewport at the hyperspace sky flowing past. Master Manning? She called tentatively as the door slid shut behind her. Jedi Jinsler, he said without turning around. What brings you to D4? You weren't answering your comlink, she said. Master Kbeath asked me to come find you. I was meditating, he explained. I always turn off my comm link at such times. I see, Lorana said, studying him closely as she stepped to his side. His face and manner seemed oddly tense. Are you all right? I'm not sure, he said. Tell me, what do you think of what Master Kbeath is doing? The question caught her by surprise. What do you mean? Did you know he suspended the authority of the commander's court to rule on grievances? No, I didn't, she said. What system is he planning on using instead? Us, Manning said. As best I can figure, he essentially wants us to take over supervision of every aspect of life aboard outbound flight. Such as how the people decorate their mess rooms? Manning grimaced. You've been talking to Chaz Yulier and his committee. I talked to Yulier, Lorana confirmed, frowning. I didn't know he had a committee. Oh, it's just a group of people who don't like others telling them what to do, Manning said, waving a hand in dismissal. Mostly reactor complex texts and support people. Their complaints are mostly trivial, like this whole mess room thing. With all due respect, Master Manning, for us to even get involved with outbound flights decor seems a little ridiculous, Lorana offered. No argument from me, Manning admitted. But Master Kbeoth was adamant said the idea of decorating the place like a criminal's den would encourage antisocial attitudes we can't afford in such a close-knit community. The point is that I'm sensing a growing resentment toward us from the people in general. I'm worried that Master Kbeoth may be taking these so-called reforms of his too far. Still, it's hard to argue with his basic premise, Lorana said, feeling distinctly uncomfortable with talking about Kbeoth behind his back this way. People attuned to the Force should be more capable of dispensing justice and maintaining integrity than those who aren't. But it's also hard to see what that has to do with how people decorate their own mess rooms. Exactly, Manning agreed. But I can't seem to get that distinction through to him. Do you think you could make him understand? Lorana grimaced. First Yulia had asked her to talk to Manning, and now Manning was asking her to talk to Kbeath. Had someone appointed her official mediator of the Jedi Order when she wasn't looking? I doubt he'll pay any more attention to me than he would to you, she warned. But I can try. That's all I ask, Manning said, sounding relieved. And don't mark yourself short. There's a special bond between Master and Padawan, a bond that can run far deeper than any other relationship. You may be the only person aboard outbound flight he will listen to. I'm not sure about that, she said. But I'll do what I can. Thank you, Manning said. You said Master Kbeoth was trying to reach me? Lorana nodded. He wants all the Jedi Masters at a meeting tonight at 8 in the D1 Senior Officers Conference Room. More reforms, no doubt. Manning grumbled as he stood up. Talk to him soon, will you? If I can slow him down long enough, Lorana said. In the meantime, what do I tell Yulier? Manning sighed. Tell him I'll think about it. Maybe Master Kbeoth will eventually load himself up with so many other matters that he won't even notice how outbound flight is decorated. Lorana looked out at the hyperspace sky. 
Somehow, I don't think so. Manning shook his head heavily. No. Neither do I. It had been a long and tiring day, but the last group of droid starfighters had finally been unloaded and deployed across the asteroid's uneven landscape. Now, his growling stomach reminding Doriana of the lateness of the hour, he made his way to the Darkvenge Supreme Officer's dining room to get something to eat. Kev was already there, seated alone at one of the corner tables, his expression daring anyone to interrupt him. Doriana took the hint and directed the serving droid to one of the tables on the opposite side of the room. The Vice Lord had been in a thunderous mood all day, which was almost funny in a species as cowardly as the Nymoidians. But no one else aboard had dared to laugh, and Doriana wasn't going to try it either. Even cowards could be pushed too far. He was halfway through his dinner when Kev suddenly stood up and made his way across the room. This mitrado, he said without preamble as he sat down across from Doriana. You think him a genius, do you? I consider him a highly effective military commander and tactician. Doriana said, eyeing the other. Where was this suddenly coming from? His abilities at art or philosophy I can't vouch for. Amusing, Cav growled. But he is not even a good tactician. He is, instead, a fool. Pulling a data pad from inside his robes, he dropped it on the table in front of Doriana. See the reprogramming he has ordered for my starfighters. Doriana glanced at the data pad's display, covered with droid language symbolics. I don't read tech, he said. How about giving it to me in plain basic? Kev snorted contemptuously. He has programmed the starfighters for close approach attacks. Doriana frowned back at the data pad. How close? I believe the term is hull skimming, Kev said, tapping the display. The chief programmer informs me the attack is set for no more than five meters above the hull. Doriana rubbed his cheek thoughtfully. Tactically, it made good sense to cut in that close to an enemy's ships. It put the attacker inside the defender's point defense weaponry, as well as permitting the kind of targeting accuracy that made for efficient destruction of vulnerable equipment and hull plate connection lines. The catch, of course was that it was enormously difficult to get inside those point defenses in the first place. I don't suppose anyone thought to mention to him that dreadnoughts come with a very good point defense system? The programmers did not think it their place to speak out of turn. And neither did you? I. Kev feigned innocence. You, of all people, should know better than to question the orders of a military genius. Doriana took a deep breath. Vice Lord, I strongly suggest you remember our ultimate objective here. We've been sent to destroy outbound flight. Without Mithra Naruto's aid, we have no chance of doing that. Yet a being of his genius is certainly capable of grasping technical readouts, Cav said blandly. Perhaps his plan is to throw our starfighters against outbound flight in an awesome display of disintegrating metal that will frighten Captain Pac Milu into submission. Doriana let his gaze harden, utterly disgusted by this pathetic excuse of a military commander. So in the end all you care about is your pride. He said. You don't even care if Darth Sidious executes us both as long as you can find some small point where you can feel superior to Mithra Naruto. Calm yourself, Kev said, resettling himself comfortably in his chair. There is no reason why my pride and my victory cannot coexist. Explain. I have not told Mithra Odo of the flaw in his plan, the Vice Lord said with spiteful satisfaction but I have instructed the chief programmer to create a secondary attack pattern for the starfighters, which has been overlaid across Mithrado's primary pattern. Once he has wasted the first wave in his foolish close-approach attack, I will take command and switch to a more effective line of attack. Doriana thought it over. 
That would probably work, he decided. It still loses us a full attack wave, he reminded Cav. Not to mention the element of surprise. What surprise? Cav scoffed. As soon as they see the Dark Venge, they will know to prepare for droid starfighters. Doriana pressed his fingertips together. Surely even a Nymoidian Vice Lord couldn't be this dense. I don't suppose it's occurred to you that Mithran Urodo might have offloaded the Starfighters precisely because he doesn't intend to let Captain Pak Mila see the Dark Venge? He suggested. That, in fact, he doesn't intend for the Dark Venge to participate in the battle at all? Apparently, it hadn't occurred to Cav. That is ridiculous, he protested, his eaves widening. No military commander would refuse to bring a battleship of our might into his fleet. Except maybe a commander who's already seen how easily they can be destroyed. Doriana couldn't resist asking. Cav's whole body stiffened. I perceive that you have come under Mithrado's spell, commander, he said evenly. But do not be swayed by his learned manner and cultured voice. He is still a primitive savage. And no matter what the outcome, in the end he will have to die. Doriana sighed. Unfortunately, he had already reached that same conclusion. Mithra Naruto had come into contact with Kardas and his shipmates, and he might easily touch the edge of the Republic again. Until all the witnesses to Darth Sidious's betrayal of outbound flight had been silenced, the mission would not be complete. Regardless, for the moment we still need him alive, he said. How have you arranged for us to reach this second programming level? I will have a relay control, Cav said. Once Mithrado's failure is apparent, I will bring the starfighters back under my control and will complete our mission, he cocked his head. Unless you have further objections? Doriana shook his head. Though we'll have to make sure we're on his bridge when the battle begins. I leave that to you, Cav said. He is a fool in other areas, as well. Did you know he has taken twenty of my starfighters and linked them together by twos with a spare fuel tank between them? What good does that do? Doriana asked, frowning. Those starfighters run on solid fuel slugs. I imagine he was inspired by outbound flight's design, Kev said contemptuously. He is probably regretful that his tanks are too small to fit six starfighters around each. You're sure they're fuel tanks? What else could they be? Kev countered, getting to his feet. A pleasant evening to you, Commander. The Nymoidian walked away, and Doriana returned to his meal. Somehow, the food didn't taste as good as it had five minutes earlier. There, Captain Pacmilla said, pointing a flippered hand at the planet visible through D-1's bridge viewports. Roxali, our last stop in known space. From this point on, we enter territory never before seen throughout all the ages of Republic star travel. It's indeed a historic moment, Obi-Wan agreed. With your permission, Captain. I'd like to send a signal to Coruscant through Roxali's holonet connection. Certainly, Pac Miller said, gesturing aft. The secure comm room will be at your disposal as soon as our guest is finished. Obi-Wan frowned. Less than an hour since outbound flight had made orbit, and already they had a guest? One of the local officials? Hardly, Pac Miller said drilly his eyes swiveling toward the aft blast doors. Ah. Obi-Wan turned and felt his mouth drop open. Local official, nothing. Their visitor was none other than Supreme Chancellor Palpatine himself. Master Kenobi, Palpatine called as he crossed the bridge toward them. Just a man I need. This is an unexpected honor, Chancellor Palpatine. Obi-Wan said, scrambling to find his voice. May I ask what brings you to this edge of the Republic? 
The same thing that moves all of us across the stars these days. Palpatine replied with a wan smile. Politics, of course. In this case, trouble between the Roxali central government and the system's asteroid mining colonies. It must be serious if you had to come out personally, Obi-Wan commented. Actually, they don't want me at all, Palpatine said drilly. All they want from me is to obtain for them the services of the hero of the Balak negotiations, Master Joris Kbayoth himself. Obi-Wan looked at Pak Milu. I'm not sure Master Kbayoth will be interested in the job, he warned Palpatine. As a matter of fact, he isn't, the Supreme Chancellor confirmed. I've already spoken with him, and he flatly refuses to leave outbound flight. We could delay our departure until his negotiations have finished, Pak Milo offered. There's no reason we couldn't spend a few days here. No, I've already suggested that option, Palpatine said, shaking his head. He will not change outbound flight schedule, or leave outbound flight at all, for that matter. He looked back at Obi-Wan. But there is another alternative. Perhaps you would be willing to mediate in his place. Obi-Wan blinked in surprise. With all due respect, Chancellor Palpatine, I don't think that's a substitution that would satisfy them. On the contrary, Palpatine said. I've just spoken with them, and they would be most gratified if you would lend your assistance. He smiled again. After all, there were other heroes at Barlock besides Master Kbeath. Obi-Wan grimaced. Under other circumstances, he would have been only too happy to help out. But with all that was happening aboard outbound flight, he decided to ask the council for permission to extend his tour. Now, suddenly, that decision was being cut out from under him. Because if Kbeath wasn't willing to postpone outbound flight's departure for himself, he certainly wouldn't do so for Obi-Wan. If he and Anakin left now, they wouldn't be getting back aboard. How serious is this problem? He asked. Serious enough, Palpatine said, the lines in his face deepening as his small attempt at levity faded away. If violence erupts, vital or shipments to half the systems in this sector will be cut off. Depending on how much damage the mines sustain, the scarcity could last for years. I'd have to consult the council, Obi-Wan pointed out. With time becoming critical, I've already taken the liberty of doing so, Palpatine said. Master Yoda has given his permission for you to leave outbound flight here instead of continuing on. And even with it couched in terms of permission, Obi-Wan nevertheless knew an order when he heard one. Very well, he said with a sigh. I presume I'll be bringing my Padawan as well? You can hardly let him go running off to the next galaxy without you. Palpatine agreed, the lines smoothing out a bit, and Obi-Wan could sense his relief. I'll take the two of you down in my ship. After that, I'm afraid I must return to Coruscant, but I'll leave one of my guard and his escort ship to bring you back when you're finished. Thank you, Obi-Wan said wondering briefly if he and Anakin should instead take the Delta-12 Sky Sprite that Winda had set up for them in D-3's hangar. But it would take time to activate and prep, and time seemed to be of the essence here. Besides, one of Palpatine's escort ships would undoubtedly be more spacious and comfortable, even if it did mean putting up with one of those humorless men Palpatine always seemed to be hiring as his guards these days. I'll have Anakin start packing. We'll be ready to go within the hour. Thank you, Master Kenobi, Palpatine said, his voice low and earnest. You may never know how much this means to me. My pleasure, Chancellor, Obi-Wan said, feeling a twinge of regret as he pulled out his calm link. We Jedi live only to serve. There it goes, Anakin murmured as Palpatine's shuttle dropped toward the hazy atmosphere of the planet below them. Obi-Wan looked up, but where outbound flight had been there was no longer anything but empty space. 
They have a schedule to keep, he said. I suppose, the boy said, and Obi-Wan could hear some of his own unhappiness echoed in the other's voice. I wish we could have gone a little farther with him. Who, Captain Pac-Millo? Palpatine asked. No, Master Kbayath, Anakin said. He's a really good leader always seems to get things done. Cuts straight through the clutter and finds a way to make everyone do what's best for them. He does indeed have that gift, Palpatine agreed. There are so few like him in these troubled times. Still, our loss is outbound flight's gain. I'm sure they're pleased to have him aboard, Obi-Wan murmured. But he has his task before him, and we have ours, Palpatine continued, handing Obi-Wan a data card. Here's all I have on the Roxolide dispute. You'd best familiarize yourself with it before we land. Thank you, Obi-Wan said, taking the card and slipping it into his data pad. No doubt the complainants themselves will provide any details you've missed. No doubt, Palpatine said drilly. Settle yourself in, Master Kenobi. It's likely to be a very long and weary day. Aorolani's inspection group returned to Krusty from the Trade Federation battle site nearly two hours before Thrawn made it back from the inspection tour the Admiral had sent him on. His report, not surprisingly, went quickly, and he was back with Cardas and Maris for a quick language session less than an hour later. If he realized something significant had happened in his absence, Cardas couldn't find it in his face or voice. The next two days went by slowly. Aarlani spent most of her time in her quarters studying the data she'd collected from the battle site, emerging only for meals or to roam the base looking for warriors to question. So far she didn't seem to have run into the two who'd heard Thrawn announce his suspicions about the bargain hunter's crew, but Cardos knew it was only a matter of time before she did. Thrawn himself was in and out quite a bit over those two days, apparently taking Aarolani's phony inspection order very seriously. Cardos had only a single real conversation with the commander during that time, a long late-night talk in Cardos's quarters right after Aarolani's battlesite survey. Thrawn's fatigue and tension were evident, and when he finally left Cardas pondered long and hard as to whether the commander might have finally overstretched himself. During those days Cardas also tried to spend more time with Kento and Maris. But their conversations were even more depressing. Kento was beginning to act like a caged animal, his broodings peppered with wild plans involving raids on the armory, and storage room followed by a daring escape in the bargain hunter. Maris, for her part, still professed confidence in Thrawn's honor, but even she was clearly starting to have private doubts about his ability to protect them against the Arlani. Something had to be done. And it was Cardas who would have to do it. There were few preparations he could make. The bargain hunter was too well guarded, and anyway he had no intention of trying to fly the ungainly freighter through the entrance tunnel with Thrawn's fighters in pursuit. But at the far end of the docking area was a long-range shuttle the Chiss seemed mostly to be ignoring. A few hours spent in the piloting tutorials of the base's computer system, combined with his previous training in reading Chun symbols, and he had learned the rudiments of flying it. Later, he managed to slip aboard the shuttle without being seen and spent an hour in the pilot's seat, mentally running through the lessons and checklists, and making sure he knew where everything was located. When the time came, he didn't want Admiral Aarlani charging into the shuttle to find him fumbling with the wrong controls. Getting a hold of Aarlani's copy of the Springhawk's navigational download was somewhat more problematic. Thrawn himself provided the opening for that one inviting Aarlani and Thras to a formal dinner on the second night. The cylinder the Admiral had shown him was mixed in with a batch of similar tubes carrying the data she'd recorded at the battle site, and it took him several tense minutes to locate the correct one. And with that, his preparations were finished. He went to bed early that night, but it didn't do him any good. 
He spent most of the night thinking and worrying, his sleep coming in short, nightmare-filled dozings. Like the eerie calm before the bursting of a massive storm, he knew the quiet of the past couple of days was about to end. Mid-morning on that third day, it did. No, Cardas said firmly, meeting Aarlani's glowing eyes as calmly as he could. We're not spies. Not for the Republic, not for anyone else. Then what precisely did Commander Mithra Nuroto mean by his accusation? The Admiral countered. And don't deny he said it. I have the sworn statements of the two warriors who were present at the time. I don't deny it, Kardas said, his eyes flicking to Thras. The syndic was standing silently a few steps behind Aarlani, his expression harder even than the admiral's. Perhaps he knew better than she did what a charge of harboring spies would mean to his brother's career. But I also can't explain it. Maybe he was trying to confuse the Trade Federation commanders. Commanders who have apparently vanished, Aarlani said pointedly. Along with an apparently intact alien warship. I don't know anything about that either, Cardas insisted. All I know is what I've already told you. We're merchants who had a hyperdrive accident and lost our way. Ask the rest of my crew if you don't believe me. Oh, I will, Aarlani assured him. In the meantime, you're confined to your quarters. Dismissed. For a moment Cardas was tempted to remind her that he was still under Thrawn's authority not hers, and that she couldn't simply order him around. But only for a moment. Turning, he stalked out of the room. But he didn't go to his quarters. The Chiz warriors were used to seeing him roaming freely around the base, and it hadn't sounded like Aarlani would make any official pronouncements to the contrary until after she'd interrogated Kento and Maris. He had that long to make his escape. The shovel was still parked where it had been the previous day. There were a few chis working in the area, but the time for subterfuge was long past. Striding along like he owned the place, Cardas stepped through the hatchway into the shuttle, sealed it, and headed forward. The vessel was a civilian model, with a simpler and quicker startup procedure than a military ship would have had. Within five minutes he had the systems up and running. Five minutes more, and he had disengaged from the docking clamps and was making his way carefully down the tunnel. No one followed him out. He looked around as he reached open space, half expecting to see the intact Trade Federation battleship lurking in the shadow of one of the other asteroids. But it was nowhere to be seen. Not that it mattered. He knew where he was going, and there was no one now who could stop him. Turning the shuttle onto the proper vector, he hit the hyperdrive control and made the jump to light speed. The next stop, assuming he'd properly programmed in the Springhawks NAV data, would be the alien system where he, Thrawn, and Maris had witnessed the Vagari attack five weeks ago. With luck, that campaign would be over. With even more luck, the Vagari would still be there. Six hours later, he emerged from hyperspace to find that the battle was indeed over. The defenders had put up a spirited defense, he saw as he eased the shuttle carefully through the debris. Blackened hulks were everywhere, floating amid bits of hull and hatch and engine. There were bodies, too. Far too many bodies. Not that their sacrifice had done them any good. There were dozens of Vigari ships orbiting the planet, nestled up to it like carrion avians around a fresh corpse. Most were the bubble-hulled warships they'd seen in the battle, but there were also a number of the civilian transports that had been waiting for the fighting to end. A steady stream of smaller ships were moving in and out of the atmosphere, no doubt bringing plunder and slaves up to the orbiting ships and then heading down for a fresh load. Briefly, an image flashed into Cardassa's mind of streams of hive insects zeroing in on a dropped bit of Raoul picnic salad. A floating body bounced gently off the shuttle's canopy, jarring him back to reality. 
If he had any brains, he knew, he would turn the shuttle around right now and head back to Krusty to take his chances with Admiral Arlani. Or else he should abandon Kento and Maris completely and make a run for Republic space. Swearing gently under his breath, he turned toward the largest of the orbiting warships and headed in. Even with most of their attention on their looting, the Vigari were cautious enough to protect their backs. The half a dozen roving fighters intercepted him before he'd covered even a quarter of the distance, and suddenly his calm crackled with melodious, but evil-sounding alien speech. I don't understand your language, Cardas replied in Sibisti. Do you speak Sibisti? The only response was more alien speech. How about Minisiat? He asked, switching to his newest trade language. Can anyone there understand Minisiat? There was a short pause. State your name, your species, and your intentions. The alien voice came back, mouthing the trade language with some difficulty. My name is George Cardas, Cardas told him. I'm a human from a world called Corellia. He took a deep breath. I'm here to offer you a deal. Twenty. The fighters escorted him to one of the smaller warships, directing him to a starboard docking bay. A group of heavily armed and armored guards was waiting there for him, short bipeds with large hands, their features hidden by faceplates lavishly decorated to look like fright masks. They took him to a small room loaded with sensor equipment, where he was stripped, searched, and scanned multiple times, his clothing taken away presumably for similar scrutiny. The shuttle, he had no doubt, was undergoing a similar examination. Afterward, he was taken to another room, this one bare of everything except a cot, and left there alone. He spent most of the next two hours either trying to rest or else giving up the effort and pacing back and forth across his cell. If the Vigari were smart, the thought kept running along the back of his mind, they would simply kill him and go on with their looting. An avian in the hand, after all, was a pretty universal maxim. But maybe, just maybe, they would be greedy as well as smart. Greedy and curious. Two hours after he'd been tossed into his cell, the guards returned with his clothing. They watched him dress, then marched him out and along a corridor to a hatch marked with alien symbols. Beyond the hatch, to his relief, was a shuttle and not simply a quick death by spacing. They nudged him inside and piled in behind him, and a minute later they were off. The shuttle had no viewports, giving him no clue as to where they were going, but when the hatch opened again it was to a double row of Vigari soldiers in fancier uniform armor than his captors. Apparently, someone in authority had decided to see him. He'd expected to be taken someplace small and cramped and anonymous, as befit a proper interrogation. It was therefore a shock when the final blast door opened into a large chamber that rivaled the most elaborate groundside throne rooms he'd ever seen. Against the back wall was a raised dais with an exquisitely decorated chair in the center occupied by a Vigari clad in a heavy-looking multicolored robe with sunburst shoulder and ankle guards, a serrated cloak back, and no fewer than four separate belts around his waist. Flanking him were a pair of Vigari in only slightly less gaudy robes advisors or other underlings, probably. All three wore tall wraparound face masks that reached from cheekbones to probably a dozen centimeters above the tops of their heads decorated in the same fearsome pattern as the soldier's combat faceplates. A cynical thought flickered through Cardas's mind that the height of the masks was probably designed to compensate for the species' natural shortness and make them look more dangerous to their enemies. Lining the walls were other Vigari, some in soldier's armor, others in what seemed to be civilian clothing and simple face paint. All of them were gazing silently at the prisoner being brought before the throne. Cardas waited until the guards had positioned him three meters back from the throne, then bowed low. I greet the great and mighty Vigari Dash. He began in Minisiat. And was slammed to his hands and knees by a sharp blow across his shoulders. 
You do not speak in the presence of the Mizkara until spoken to. One of the guards reproved him. Kardas opened his mouth to apologize, caught his near error just in time, and remained silent instead. For a long minute the rest of the room was quiet, too. Kardas wondered if they were waiting for him to get up, but with his shoulder blades throbbing from that blow it seemed a better idea to stay where he was until otherwise instructed. Apparently it was the right decision. Very good. A deep voice came from the dais at last. You may rise. Carefully, tensing for another blow, Kardas stood up. To his relief, the blow didn't come. I am the Mizkara of the Vigari people, the Vigari seated on the throne announced. You will address me as your eminence. I'm told you have the insolence to demand that I bargain with you. I make no demands of any sort, your eminence, Kardas hastened to assure him. Rather, I'm in terrible difficulty and came here hoping the great and mighty Vigari people might be willing to come to my assistance. In return for your aid, I hope to offer something you might find of equal value. The Mizkara regarded him coolly. Tell me of this difficulty. My companions and I are merchants from a distant realm, Kardas told him. Nearly three months ago we lost our way and were taken captive by a race of beings known as the Chiss. We've been their prisoners ever since. A twitter of muted conversation ran around the room. Prisoners, you say? The Mizkara repeated. The visible part of his face had seemed to harden at the mention of the Chiss, but his voice wasn't giving anything away. I see no chains of captivity about your neck. My apparent freedom is an illusion, your eminence, Kardas said. My companions are still in Chiss hands, as is our ship. Of equal importance, the Chiss now refused to release to us some of the spoils of one of their raids, spoils that we were promised and that we need to pay off the late fees our customers will demand. Without that treasure, we will face certain death when we reach home. Where are your companions being held? At a small base built deep inside an asteroid, your eminence, Kardas said. The navigational data necessary to locate it is contained in the computer of the vessel in which I arrived. And how did you know how and where to find us? Kardas braced himself. I will do whatever necessary, Thrawn had once told him, to protect those who depend on me. Because, your eminence, he said, I was present aboard the Chiss attack cruiser that raided your forces here during your battle of conquest five weeks ago. A deadly silence settled over the room. Kardas waited, painfully aware of the armed soldiers standing all around him. You stole one of our ship nets, the Mizkara said at last. The commander of the Chiss force did that, yes, Kardas said. As I say, I was his prisoner and took no part in the attack. Where is this commander now? I don't know exactly, Kardas said. But the base where my ship and companions are being held is under his command. Wherever he might travel, he will always return there. The Mizkara smiled thinly. So you offer to trade your companions and some of our own treasure for nothing more than a chance at revenge? That was not, Kardas thought uneasily, a very auspicious way of phrasing it. You'd get your ship net back, too, he offered. No the Mizkara said firmly. The offering is insufficient. Kardas felt his throat tighten. Your eminence, I beg you, Dash. Do not beg. The Mizkara snapped. Grubs beg. Inferiors beg. Not beings who would speak and bargain with the Vigari. If you wish us to help you and your companions, you must find more to offer me. But I have nothing more, your eminence, Kardas protested, his voice starting to tremble. No, this couldn't happen. The Vigari had to agree to the deal. I swear to you. Not even those? The Mizkara demanded, 
pointing over Cardas's shoulder. Cardas turned. Sometime during the conversation someone had brought in four large crates, two of them a head taller than him, the others coming only up to his waist. I don't understand, he said, frowning. What are those? They were aboard your transport, the Mizkara said suspiciously. Do you claim ignorance of them? I do, your eminence, Cardas insisted, completely lost now. What in the worlds could Thrawn have had stashed aboard the shuttle? I stole the vessel solely to come ask for your help. I never looked to see if there was anything aboard. Then look now, the Mizkara ordered. Open the crates and tell me what you see. Carefully, half expecting to be shot in the back, Cardas made his way back to the crates. The Vigari had already opened all of them, of course, merely setting the front panels loosely back into place. Stepping to one of the smaller boxes, he got a grip on the panel and pulled it off. And caught his breath. Inside, folded up neatly with their arms wrapped around their knees, were a pair of Trade Federation battle droids. Do you recognize them? The Mizkara asked. Yes, your eminence, Cardas confirmed. Suddenly it all made sense. They're battle droids of a sort used by one of the species in our region of space. The commander also raided a force of those people. This must be part of the spoil of that raid. What are droids? Mechanical servants, Cardas said. So Thrawn had been right. Apparently no one out here knew anything about droids. At least, no one the Vigari had run into. Some are self-motivated, while others require a centralized computer to give them their instructions. Show me how it works. Cardas turned back to the crate, peering inside. There was no sign of a controller or programming console. I don't see the equipment I need to start it up, he said, stepping to the other small box and pulling off the front. There were two more folded battle droids inside, and again no sign of a controller. Each of the two larger boxes turned out to contain one of the even deadlier droidica destroyer droids. Still no controller. I'm sorry, your eminence but without the right equipment I can't start them up. Perhaps this would be of use, the Mizkara suggested. He gestured, and one of the non-armored Vigari watching the proceedings pulled a data pad from beneath his robe. Stepping up to Cardas, he offered it to him. A small ripple of relief washed over some of Cardas's tension. It was indeed a Trade Federation droid controller labeled in both Nymoidian and Basic. Yes, your eminence it will, he told the Mizkara as he looked over the controls. Activator. There. Shall I try to activate them now? Try. Cardas grimaced. Shall I activate them now, your eminence? He corrected himself. Yes. Bracing himself, Cardas pushed the switch. The result was all he could have hoped for. In perfect unison the four battle droids unfolded themselves halfway, walked forward out of their crates, and then stood up, reaching back over their shoulders and drawing their blaster rifles. The droidikas were even more impressive, rolling forward out of their crates and unfolding into their tripedal battle stances. Around one of them, as if to demonstrate the full range of its capabilities, the faint haze of a shield appeared. And suddenly Cardas realized that there were twelve blasters pointed directly at the dais where the Mizkara and Nas seated. Slowly, carefully, he turned around. But the Mizkara wasn't cowering behind his soldiers, and the soldiers themselves didn't have their weapons lined up ready to turn Cardas into a cinder. Impressive the Mizkara said calmly. Who commands them? Cardas peered at the data pad. There should be a pattern recognition modifier here somewhere. At the moment, whoever is handling the controller, your eminence, he said. 
but I think they can be programmed to obey a specific individual instead. You will order them to obey me. Yes, your eminence, Kardas said, quickly sifting through the datapad's recognition menu. It looks straightforward enough. Uh. I'll need you to come down here, though, so that the droids can see you up close. Silently, the Mizkara stood up and stalked down the steps, motioning his two advisors to stay where they were. He stepped between the two droidikas and stopped. Do it now, he ordered. Feeling sweat collecting beneath his collar, Cardos ran through what he hoped was the proper procedure. The six droids turned slightly to face the Mizkara. Then, to his relief, the battle droids raised their blasters to point toward the ceiling as the droidikas swiveled a few degrees to point their weapons away from him as well. That should do it, your eminence, he said. Of course, he added as something belatedly occurred to him. They won't be programmed to understand orders given in Manisiat. You will teach me the proper commands in their language, the Vigari said. The first command I wish to know is target. The second is... Fire. Yes, your eminence. Cardas gave him the two basic words, enunciating them carefully. Perhaps your people can transcribe them phonetically for you, he suggested. No need the Mizkara said. He lifted a finger and pointed to Cardas. Target. Cardas jerked backward as all six droids swiveled to point their blasters at him. Your eminence? He breathed. No, the Mizkara said, his voice silky smooth. You pronounce the other word. Cardas swallowed hard. If he'd done this wrong. Fire he said. Nothing happened. Excellent, the Mizkara said approvingly. So you are indeed wise enough not to attempt a betrayal, he lifted a hand. Bring me three Jeruns. Yes, your eminence, one of the soldiers acknowledged and left the room. Does your commander Mithranurodo have more of these machines? The Mizkara asked, turning back to Kardas. Several hundred at least, Cardas told him. Possibly as many as several thousand. A movement at the door caught his eye, and he turned as three small aliens were herded into the room. Who are these? Slaves, the Mizkara said offhandedly. Their pitiful little world is the one currently rolling beneath us. Machines, target. Cardas stiffened as the droids swiveled toward the three slaves. Wait. You object? The Mizkara asked. Cardas closed his eyes briefly. I will do whatever necessary the words echoed through his mind. I was merely concerned for the safety of your soldiers, he said. Let us find out how good the machine's aim is, the Mizkara said. Machines fire. The salvo from the battle droid's carbine sent the three slaves toppling backward, dead before they even hit the floor. They were still falling when the fire from the droidikas almost literally cut them in half. Excellent, the Mizkara said into the shocked silence. Not shocked by the deaths Kardas knew, but by the display of firepower. Where do the Chiss keep the others? The commander will have them at the base, Cardas murmured mechanically, trying without success to force his eyes away from the charred bodies. Then we will relieve him of them, the Mizkara said, gesturing to one of the advisors. Order an assault force to be prepared at once. Yes, your eminence, the other said. Stepping off the dais, he strode from the room. And while we wait... The Mizkara went on, turning back to Cardas. You will teach me the rest of the words necessary for controlling my fighting machines. Cardas swallowed hard. Whatever necessary. As you wish. Your Eminence. Outside the Springhawk's bridge canopy, the scattered stars and a small but magnificent globular cluster blazed brilliantly out of a black sky. 
the stars, the cluster, and nothing else. Surreptitiously, Doriana looked at his chrono. Outbound flight was late. Apparently, the look hadn't been surreptitious enough. Patience, Commander, Mithran Urodo said calmly from the captain's chair. They will come. They are late, Vice Lord Kev said, scowling at the back of Mithran Urodo's head. More than two hours late. Two hours is nothing in a voyage of three weeks, the commander pointed out reasonably. Not for Captain Pak Milu, Kev retorted. Mon Calamari are notorious for punctuality. They will come, Mithran Urodo said again, half turning to eye the Nymoidian. The only question is whether or not this system is indeed on the correct straight-line path between their last Republic stop and the system where you were preparing to ambush them. Do you dare dash? Cav began. The vector was calculated correctly. Doriana interrupted with a warning glare. Our question, on the other hand, is why you think they'll actually stop here. They will, Mithran Urodo assured him. The droid starfighters are ready? Very much so, Kev assured him in turn, and Doriana could hear the vindictive anticipation in his tone. The starfighters were ready, all right, complete with the second command layer the Vice Lord's chief programmer had built in on top of Mithran Urodo's close approach pattern. The commander inclined his head to the Nymoidian. Then we have only to wait, he turned back to the canopy. And suddenly, with a flicker of pseudo-motion, there it was, floating in space not five kilometers ahead. Outbound flight had arrived. The device is called a gravity projector, Mithran Urodo said. It simulates a planetary mass, thus forcing out any ship whose hyperspace vector crosses its shadow. Really, Doriana said, trying to sound calm. To the best of his knowledge, no one in the Republic had ever figured out how to turn that particular bit of hyperspace theory into an actual working device. The fact that the Chiss had solved the problem sent discomforting ramifications ricocheting across his mind. Cav, predictably, wasn't nearly as interested in such long-term thought. Then they are in our hands, he all but crowed. All forces attack? Hold, Mithran Urodo said. His voice was still calm, but there was a sudden new edge to it. I give the orders aboard this ship, Vice Lord Cav. It is our mission, Commander Mithrado, Cav countered. And as we debate, we lose the precious element of surprise. Fishing into his robes, he pulled out a calm activator. You and your ships may do as you wish, but my starfighters will attack. No. Doriana snapped, making a grab for the activator. If Kev fouled up Mithran Urodo's plan, whatever that plan was, outbound flight might yet slip through their fingers. But his reach was too short, his grab too late. Twisting his long arms out of range, Kev triumphantly keyed the activator. Swearing viciously, Doriana looked over at the asteroid where the lines of droid starfighters waited. Nothing happened. Again, Cav keyed the switch. Again, nothing. I'm afraid that won't work, Vice Lord, Mithra Nerodo said calmly. I took the liberty of removing the alternate command layer your programmers had created in the Starfighter's systems. Slowly, Cav lowered the activator. You are very clever, Commander, he said softly. Someday that cleverness will turn against you. Perhaps, Mithra Nerodo said. Until then, allow me to thank you for showing me how such secondary programming is done. That will prove useful today. So what now? Doriana asked cautiously. We talked to them, Mithra Nerodo said, king his board. Communications, create a channel. By the time Lorana arrived, D1's bridge had become a hive of quiet pandemonium. Kbeath was standing beside Captain Pakmila's command chair, 
his back stiff as he gazed out the canopy. Pak Milu himself was over at one of the engineering stations, his flippered hands opening and closing restlessly as he studied the displays. Outside the canopy, arrayed in the distance in front of them like a pack of hunting how runners, were a dozen small ships of a configuration Lorena had never seen before. The re-back seems to indicate we're in the middle of a planetary mass shadow, the engineering officer was saying tautly as she reached Pak Milla's side. But you can see yourself that can't possibly be right. This is Commander Mithra Nuroto of the Chis Expansionary Defense Fleet. A cultured voice boomed over the bridge speakers. Please respond. Who's that? Lorana asked. The commander of that force over there. Pak Miller rumbled, still studying the readouts. He's been calling every five minutes for the past half hour. You haven't answered him? Pak Miller's mouth tendrils stiffened. Master Kbeoth has forbidden it. He growled. He insists we know what happened to our hyperdrive before we reply. Maybe the commander could tell us what happened, Lorana suggested. Of course he could, Pak Miller said sourly. But I cannot persuade Master Kbeoth to that point of view. Lorana grimaced. Let me talk to him. Kbeoth was still gazing at the alien ships as Lorana joined him. So, Jedi Jinsler, he greeted her. We meet our first challenge. Why does it have to be a challenge? Lorana asked. Maybe all he wants to do is talk. No, Kbeoth said, his voice dark. I can sense a deep malice out there, malice directed at my ships and my people. Their alien minds, Lorana reminded him feeling her pulse starting to pick up its pace. She'd seen Kbeoth in this stiff-necked mood before. Perhaps you're simply misreading them. No, he said. They intend trouble, and I intend to be fully prepared to deal with it before I talk to them. Command, this is Monning. A voice came from the command chair speaker. We're standing ready at D4's weapon systems. Acknowledged. Kbeoth said, giving Lorana a tight smile. Dreadnought 4 was the last. Now we're ready to talk. Deliberately, he lowered himself into Pak Milla's command chair and touched the comm switch. Alien Force, this is Jedi Master Joris Kbeoth, commanding the outbound flight project of the Galactic Republic, he announced. Lorana looked back at Pak Milu wincing to herself at Kbeoth's casual preemption of his command authority. But there was no resentment in the Mon Cal's expression or stance, only a quiet sense of resignation. Apparently, he bowed to the inevitable. Master Kbeoth, this is Commander Mithra Nurodo, the cultured voice replied promptly. Let me see your face, Kbeoth ordered. There was a brief pause. Then the calm display came to life, showing a near human with blue skin and blue black hair and glowing red eyes. He was dressed in a black tunic with silver bars on the collar. There are matters of great importance we need to discuss at once, Mithra Naruto said. Would you care to join me in my flagship, or shall I come to you? Kbeoth snorted gently. I will discuss nothing until you stand away from my path and I will continue to hold here until we have spoken. Mithra Nerodo replied, his voice as firm as Kbeoth's. Are the Jedi afraid of talk? Kbeoth smiled thinly. The Jedi fear nothing, Commander. Come aboard then, if you insist. A hatchway will be illuminated for your shuttle. Mithra Nerodo inclined his head. I shall be there shortly. He gestured somewhere off-screen, and the image vanished. You're going to allow him aboard? Pak Milla demanded. Of course, Kbeoth said, an odd glint to his eve. Or don't you find it curious that this supposed resident of the unknown region spoke to us in basic? Lorana felt her breath catch. 
To her chagrin, she hadn't even noticed the oddness of that fact. No, there's something more here than meets the eye, Kbeoth continued. Let's find out what that something is. Come aboard then, if you insist, Kbeoth's voice echoed from the D4. Reactor monitor room speaker. A hatchway will be illuminated for your shuttle. There was a click. D4? A different voice called. Any progress? With an effort, Yulier pulled his thoughts back to focus. Still negative here, Command, he reported, running his eyes again over his displays. There's plenty of power going to the hyperdrive. It's just not doing anything once it gets there. That's confirmed, Command. Dillian Presser's voice seconded from the hyperdrive monitor room half a dozen meters away. The readouts still insist we're in a gravield. So do everyone else's, Command growled. All right. Keep running your diagnostics and stand by. There was a click and Command was gone. This is insane, Presser muttered. Maybe more insane than you think, Yulier said, his mind racing. This might finally be their chance. Or didn't you notice that Commander Myth whatever was speaking basic? There was a short pause. You mean he's from the Republic? Well, he's sure not from the unknown regions, Yulier said. We've got to find a way to talk to him. Who us? Of course us, Yulia shot back. You, me, the whole committee. If this guy's from the Republic, maybe he's got the authority to get Kbeath and the rest of the Jedi kicked off. It's not all the Jedi, Presser argued. Anyway, what would some hotshot from the Republic be doing way out here? It's more likely a pirate who found out about outbound flight and decided to grab some easy pickings. In his mind's eye, Yulier saw the firing scores from Kbeath's Jedi Mel tests. Trust me, Presser, this thing is not easy pickings, he said grimly. But whoever he is, we still have to try. Fine, Presser said. But how? We're on duty. To what? Yulier countered. A reactor that's working perfectly and a hyperdrive that isn't working at all. But nothing. Yulier cut him off. Come on, this may be our last chance to get outbound flight back to what it was supposed to be. There was a short pause. All right, I'm game, Presser said at last. But if this myth whatever's already on his way, we don't have much time. Not if we're going to collect everyone and get all the way over to D1. You just collect them, Yulier said. I'll make sure he stays put until you get there. How? No idea, Yulier said. Just collect everyone, all right? And don't forget to bring the children. There's nothing like children when you're playing for sympathy. Got it. Yulier keyed off the comet, and for a moment sat gazing unseeingly at his displays as he tried to think. D1 was indeed a long way away, and if he knew Kbeath the conversation was likely to be short and unpleasant. If he tried to walk or even run, he was likely to miss Myth whatever completely. But there should be one of D4's swoops parked just a little way aft. Ninety seconds later, he was racing down the corridor, the wind of his passage whipping through his hair and stinging his eyes. Fortunately, with outbound flight at full alert, everyone was either at their battle stations or huddled in their quarters out of the way. The corridors were empty. Reaching the forward pylon, he punched for the turbo lift, but instead of leaving the swoop at the way station like he was supposed to, he maneuvered it into the car. 
Let Kbeath complain about it. Let him even lock Yulia in the brig for a few days if he wanted to. Whatever it took, he would see this myth whatever before he left outbound flight. Cardas had been waiting for nearly three hours before the Mizkara again summoned him to the throne room. All is prepared, the Vigari informed him. We fly at once to draw our vengeance from Mithranurodo and the Chiss. Yes, your eminence, Cardas said, bowing his head and trying not to look at the half-dozen fresh Jeroon bodies scattered around the throne room. Apparently, the Mizkara had been playing some more with his new toys. I would once again ask you to remember that my companions and ship are also there, and would beg your soldiers to be careful. I will remember, the Mizkara promised. And I will do even more. I have decided you will be permitted the best view possible of the forthcoming battle. Cardas felt something cold run through him. You mean I'll be on the bridge, your eminence? Not at all, the Mizkara said calmly. You will be in the forward most of my flagship's external bubbles. Cardas looked sideways to see a pair of armored Vigari striding toward him. I don't understand, he protested. I've offered you the chance at both vengeance and profit. Or the chance to fly into a trap, the Mizkara said, his voice suddenly icy. Do you think me a fool, human? Do you think me so proud and rash that I would simply fly a task force to a supposedly small and undermanned Chiss base in my thirst for revenge? He snorted a multi-toned whistle. No, human, I will not send a small task force to be destroyed. My entire fleet will descend on this base. And then we shall see what sort of teeth this Chiss trap truly has. The Chiss aren't waiting there with any trap. Cardas insisted. I swear it. Then you should have nothing to fear, the Mizkara said. If we destroy the enemy as quickly as you claim we will, you will be released and your companions freed. If not, you will be the first to die. He cocked his head slightly. Have you anything else you wish to say before you are taken away? A confession, perhaps? or an admission of guilt? No, your eminence, Cardas said. I only hope your soldiers are as capable against the Chiss as they've proven themselves to be against other opponents. The Jeruns could tell you of our capabilities, the Mizkara said darkly. But you will see them for yourself soon enough, he gestured. Take him away. Five minutes later, Cardas was pushed through a narrow doorway in the hull into a zero-G plastic bubble perhaps twice the size of a coffin. Set against the hull on one side of his head was what seemed to be a small air supply and filtering system, while on the other was a mesh bag containing a couple of water bottles and ration bars from the Chiss shuttle, along with a diamond-shaped device of unknown purpose and as the thick home metal was sealed against his back he knew the chance cube had been thrown. From now on, everything that happened would be under the control of others. He could only hope that the Mizkara had been telling the truth about the size of the force he was sending. 21. The fact that Mithranuroto was a near human this far from Republic space had been Lorana's first surprise. More surprising than that were the culture and refinement of his demeanor and speech as he spoke to her and Kbeath from the other side of the conference room table. His reason for intercepting outbound flight was the biggest surprise of all. And the most chilling. Kbeath, predictably, wasn't impressed by any of it. Ridiculous, he said scornfully when Mithra Nerodo had finished. A mysterious species of conquerors moving across the galaxy toward us. Please. That's the sort of story bad parents frighten their children with. You know everything there is to know about the universe, then? Mithra Nerodo asked politely. I was under the impression that this region of space was unknown to you. Yes, it is, Kbeath said. But rumors and stories aren't limited by geographical and political boundaries. 
If a species so dangerous truly existed, we would surely have heard something about them by now. What about Vergeer? Lorana murmured from beside him. Something like this might explain her disappearance. Or it might not, Kbeath countered. It doesn't take a species of conquerors to silence a single Jedi. His eyes glittered. To silence a group of Jedi, of course, is a different matter entirely. And as to this Darth Sidious you cite, I put even less faith in his words than I do in idle rumors. Darth is the title of a Sith Lord, and the Sith have long since vanished from the galaxy. That makes him a liar right from the start. Perhaps, Mithron Erodo said. But I didn't come here for an open debate. The fact remains that I cannot and will not permit you to continue on through this region of space. You must turn back to the Republic and pledge to never return. Or? Kbeoth challenged. Mithran Urodo's glowing red eyes were steady on him. Or I will be forced to destroy you. Lorana braced herself for the inevitable explosion. But Kbeoth merely smiled thinly. So says the avian chick to the Billinus dragon. Do you truly believe your twelve ships could survive ten minutes against the firepower I hold here in my hand? Mithran Urodo lifted his eyebrows politely. Your personal hand? He asked. My Jedi are even now standing by in the Kamop center above us, as well as at the weapon stations of each individual dreadnought, Kbeoth said. I'll soon be joining them. And if you've never before faced Jedi reflexes and insight, you'll find it a sobering experience. Mithran Urodo's expression didn't change. Whatever their training, it will do them no good, he said. Your only choices are to leave now and take your people home, or perish. What is your answer? What if we promise to go around this region? Lorana asked. Kbeoth looked at her, and she sensed his surprise at her presumption quickly turning to anger. Jedi Jinsler Dash. I mean all the way around it. Lorana continued, fighting against the weight of his displeasure pressing against her mind. We could go to a different part of the rim and jump off for the next galaxy from there. No, Kbeoth said firmly. That would take us thousands of light years out of our way. That would be acceptable, Mithran Erodo said, looking at Lorana. Provided you avoided the entire region lying along your current vector. No, Kbeath bit out, his eyes blazing. Lorana, you will be silent. Commander, you do not dictate to us. Not you, not anyone else. Abruptly, he shoved Hack his chair and rose towering to his full height. We are the Jedi, the ultimate power in the universe, he declared, the words ringing through the conference room. We will do as we choose, and we will destroy any who dare stand in our way. Lorana stared up at him, her heart suddenly pounding in her throat. What was he saying? What was he doing? There is no emotion, there is peace. In that event, the conversation is over, Mithran Erodo said. His expression hadn't changed, but as Lorana tore her gaze from Kbeath and looked at the commander she could sense a hardening of his resolve that sent a fresh shiver up her back. I will give you an hour to consider my offer. No, you will cease whatever you're doing to hold us in this system and move your ships out of our path. Kbeath countered. One hour, Mithran Urodo repeated, sliding back his own chair and standing up. Jedi Jinsler, perhaps you'll escort me back to my transport? As you wish, Commander, Lorana said, not daring to look at Kbeath as she scrambled to her feet. Follow me, please. Captain Pak Miller had offered some of his security personnel to bring Mithran Urodo aboard. Typically, Kbeath had refused, 
insisting he and Lorana needed no such show of force to keep the alien commander in line. Which now left Lorana and Mithranurodo alone as they walked back toward the hangar. Your master Kbeath is both arrogant and stubborn. Mithranurodo commented as they walked. A bad combination. He is all that, Lorana conceded. But he's also a Jedi master, and as such he has knowledge and power hidden from the rest of us. For your own sake, I beg you not to underestimate him. Yet if this knowledge is hidden, how can you be sure it is accurate? Lorana grimaced. That was, unfortunately, a good question. I don't know, she said. Surely you don't stand alone, Mithranurodo pointed out. There must be others aboard who oppose to Master Kbeath's tyranny. Tyranny. It was a word Lorana hadn't dared use even in the privacy of her own mind. Now, suddenly, it could no longer be avoided. Yes, there are. She murmured, frowning. Directly ahead down the corridor, shifting nervously back and forth between his feet, she could see Chaz Yulia from B4 loitering against the wall. Here to confront her with some new problem, no doubt. But he said nothing as she and Mithra Nerodo approached, merely following them with brooding eyes as they passed him. There was another shuttle park near the Chiss vehicle, she noted, one of outbound flight's transports. Curious, that hadn't been there when the Chiss commander arrived. We don't intend your people any harm, she told Mithra Nerodo as they stopped at his shuttle's hatchway. I believe you, he said. But intent alone is meaningless. Your actions are what will determine your fate. Lorana swallowed. I understand. You have one hour. Inclining his head to her, Mithranurodo turned and disappeared into his vehicle. Lorana moved back to allow the pilot room to maneuver. And as she did so, she sensed a familiar presence. Turning, she saw Yulia walking toward her. Striding along behind him, a cold fire in his eyes, was Kbeath. Jedi Jinsler, Kbeath said as Mithra Nerodo's shuttle slipped through the atmosphere's shield and disappeared out into the blackness of space. I have another job for you. The talks had gone on longer than Yulia had expected and he'd had enough time to get rid of his swoop and find a spot in the corridor outside D1's forward hangar where he could wait. He'd been waiting now for nearly twenty minutes. More than enough time for his internal tension to start to fade away and then start ramping up again. Where in blazes were Presser and the others? He could call Presser and ask, of course. But comlink conversations among different dreadnoughts ran through a central switching node. If Kbeoth had taken over the comm system like he'd taken over everything else, that would show that Yulia wasn't on D4 like he was supposed to be and tip him off that something was up. And then, even as he tried to come up with another way to find Presser, he saw them coming down the corridor, Lorana Jinsler and a blue-skinned, glowing-eyed near-human who had to be Commander Mithra Nerodo. So he was an unknown alien, or at least one Yulia had never seen. More importantly, he didn't have the clothing or other trappings that would indicate he was some official from Coruscant. Yulia grimaced, a part of his hope dying within him. But only a part. Whether he was a genuine military commander or just some pirate with an assumed title, Mithra Nerodo seemed determined to keep them from passing through his territory. If Yulia could persuade him to order them back to the Republic or even if he and his gang were able to plunder enough of outbound flight supplies that Pak Mila was forced to go back for replacements they might still be able to get Palpatine to do something about Kbeath's growing stranglehold on. The Expedition at the very least, Yulia and the others would then have a chance to jump ship and find something else to do with their lives. Jinsler and Mithra Nerodo were coming toward him. And with the rest of the committee still absent, it was all up to him. Taking a deep breath, 
he opened his mouth to speak. Or rather, he tried to open it. To his horror, his mouth and tongue refused to work. He tried again and again, watching as Jinsler and Mithranarodo closed the gap, his throat and check straining with his effort. But nothing worked. And then they were there, right beside him. He tried to step in front of them, to at least keep them here until he could find a way to unfreeze his mouth. But his legs wouldn't work either. Silently, he watched them pass him by, oblivious to his urgency and agony and helplessness. So you think to betray me, Yulier? A quiet voice came in his ear. Yulier's neck still worked, but there was no need to turn around. He knew that voice only too well. Did you really think you could ride a swoop all the way from Dreadnought 4 without my people and Comops noticing and alerting me? Kbayath went on. So will treason always betray itself? With a jolt like that of a suddenly released clamp, Yulier felt his mouth being freed from Kbayath's restraint. It's not treason, he croaked. We just want our mission back. My mission, Yulier, Kbayath said darkly. My mission. Who else is in this pathetic little conspiracy? Yulier didn't answer. Well, let's go see, Kbayath said. Discreetly, of course, if you please. As if Yulier had a choice. With Kbayath's hand riding loosely on his shoulder, the two men headed down the corridor after Jinsler and the blue-skinned alien. They reached the hangar just as the others arrived at Mithranuroto's ship. A few meters away was one of outbound flight's shuttles. Yulier felt his breath catch in his throat as he suddenly realized why the rest of the committee hadn't appeared. Rather than bringing everyone in along the corridors and turbo lifts like an impromptu parade, Presser had instead loaded them aboard one of D-4's shuttles and had Mosh fly them across. Which meant there was still a chance. All Presser had to do was pop the hatch, and before Kbayoth realized what was happening they would be in front of Mithranarodo, ready to plead their cause. Surely even a Jedi Master couldn't strangle the words out of all of them at the same time. But the hatch didn't open. With his tongue frozen again, Yulia watched helplessly as Mithranarodo spoke briefly with Jinsler, then went inside his shuttle and closed the hatch. And with that, their last chance was gone. Kbayath's hand prodded at Yulia's back, nudging him forward. And now, the Jedi said with cold satisfaction, all that remains is for me to decide what to do with all of you. Jinsler turned around as they approached, her expression flickering with surprise at their presence. Jedi Jinsler, Kbayath greeted her. I have another job for you. He waved a hand casually at the silent shuttle the hatch abruptly flew open, spilling Presser and Mosh out. From the way they sprawled onto the deck, it was obvious they'd been shoving at the hatch with all their weight when Kbayath released his grip on it. So they were trying to open it, Yulier murmured. Of course they were, Kbayath said contemptuously. If a swoop couldn't escape my notice, how did you expect an entire shuttle to do so? He raised his voice. You all of you come out. I want to see your faces. What's going on? Jinsler asked, staring at the people as they began filing silently out onto the deck. This, Jedi Jinsler, is a conspiracy, Kbayath said, his voice as dark as Lorana had ever heard it. These people apparently don't appreciate all the work and effort we've put into making outbound flight as rewarding a place as possible to work and live. Maybe we just don't want your ideas of what's rewarding, Yulier said. Maybe we don't want to be treated like children who can't decide for ourselves what we're going to do with our lives. Do you have the force? Kbayath countered. Can you tap into that which binds the universe together? 
and thus automatically defines what is best for us all. I don't believe the Force wants to control every aspect of our lives. Yulia shot back. And I sure don't believe you're the chosen spokesman for that control. Kbeatha's face darkened. And who are you to dash? Master Kbeath, a voice called. Yulia turned. Standing at the entrance to the hangar, gazing at them with a face carved from stone, was Master Munning. A word with you, if you please, he said. Now. What are you doing here? Kbeath called back, and Lorana could sense both surprise and suspicion radiating from him. You should be at your duty station. A word with you, if you please, Manning repeated. Snorting under his breath, Kbeath strode across the deck toward him. Lorana hesitated a moment, then followed. This had better be important, Kbeath warned as he reached the other Jedi Master. We have work to do. It is, Manning assured him, his voice under careful control. I've spent a great deal of time over the past few days considering and meditating on the situation aboard outbound flight. And I've come to the conclusion that we've overstepped our proper place as guardians and advisors of these people. Walk warily, Master Manning, Kbeath warned, an edge of menace in his voice. You're speaking to the rightful and duly appointed leader of this expedition. That you are, Manning acknowledged. But even the most powerful and knowledgeable of Jedi may sometimes stumble. It's my opinion that in your zeal to guide, you've crossed the line into direct rule. Then your opinion is wrong, Kbeath countered flatly. I'm doing what is necessary and only what is necessary to keep this mission running smoothly. Others would disagree, Manning said, his eyes flicking over Kbeatha's shoulder to the crewers and their families gathered together beside their borrowed shuttle. At any rate, it's now a matter for all of our bound flights Jedi to decide. Kbeath seemed to draw back a little. Are you suggesting that a judgment circle be convened? In actual fact, Master Kbeath, I've already made the arrangements, Manning said. The circle will convene as soon as the situation with the Chiss has been resolved. For a long moment the two men gazed at each other, and Lorana could sense the tension arcing along the line between their eyes. Then it will convene, Kbeath said at last. And when it concludes, you'll understand that I do what is best for outbound flight and its people. He looked at Lorana. You'll all understand. He turned back to Manning. Until then, I am still in command, he went on. You'll return at once to Dreadnought 4 and prepare for combat. Manning's lip twitched. The negotiations with the Chiss have failed? There was nothing to negotiate, Kbeath said. Return to Dreadnought 4. Manning's eyes flicked to Lorana, as if wondering whether he should ask her opinion on that. But if he was, he left the question unvoiced. Very well, he said, looking back at Kbeath. Turning, he left the hangar. Kbeath took a deep breath, let it out in a long, controlled sigh. Did you know about this? He asked quietly. Lorana shook her head. No. A waste of time, Kbeath said contemptuously. Still, if it'll end this dangerous disunity, he can convene his little circle. Now, come. Turning, he led the way back to Yulier and the others. Wonder what they're talking about. Presser murmured at Yulier's side. No idea, Yulier said, studying the three Jedi closely. Even if they'd been closer, the hangar's lousy acoustics would probably have made their conversation impossible to hear. But neither distance nor acoustics could disguise their expressions. And to Yulier, 
it was abundantly clear that no one over there was very happy right now. Maybe they're finally having it out, he suggested. I doubt it, Presser said. Jedi stick together like Mawel the deck plates. Yeah, I've noticed, Yulia agreed sourly. Probably just a difference of opinion on how to sweat down this myth whatever. Probably. Presser cleared his throat. You know, Chaz, it occurs to me that we still have one card we could play, he said, lowering his voice even further. Back in the aft reactor storage area, we've got a couple of droidikas packed away for emergency intruder defense. If we pulled them out and turned CM loose, even the Jedi would have to sit up and take notice. Yulier snorted. Oh, they'd notice, all right. All the bodies lying around would be a dead giveaway. Those things are way too dangerous for amateurs to fool around with. Maybe, Presser said. But still dash. Break time's over. Yulia interrupted as the Jedi conversation broke apart. Manning turned and left the hangar, while Kbeath and Jinsler conversed a moment longer and then headed back toward the shuttle. In Yulia's estimation, both looked even less happy than they had before. They reached the silent group by the shuttle, and for a moment Kbeath sent his gaze around at all of them as if memorizing their faces. Jedi Jinsler, you'll escort these people back to Dreadnought 4, he said at last. No. On second thought, take them to the storage core and put them in the Jedi training center. Jinsler turned to him, her eyes widening in surprise. The training center? Don't worry, there's plenty of room, Kbeath said. I've ordered all the students to Dreadnought One's Com Ops Center, where they can observe the upcoming meld in safety. But they'll be locked in down there. Jinsler's gaze flicked past Yulia, lingering on the children as they clutched their parents' hands. Besides, we're on full battle alert, she added. They need to be at their stations. Where they can preach their sedition to others? Kbeath countered darkly. No. They'll be out of trouble down there until I've had time to decide on a more permanent solution. Jinsler seemed to brace herself. Master Kbeath Dash. You will obey my order, Jedi Jinsler, Kbeath said. His voice was quiet, but Yulia could hear the weight of will and age and history behind it. Between the Chiss and whatever game this sedious imposter is playing, Outbound flight has no time right now to deal with internal dissent. And as Yulia watched, Jinsler's brief flicker of defiance faded away. Yes, Master Kbeath, she murmured. With one final look at the people still lined up on the deck, Kbeath turned and strode away. If you please, Yulia, Jinsler said quietly, her eyes avoiding his. Yulia gazed across the hangar at Kbeath's receding back. Someday, he promised himself someday. You heard our beloved Jedi slave master, he growled. Everyone back in the shuttle. The pulsating hyperspace sky flowed past the Vagari warship, closer and more vivid and more terrifying than Kardas had ever seen it. With only a single layer of thin plastic between him and the waves, he couldn't shake the sensation that at any moment they might break through and snatch him away from even the precarious safety of his whole bubble, leaving him to die alone in the incomprehensible vastness of the universe. He tried closing his eyes, or turning around so that his face would be to the hull. But somehow that just made it worse. And it would be a six-hour journey back to the crust-eyed base. Six hours of uncertainty and mental agony along with the emotional strain of the hyperspace sky beating against his transparent coffin. More than once he wondered if he would make it with his sanity still intact. He never had the chance to find out. Less than two hours after leaving the Jurun homeworld, the hyperspace sky suddenly coalesced into starlines and collapsed back into stars. 
there was a click from somewhere beside him. Human! The mascara's voice snarled into his ear. Cardas jerked, banging his head on the cold plastic. What in the worlds? Human! The voice came again. And this time he realized it was coming from the diamond-shaped device he'd puzzled at earlier. The Vigari version of a comm link, apparently. Reaching awkwardly over his shoulder, he grabbed it. Yes, your eminence? What is this trap you have led us to? The Vigari demanded, his tone sending a shiver through Kardasa's body. I don't understand, Kardas protested. Did your people get the wrong coordinates from the transport's computer? We have been brought too soon into crawlspace. The Mizkara bit out. The stolen ship net has been used against us. Behind Kardas came the subtle clicking of locks as someone prepared to open his prison. But how could the Chiss have planned such a thing? He asked, fumbling to get the words out before the door could be opened. If he was brought before the Mizkara now, he was likely to die a quick and very uncomfortable death. They must have been using it on someone else, and we just happened to run into it. With all of space to choose from? The Mizkara shot back. Still, Kardas thought he could hear a slight dip in the other's anger level. Ridiculous. Stranger things have happened, Kardas insisted, feeling sweat breaking out on his forehead. Behind him, the hole cracked open. Kardas tensed, but the Vigari outside merely thrust a set of macro binoculars from the Chiss shuttle into his hands. Look forward, the Mascara's voice ordered. Tell me the story of this vessel. The door was slammed shut again behind him. Exhaling some of his tension, Kardas activated the macro binoculars and scanned the sky in front of him. The object of the Mascara's interest wasn't hard to locate. It was a set of six ships, big ones, arranged around a cylindrical core with tapered ends. It was outbound flight. He took a careful breath. I've never seen anything like it, he told the Mizkara. But it matches the description of a long-range exploration and colony project called Outbound Flight. There are 50,000 of my people aboard those ships, with enough supplies in the storage core to last all of them for several years. How many fighting machines will they have? I don't know, Kardas said. There'll be some, certainly. Mostly those bigger tripod-type droidikas to be used as colony boundary guards. Probably a few hundred of those. Most of their droids will be service and repair types, though. They probably have at least 20,000 of those types. And these mechanical slaves will have the same artificial brains and mechanisms as the fighting machines? Kardas grimaced. It was pretty clear where the Mizkara was going with this. Yes, they could probably all be adapted to combat of some sort. He agreed. But the people there aren't going to just hand them over to you. And those dreadnoughts pack a lot of firepower. Your concern is touching, the Mizkara said, his voice thick with sarcasm. But we are the Vigari. We take what we want. There was a click, and the comm link shut off. Yes, Kardas murmured. So I've heard. There, Mithranurodo said, pointing out the Springhawk's canopy. You see them, Commander? They're a little hard to miss. Doriana ground out, his throat tight as he gazed at the hundreds of alien ships that had suddenly appeared at the edge of Mithranurodo's gravity field trap. Who the blazes are they? A nomadic race of conquerors and destroyers called the Vigari. Mithra Nirodo told him. What are they doing here? Cap demanded, his voice shaking. How did they find us? I would imagine we have Kardas to thank for that, 
Mithra Naruto said calmly. As it happens, this system is on a direct line between the last known Vigari position and my crust-eyed base. Doriana stared at the other. You mean Cardas betrayed you? Cardas has his own concerns and priorities. Mithra Naruto lifted his eyebrows pointedly at Doriana. As do we all. There was no real answer to that, at least none that Doriana was interested in voicing. What are we going to do about them? He asked instead. Let us wait and see their intentions, Mithra Naruto said, turning back to gaze out the bridge canopy. Perhaps they will be cooperative. Doriana frowned. Cooperative how? Mithra Naruto smiled faintly. Patience, Commander. Let us wait and see. They arrived quite suddenly. Kbeatha's voice came from Lorana's calm link, calm but with an edge to it she'd seldom heard before. Some ploy of the Chiss, I imagine. What are they doing? Lorana asked, keeping her voice down as she gazed ahead of her at the line of men, women, and children walking alongside the stacks of storage crates toward the Jedi Training Center. There was no point in worrying these people any more than they already were. So far, just waiting, Kbeath told her. Captain Pak Milu informs me that their ship design is radically different from that of the Chiss, but of course that means nothing. Have you asked the commander about them? Lorana asked. Yulier, walking at the end of the line of prisoners, glanced over his shoulder and started to drift backward toward her. Maybe they have nothing to do with him. Kbeath snorted. With all of space for them to fly through? Please. What's going on? Yulier asked softly. Lorana hesitated. But all of our bound flight was in this together. An unidentified fleet has arrived, she told him. Over two hundred ships at least a hundred of which seemed to be warships. Who are you talking to? Kbeath asked. We're trying to figure out whether they're Chiss ships, Chiss allies, or someone else entirely. Lorana continued, ignoring the question. What are their reactor emissions like? Yulier asked. Is it a similar spectrum to myth whatever ships, or something different? Who is that? Kbeath demanded. Jedi Jinsler? Reactor Tech Yulia says we might be able to deduce their identity or affiliation from their reactor emission spectrum, Lorana said. And what precisely is Reactor Tech Yulia doing out of the imprisonment I ordered for him and his fellow conspirators? Kbeath asked acidly. We're on our way there. Lorana said, feeling her resolve eroding beneath the weight and pressure of his personality. I thought that since he's an expert in these things, Dash. We have experts up here, too, Kbeath cut in. Loyal experts. You concentrate on putting Yulia where he can't do any more harm and leave the alien fleet to Dash. He broke off as a melodious voice, or possibly two of them began to speak in the background. What's that? Lorana asked. They appear to be hailing us, Kbeath said. The alien voices grew louder as the Jedi Master moved closer to one of the bridge speakers. Lorana listened closely. It was a strange language, highly musical, with a distinct sing-song component to it. Yulier? She whispered. He shook his head, his forehead creased in concentration. Never heard anything like it before, he whispered back. But it doesn't sound like the kind of language near humans like the Chiss would come up with. Lorana nodded agreement. Master Kbeath? She called. It doesn't sound like Dash. Get the conspirators to their holding area, Jedi Jinsler. Bayoth interrupted. Then go to Dreadnought 4 and report to Jedi Master Monning in the weapons blisters.
There was a click as he shut off his comlink. Lorana sighed. Yes, Master Kbeath, she murmured as she returned her comlink to her belt. We're in trouble, aren't we? Yulia asked quietly. We'll be all right, Lorana assured him, trying to convey a confidence she didn't feel. First Mithran Urodo, and now this new threat. And with outbound flight's defense resting squarely on the shoulders of their handful of Jedi. And suddenly she was getting a very bad feeling about all of it. I need to get up to D4 to assist Master Manning, she told Yulia. Get your people inside, and when these other matters are settled we'll get your problem straightened out. Yulia snorted. It's not our problem. Lorana grimaced. I know, she conceded. Don't worry. We will straighten it out. They're probably not answering because they don't understand you. Cardos explained as patiently as his pounding heart would allow. As I said, they're from the same region of space I am, and we don't know the language of the mighty and noble Vagari. You will soon learn it, the Mizgara promised him coldly. In the meantime, you will serve as translator. Cardas grimaced. That was all he needed, the people on outbound flight assuming he was a renegade or, worse, a traitor. Whatever necessary. Of course, your eminence he said. I stand humbly ready to serve the Mizkara and the Vigari people in any way you wish. Of course, the Mizkara said, as if even a breath of hesitation on Kardas's part would be unthinkable. Tell me first, how deeply within the vessels will the fighting machines be stored? Will they be at the surfaces, or deeper inside? Deep inside, Kardas told him not knowing whether it was true but not about to take the time to try to actually think about it. Good, the Mizkara said with satisfaction. Then we may destroy as we will without risking our prize. An unpleasant sensation tingled across Kardas's skin. With a hundred Vigari warships blotting out the star's cape around him, the Mizkara's words were as close to a death sentence as anything he'd ever heard and he was the one who'd pointed the Vigari in that direction. Now speak this, the Mizkara continued. You of the vessel known as Outbound Flight, we are the Vigari. You will surrender or be destroyed. 22. Or be destroyed. Lorana looked across the weapon's blister at Manning, at the tight set to his mouth. The first voice from the unknown ships had definitely not been human. This one just as definitely was. And the human had been speaking basic, as well. This wasn't good. A captive from the Republic? She suggested. Or a traitor, Manning said grimly. Either way, it's going to make this that much trickier. Not at all. Kbeatha's voice came from the calm speaker. There's nothing even a traitor could have told them that will have prepared them for the kind of coordinated defense a Jedi meld can offer. With a hundred or more warships at their disposal I can't see them worrying overly much about how tight our defense is, Manning countered. Patience, Master Manning, Kbeath said, his voice glacially calm. Trust in the Force. They're moving forward, Captain Pack Miller's voice cut in. All weapons stations stand ready. Lorana took a deep breath as she stretched out to the force for strength and calm. This was it, the first genuine test of the Jedi control system Kbeath had spent so much of his time teaching the rest of them. What in the name Dash? Abruptly, Manning hunched closer to his sensor displays. Master Kbeath? I see them, Kbeath said. So this is the sort of enemy we face. What is it? Lorana asked, swiveling her chair to her own displays. Look at the warships, 
Manning said. See all those plastic bubbles on the hulls? Lorana felt her chest tighten. There are people in there. Living shields, Kbeath confirmed, his voice thick with contempt. The most evil and cowardly defense concept ever created. What do we do? Lorana asked, a sudden trembling in her voice. We can't just slaughter them. Courage, Jedi Jinsler, Kbeath said. We'll simply shoot between the hostages. Impossible, Manning insisted. Not even with Jedi gunners. Turbo lasers simply aren't accurate enough. Do you assume me to be a fool, Master Manning? Kbeath demanded scathingly. Of course we won't fire until we're close enough for the necessary accuracy. And meanwhile we just sit here and take their fire? Mon encountered. Hardly, Kbeath said, an edge of malicious anticipation creeping into his voice. The Vigari have a surprise in store for them. All Jedi, prepare to melt. Stretch out to the Force. And then, to the Vigari. They make no answer, the Mizkara said accusingly, as if outbound flight silence was Cardassa's fault. Perhaps they're still consulting among themselves, your eminence. Cardas suggested, shifting his eyes back and forth across the sky. The Vigari ships had started to close the gap between themselves and outbound flight, moving together into groups of tight formation clusters that would provide them the protection of overlapping forward shields. They were preparing to attack. And still nothing from outbound flight. Or from Thrawn, for that matter. His ships had to be around here somewhere. But where? You will give them a new message, the Mizkara ordered. The time for discussion is ended. You will surrender now or dash. And in the middle of the sentence, his voice abruptly dissolved into a confused burbling. Cardas frowned, pressing the comm link to his ear. The whole bridge seemed to have collapsed into the same helpless babbling, as if the entire crew had had a mass mental attack. Which was, he suspected, exactly what had happened. He looked out again at outbound flight, an unpleasant shiver running through him. He'd heard the stories about all the ways Jedi could use their mind control tricks to confuse attackers, everything from creating false noises in their ears to making them unable to properly focus on controls or weapon systems. But while the stories also claimed that a group of them together could use that power on this massive a scale, he never heard of something like that actually happening. Until now. And with that, he knew it was all over. The final card had come up double down nine, and the rest was as fixed and inevitable as a planetary orbit. With the comm link still pressed to his ear, he settled down to wait for the end. So your tales were correct, Mithra Nurodo murmured. Your Jedi have reached across the distance to the Vigari and numbed or destroyed their minds. So it would seem, Doriana agreed, feeling a little numb himself. Even if it was just the Vigari commanders and gunners who'd been affected, and even given the fact that the aliens would have had no forewarning of what was coming, it was still a terrifying feat. And it was being performed by a relative handful of Jedi Masters and Jedi Knights. Predictably, it was Cav who broke the odd silence first. And our part is to sit by and do nothing? He prompted. Our part is to do that for which we have come, Mithra Nerodo said. Reaching to his board, he keyed a switch. It is time for the Vigari to die. The Vigari? Kev echoed. No. You were given my starfighters for use against outbound flight. I was not given the starfighters at all, Mithra Nerodo corrected him coolly. Ahead, the droid starfighters were rising in waves now from their asteroid staging area, heading at full speed toward the clusters of Vigari warships. 
I will choose how to use them. Kev snarled something in his own language. You will not get away with this, he bit out. Walk cautiously, Vice Lord, Mithran Uroda warned, his glowing eyes flashing at the Nymoidian. Don't forget that the Starfighters aren't the only Nymoidian technology I've taken from you. Doriana felt a sudden tingling on the back of his neck. He spun around, expecting to find the two droidikas Mithran Urodo had taken from the Darlavim standing behind them in full combat stance. But there was nothing there. No, Commander, the combat droids are not here, Mithran Urodo assured him. They're where they can be of far more useful service. And where is that? Doriana asked. Where else? Mithran Urodo said, smiling tightly. On the bridge of the Vigari flagship. The sudden multiple stutter of blaster fire in his ears sent Kardas twitching to the side, and he banged his elbow against the edge of the bubble as he hastily moved the comm link farther away. His head was still ringing as the rhythmic fire of the droidikas was joined by the more deliberate shots from the four battle droids' rifles. Apparently, Thrawn had had a secondary control pattern laid in beneath the program Kardas had set up earlier for the Mizkara. The sounds of shooting shifted subtly as the six droids began to move across the bridge, mowing down the helpless gunners and commanders. And as they systematically chopped off the head of the Vigari leadership hierarchy, the droid starfighters arrived. The first and second waves flashed overhead without slowing, skimming the hull barely five meters from Cardassa's face as they drove toward the clusters of Vigari ships in the distance. The third wave arrived in full combat mode, their laser cannons raking the flagship with a brilliant sheet of fire. Cardas flinched back. But almost before he had time to be frightened they, too, were passed, leaving torn pieces of shattered hull material and white jets of escaping air in their wake. Blinking against the multiple purple afterimages, he peered through the dissipating gases at the other bubbles around him, half afraid of what he would see. But the starfighters had pulled it off. In every single one of the bubbles within his view, the Jerun hostages were still alive terrified. Certainly, some of them clawing mindlessly at the plastic as if trying to tunnel their way out. But they were alive. With outbound flights Jedi preventing the Vigari gunners from defending their ships. And with the sharp edge precision the droids' electronic targeting systems and close approach attack had permitted, the starfighters had sliced their way neatly through the warship's hull between the Vigari's living shields. And not just aboard the flagship. All around him, Kardas could see clouds of debris and escaping air enveloping the other nearby Vigari warships, the haze scintillating with the fiery glow of the starfighters. Drives as they finished each set of targets and moved on to the next. Already in this first attack, he estimated Thrawn's assault had taken out over a quarter of the alien warships. And still with no response from the remainder. The question now, he knew, was whether the Jedi control of the aliens would last long enough for the starfighters to finish the job. Switching on his macro binoculars, listening with half an ear to the one-sided carnage still going on beneath him on the bridge, he focused on outbound flight. It was like nothing Lorana had ever felt before. Like nothing she had ever dreamed she would ever feel, or need to prepare herself for. Even as she submerged herself in the Jedi meld, allowing Kbeath to guide her and the others as they spread confusion across the Vigari commanders and gunners, the alien mind she was wrapped around suddenly began exploding into death. Not just a few deaths, either, small ripples of sensation that might have throbbed painfully but controllably against her consciousness. These deaths came in a thunderstorm torrent wave after wave of fear and agony and rage that hammered against her already overstretched and vulnerable mind. She could feel herself staggering, her hands clutching blindly for something to hold on to as her body reacted to her disorientation. There was a sharp pain in her shoulder and head. Distantly, she realized she had fallen out of her chair onto the deck. 
She could feel herself twitching uncontrollably, could sense the other's reactions flowing through the meld, feeding into her weakness even as her own pain fed into theirs. A thousand alien voices shrieked through her brain as their life forces were snuffed out, with a thousand more waiting behind them. Beside Doriana, Mithranurodo took a deep breath. Ch Tra, he ordered. And moving as a single unit, the Chiss fleet surged forward. Time to join the party? Doriana asked, still watching in grim amazement as the waves of droid starfighters methodically cut their way across the Vigari ships. No, Mithra Naruto said. Time to start one of our own. And it was only then that Doriana saw that the Springhawk and the rest of the Chiz ships were heading for outbound flight. He closed his hands into fists, waiting tensely for the Dreadnought's gunners to spot this new threat and open fire. But nothing happened. The Springhawk flew completely through the Turbolacer's effective combat range, passed unchallenged through the point defense zone, and with only minor turbulence passed through the shields near the bow of the nearest dreadnought. The other Chiss ships broke from the Springhawk's flanks, spreading out toward the other dreadnoughts, as the Springhawk curved from its intercept vector to fly low across its chosen dreadnought's hull and opened fire. They hit the weapon's blisters first, the brilliant blue fire of the Chiss lasers tearing through armor and capacitors and charging equipment, and digging deeply into the blisters themselves. The shield generators were next, the Springhawk zigzagging along the Dreadnought's hull as it targeted and destroyed each in turn. All done with the utmost efficiency, a small detached part of Doriana's mind noted, without a single wasted movement. Clearly, Mithra Nurodo had made good use of the technical readouts he'd provided. And then, to his surprise, the Springhawk made a sharp turn away from the hull and headed again for deep space. Beyond the expanding cloud of destruction, he could see the other Chiss ships doing the same. What's wrong? He asked, his eyes flicking across the sky for some new danger that might have caused Mithra Nurodo to break off his attack. Nothing is wrong, Mithra Nerodo said, sounding puzzled. Why? But you have ceased the attack, Kev said, clearly as bewildered as Doriana. Yet they lie helpless before you. Which is precisely why I've stopped, Mithra Nerodo said. Jedi Master Kbeath, leaders of outbound flight. Your vessel has been disarmed, its ability to defend itself destroyed. I offer you this one final chance to surrender and return to the Republic. What? Kev yelped, his eyes widening. But you were to destroy them. If and when you should command again, Vice Lord Kav, such decisions will be yours, Mithra Nerodo said coolly. But not now. Outbound flight, I await your decision. Through the echoing haze of dying minds still screaming at her, through the smoke and debris and distant moans of the injured, Lorana realized she was dying. Probably from suffocation, she decided as she noticed that her lungs were straining but that little or no air was reaching them. She tried to move, but her legs seemed pinned somehow to the deck. She tried to stretch out to the force but with the death agonies of the Vigari now joined by the much closer deaths of her own shipmates, she couldn't seem to bring her thoughts into focus. Something cold and metallic closed around her wrist. She opened her eyes to find a maintenance droid tugging at her arm. What are you doing? She croaked. It was a matter of mild surprise to discover that she had enough air even to speak. Experimentally, she tried to take a deep breath and felt a welcome coolness as air flowed into her lungs. She blinked away some of the fog hazing her eyes and peered through the swirling debris. There was a long, jagged slash through the ceiling above her, undoubtedly the source of the weapon's blister's sudden decompression. Stretched across the gash were a dozen sheets of twisted metal that appeared to have been blown or pulled away from the walls. 
Half a dozen small metalwork droids were climbing across them, filling the room with clouds of sparks as they hastily welded the sheets into place over the gash. Lying on the deck halfway across the room, his arms stretching toward the ceiling as he used the force to hold the still unwelded sheets in place, was Monning. Lorana couldn't see very much of his body with the wreckage of the control room scattered across her line of sight. But she could see enough to turn her stomach. He must have caught the full brunt of one of the laser blasts, taking both the agony of the shot itself as well as the impact of the shards of shattered metal it had created. Master Manning. She gasped, trying to get up. But her legs still refused to work. No, don't, Manning said. His voice was strained but still carried the full authority of a Jedi Master. It's too late for me. For Dash, Lorana broke off, a sudden edge of horror cutting through her. With the attack and her own near suffocation, she'd completely lost her connection to the Jedi meld that had so successfully blocked the Vigari attack. Now, as she tried to stretch out to it again, she found that it had all but vanished. No, she whispered to herself, but there was no mistake. When their attackers had targeted the weapon's blisters, they had knowingly or unknowingly targeted the Jedi as well. And with only one or two dazed and stunned exceptions, they were dead. All of them. I should have. Tried stop. Him sooner. Manning murmured, his voice weakening as he rapidly lost strength. But he was. Jedi Master. Jedi Master. With an effort, Lorana pushed back the paralyzing horror. Don't talk, she said, trying again to move. Let me help you. No, Manning said. Too late. For me. But not. For others. One of his outstretched hands twitched toward her and a bent section of girder pinning her legs to the deck lifted a few millimeters and clattered away. You can. Help them. But I can't just leave you, Lorana protested. Again she tried to get up, and this time she succeeded. I am far. Beyond your help, Manning said, a deep sadness in his voice. Go. Help those. Who can still be helped? But Dash. No. Manning bit out, his face convulsing with a sudden spasm. Your Jedi. Taken. Both. Serve others. Go. Go. Lorana swallowed. Yes, Master. I dash. She trailed off, searching for the right words. But there weren't any. Perhaps Manning couldn't find any either. Goodbye. Jedi Jinsler. He simply said, a ghostly smile touching his lips. Goodbye, Master Manning. Manning's smile vanished, and he lifted his eyes again to the repair droids and their work. Turning away, Lorana picked her way through the wreckage toward the door. She knew she would never see him again. The door, when she reached it, was jammed shut. Stretching out as best she could to the force, she managed to work it open far enough to slip through. The corridor outside was nearly as bad as the blister itself, with buckled walls and chunks of ceiling littering the deck. But here at least the attackers hadn't managed to cut completely through the hull and open it to space. The blast doors ten meters down the corridor in either direction had closed when the blister had decompressed, sealing away this section from the rest of the ship. But with the breach now scaled and the emergency oxygen supplies repressurizing the area, the forward blast door opened for Lorana without protest. In the distance she could hear shouting and screams, and could sense the fear and panic behind them. But for the moment, 
those people weren't her immediate concern. The dreadnoughts were well equipped with escape pods, where the survivors could take refuge while the droids repaired the hull. But there was one group of people who wouldn't have that chance. The 57 so-called conspirators Kbeoth had ordered locked away in the storage core. The people she had locked away in the storage core. Her legs were starting to throb now where the girder had landed on her. Stretching out to the force to suppress the pain, she headed in a limping run toward the nearest pylon turbo lift. We made a bargain! Cav snarled. You were to destroy outbound flight for us. I never made any such bargain, Mithronorodo said. I agreed only to do what I deemed necessary to eliminate the threat posed by the expedition. That was not what we wanted, Cav insisted. You were in no position to make demands, Mithronorodo reminded him. Nor are you now. There was a sudden hiss from the calm. So, an almost unrecognizable voice ground out. You think you have one alien? The display came alive. And a cold shiver ran up Doriaria's back. It was Joris Kbeoth, pale and disheveled, his clothing torn and blood spattered, one side of his face badly burned. But his eyes blazed with the same arrogant fire that Doriana had seen that day long ago in Supreme Chancellor Palpatine's office. He groped from Mithra Nerodo's sleeve. Cav is right you have to destroy them, he hissed urgently. If you don't we're dead. Mithra Nerodo's eyes flicked to him, then back to the calm. I have indeed won, he told Kbeath. I have only to give a single order dash. His hand shifted slightly on his control board, his fingertips coming to rest on a covered switch edged in red. And you and all your people will die. Is your pride worth so much to you? A Jedi does not yield to pride, Kbeoth spat. Nor does he yield to empty threats. He follows only the dictates of his own destiny. Then choose your destiny, Mithra Naruto said. I'm told the role of the Jedi is to serve and defend. You were told wrongly, Kbeath countered. The role of the Jedi is to lead and guide, and to destroy all threats. The unburned corner of his lip twisted upward in a bitter smile. And without warning, Thrawn's head jerked back, his whole body pressing back against his seat. His hand darted to his throat, clutching uselessly at it. Commander! Doriana snapped, grabbing reflexively from Mithra Nerodo's collar. But it was no use. The invisible power that was choking the life out of him wasn't something physical that Doriana might be able to push aside. Kbeoth was using the force. And there was nothing Doriana or anyone else could do to stop him. In a handful of minutes, Mithra Nuroda would be dead. Lorana was in a turbolift car heading down the forward pylon when she felt Kbeath's attack echoing through her mind like the sound of a distant hammer. For a minute she puzzled at it, sensing his anger and frustration and pride, wondering what in the worlds he was doing. And then, abruptly, the horrifying truth sliced through her like the blade of a lightsaber. No! She shouted reflexively toward the turbolift car ceiling. Master Kbeath, no! But it was too late. In his single-minded thirst for revenge, Joris Kbeath, Jedi Master, had gone over to the dark side. A wave of pain and revulsion swept over Lorena, as agonizing as salt in an open wound. She had never seen a Jedi fall before. She'd known it could happen, and that it had in fact happened many times throughout history. But it had always seemed something comfortably distant, something that could never happen to anyone she knew. Now it had. And following close behind the wave of pain came an even more powerful wave of guilt. Because she'd been his Padawan, the person who'd spent the most time with him. 
the one person Master Manning had once suggested, whom he might have actually listened to. Could she have prevented this? Should she have stood up to him earlier, with or without the support of Manning or the others, when he first began to gather power and authority to himself? Certainly she tried talking to him in private on more than one occasion. But each time he'd brushed off her concerns, assuring her that all was well. Should she have pressed him more strongly? Forced him somehow to listen? But she hadn't. And now it was too late. Or was it? We don't have to kill anyone, she murmured, focusing her mind toward D1, trying desperately to send the thought, or at least the sense to him. She fumbled for her comlink, only to discover that she'd lost it in the attack on the weapon's blister. We don't have to kill them, she continued, pleading with him. We can just go home. All they want is for us to go home. But there was no reply. Kbeath could undoubtedly sense her protest, but all she could sense in return was his indifference to her anguish and his determination to continue along the path he'd now set himself upon. It was indeed too late. Perhaps, a small voice whispered inside her, it had always been too late. The turbolift came to a halt, and the door opened into the storage core. For a long minute she stood in the doorway, wondering if she should leave the prisoners where they were for now and try to get to D1. But she would never make it in time. And even if she did, it would do her no good. She could sense the rigid set of Kbeath's mind, and she knew from long experience that even if she was standing at his side there was nothing she could say or do now to stop him. He would continue his attack until he had killed Commander Mithranirodo, then more, until he had killed all the rest of the Chiss out there. Her heart aching, she stepped out into the storage core and limped toward the trapped crew members and their families. Even a Jedi, she thought bitterly, could do only so much. But what she could do, she would. The bridge crew was on it in a matter of seconds, shoving Doriana roughly aside and clustering around Mithra Naroto as they fought to free him from the unseen attack that was killing him. But their efforts were as useless as Doriana's had been. Standing at the edge of the frantic activity, Doriana looked at the calm display and tried desperately to think. If the Chiss attack had weakened Kbeath enough. But there was no sign of weakness in the eyes blazing from that ruined face. Could Doriana shut off the display, then, and at least rob the Jedi of his view of his victim? But Doriana had no idea where that control was and he didn't speak any language the rest of the bridge crew understood. Besides, he wasn't sure that cutting off the display would do any good anyway. And then, his gaze dropped from Kbeath's face to Thrawn's control board. The board, and the red rim switch. It might be nothing. But it was all he had. Pushing past the crewers who stood in his way, he flipped back the cover and pressed the switch. And then, even as they continued to pound mercilessly against the Vagari warships, the droid starfighters abruptly turned from their attack and fled. Cardas frowned, pressing the macro binoculars tighter against his face. A sizable percentage of the Vagari fleet was still untouched, the surviving ships scrambling madly for the edge of Thrawn's gravity projector field. Yet all of the starfighters were leaving. Had they drained their solid fuel engines already? He caught his breath. No, the starfighters weren't running away from the Vigari. They were running toward outbound flight. He was still staring in disbelief when the first wave hit. Not simply attacking, blasting away with laser cannons and energy torpedoes. They literally hit the dreadnoughts slamming at full speed into their hulls and vaporizing in brilliant flashes with the force of their impacts. The second wave did the same, this group striking different sections of the dreadnought's hulls. Through the smoke and debris came the third and fourth waves, 
these groups pouring laser cannon fire and energy torpedoes into the damaged weapons blisters and shield generators. And with a sudden chill, Cardas understood. The first two waves of starfighters hadn't been trying to breach the dreadnought's thick armor plating. Their goal had merely been to create dents in the hulls at very specific points. The points where the interior blast doors were positioned. And now, with those doors disabled or warped enough to prevent a proper air seal, the rest of the starfighters were opening the dreadnoughts to space. More clouds of debris were blowing away from outbound flight's flanks as the starfighters blasted their way through the hulls, sweeping new waves of sudden death through the outer areas of the dreadnoughts. But for all the effect the attack had on him, Kbeoth might not even have noticed it. His face remained as hard as Andalstone, his eyes burning unblinkingly across the Springhawks bridge. And Mithran Erodo was still dying. Doriana curled his hands into helpless fists. So it was finally over. If this second assault had failed to kill Kbeoth, it was because he'd hidden himself well away from the vacuum that had now snuffed out all life in the dreadnought's outer sections. Even given the thinner bulkheads and blast doors of the ship's interior sections, there was no way even droid starfighters could clear out the maze of decks and compartments in time. An odd formation caught his eve as it shot into view outside the canopy. A pair of starfighters flying in close formation with a fat cylinder tucked between them. Not just one pair, Doriana saw now, but ten of them, heading at full speed toward outbound flight. He remembered Kev mentioning this particular project of Mithra Nerodos, and the Vice Lord's contemptuous dismissal of the cylinders as some sort of useless fuel tanks. Frowning, he watched as, in ones and twos, the starfighter pairs drove through the newly blasted holes in the dreadnought's hulls and disappeared inside. For a moment, nothing happened. Then, abruptly, a haze of pale blue burst outward from the openings, nearly invisible amid the floating clouds of wreckage. And with a sudden gasp of air, Mithran Uroto collapsed forward against his board. Commander? Doriana called, trying to get past the circle of crewers. I'm... All right. The other panted, rubbing his throat with one hand as he waved off assistance with the other. I think you got him, Doriana said, looking over at the calm display. Kbeath was no longer in sight. I think Kbeath is dead. Yes, Mithra Nuroto confirmed, his voice quiet. All of them are dead. A strange sensation crept up Doriana's back. That's impossible, he said. You only had one or two of those bombs in each dreadnought. One was all that was necessary, Mithra Nuroto said with a sadness that Doriana had never heard in him before. They're a very special sort of weapon. A very terrible sort. Once inside the protective barrier of a war vessel's outer armor, they explode into a killing wave of radiation. The wave passes through floors and walls and ceilings, destroying all life. Doriana swallowed. And you had them all ready to go, he heard himself say. Mithra Nuroto's eyes bored into his. They were not meant for outbound flight, he said and there was an expression on his face that made Doriana take an involuntary step backward. They were intended for use against the largest of the Vigari war vessels. Doriana grimaced. I see. No, you do not see, Mithra Nerodo retorted. Because now, instead, we'll need to destroy the Vigari remnant aboard the disabled vessels in shipboard face-to-face -face combat he pointed out the canopy. Worse, some of the war vessels and civilian craft have now escaped to deep space, where they'll have time to rebuild and perhaps one day will again pose a threat to this region of space. I understand, Doriana said. I'm sorry. To his surprise, he realized he meant it. For a long moment Mithra Nerodo gazed at him in silence. 
Then, slowly, some of the tension lines faded from his face. No warrior ever has the full depth of control that he would like, he said, his voice calmer but still troubled. But I wish here that it might have been otherwise. Doriana looked at Cav. For a wonder, the Nymoidian had the sense to keep his mouth shut. What happens now? As I said, we board the Vigari war vessels, Mithron Urodo said. Once they've been secured, we'll free the Jeruns from their prisons. Doriana nodded. And so that was it. Outbound flight was destroyed, its Jedi especially Kbeath all dead. It was over. All that is, except one small loose end. No matter what the outcome, Kaz's warning echoed through his mind, in the end this Mithrado will have to die. And in the swirling chaos of a shipboard assault, accidents inevitably happened. I wonder if I might have permission to accompany the attack force, he said. I'd like to observe Chiss soldiers in action. Mithran Urodo inclined his head slightly. As you wish, Commander Stratus. I think you'll find it most instructive. Yes, Doriana agreed softly. I'm sure I will. The vibrations from the dreadnoughts above, transmitted faintly through the metal of the connecting pylons, finally came to an end. Is it over? Jorid Presser asked timidly. Carefully, Lorana let her hand drop from the bulkhead where she'd been steadying herself. The sudden, awful flood of death from above had finally ended as well, leaving nothing behind. Nothing. Yes, she said, trying hard to give the boy an encouraging smile. It's all over. So we can go back up. Lorana lifted her eaves to Jorid's father and the tight set of his mouth. The children might not understand, but the adults did. Not quite yet, she told Jorid. There's probably a lot of cleaning up they're having to do. We'd just be in the way. And would have to hold our breath, someone muttered from the back of the group. Someone else made a shushing noise. Anyway, there's no point in hanging around here, one of the older men spoke up trying to sound casual. Might as well go back to the Jedi school where we can at least be a little more comfortable. And where we'll be properly locked in. Yulier added sourly. No, of course not, Lorana said, trying to get her brain back on track. There's plenty of spare building material crated up in the storage areas. I'll cut a section of girder and prop open the door. Come on everyone back. The crowd turned and shuffled back the way they'd come, some of the children still murmuring anxiously to their parents, the parents in turn trying to comfort them. Lorana started to follow, paused as Yulier touched her arm. So what's the real damage? He asked softly. She sighed. I don't sense any life up there. None at all. Could you be wrong? It's possible she admitted. But I don't think so. He was silent for a moment. We'll need to make sure, he said. There may be survivors who are just too weak for you to sense. I know, she said. But we can't get up there yet. The fact that the turbolift cars won't come implies the pylons are open to vacuum somewhere. We'll have to wait until the droids get them patched up. Yulier hissed between his teeth. That could take hours. It can't be helped, Lorana said. We'll just have to wait. 23. The battle had been over for nearly three hours, and Cardos was starting to get seriously bored when he finally heard the rhythmic tapping at his back. He half turned over and wrapped the same pattern with the edge of the macro binoculars. Then, turning back around to face the stars, he worked the kinks out of his muscles and waited. It came in a sudden flurry of activity. Behind him, 
The door to his prison popped open and he felt the sudden tugging of vacuum at his lungs and face as the air pressure in his bubble exploded outward, shoving him backward out into the corridor. He caught a glimpse of vac-suited figures surrounding him as he was enveloped in a tangle of sticky cloth. Before he could do more than scrabble his fingertips against it in an effort to push it away from his face there was a harsh hissing in his ears, and the cloth receded from him in all directions. And a moment later he found himself floating inside a transparent rescue ball. Whoa, he muttered, wincing as his ears popped painfully with the returning air pressure. Are you all right? A familiar voice asked from a comm link connected to the ball's oxygen tank. Yes, Commander, thank you, he assured the other. I gather it all worked as planned? Yes, Thrawn confirmed, his voice carrying an odd tinge of sadness to it. For the most part. One of the other rescuers leaned close, and to his surprise Cardas saw that it was the human who'd introduced himself aboard the Dark Venge as Commander Stratus. Cardas? Stratus demanded, frowning through the plastic. What are you doing here? Luring the Vigari into my trap, of course, Thrawn said, as if it were obvious. Or had you forgotten that the Chiss do not engage in preemptive attacks? I see, Stratus said, still eyeing Cardas. So those spy accusations you were throwing around aboard the Darkvenge were nothing but smoke? Something to cover you in case the whole thing fell apart? It was protection, yes, but not for me, Thrawn said. He gestured, and the rest of the group began maneuvering Cardassa's rescue ball down the corridor. It was to protect Admiral Aralani, the officer commanding the transport that arrived an hour ago to take the free Jerun slaves back to their world. And who couldn't afford to be even unofficially involved in any of this? Stratus said, nodding. But who could make sure to look the other way at all the right times, leaving you and Cardas to take the blame if anything went wrong? Never mind the blame, Cardas put in. What happened with outbound flight? I saw the starfighters take off after it. Thrawn and Stratus exchanged looks. We were forced to go farther than I'd hoped, Thrawn said. Cardas felt his heart freeze in his chest. How much farther? They're dead, Thrawn said quietly. All of them. There was a long silence. Cardas looked away, his eyes catching glimpses of dead Vigari as the Chiss continued carrying him along. Thrawn had abandoned his attack on known slavers and murderers to destroy thousands of innocent people. There wasn't any choice. Stratus said into his numbness. Kbeoth was using his Jedi power to try and strangle the commander. There was no other way to stop him. Did you ever give them a chance to just leave and go home? Cardas retorted. Yes, Thrawn said. More than just one chance, Stratus added. More than I would have offered them, in fact. And if it matters any, I was the one who actually pushed the button. Cardas grimaced. On one level, it did matter. On another, it didn't. You're sure there aren't any survivors? The dreadnoughts were taken out by radiation bombs, Stratus told him. We haven't actually sent anyone over yet to check, but if the commander's weapon stats are accurate, there's no way anyone could have lived through that. So you got what you wanted after all, Cardas said, feeling suddenly very tired. You must be happy. Stratus looked away. I'm content, he said. I wouldn't say I'm happy. Well? Kev demanded as Doriana stripped off his vac suit in the privacy of one of the Springhawks prep rooms. I hear no wailings of despair for the fallen captain. That's because the captain isn't fallen, Doriana said. I never had an opportunity. Did not have one? Kev asked. 
or did not make one? I never had one, Doriana repeated coldly. He was not in the mood for this. You want to try to assassinate a military commander in front of his men, you go right ahead. He finished undressing in silence. Yet he must die, Kev said as Doriana began pulling on his own clothing. He knows too much about our part in what has happened. Mithranuroto is no ordinary alien, Doriana pointed out. And there's still a matter of finding an opportunity. Or of making one. Stepping close, Kev pressed something into Doriana's hand. Here. Puzzled, Doriana looked down. One glance was all it took. Where did you get this? He hissed as he hurriedly closed his hand around the small holdout blaster. I have always had it, Cav said. The shot is small and hard to see, but highly intense. It will kill quickly and quietly. And would condemn Doriana in double quick time if he was caught with it. Feeling a sudden sheen of sweat breaking out beneath his collar, he slipped the weapon out of sight into a pocket. Just let me handle the timing, he warned the other. I don't want you hovering around like an expectant mother avian. Do not worry, Cav growled. Where is the commander now? Gone to the transport ship to talk to the admiral, Doriana said, finishing with his tunic and starting to pull on his boots. Cardas went with him. And that was another problem he reminded himself soberly. Like Mithra Nerodo, Cardas knew far too much about what had happened out here. And unlike the Chis, he definitely would soon be traveling back to the Republic. After he dealt with Mithra Nerodo, Doriana would have to make equally sure that Cardas never told his story to the wrong people. The rescued Jeruns had been herded into the cargo bay the only place aboard the transport big enough to hold them all. Most were sitting cross-legged in small groups, talking quietly among themselves, the most recent arrivals still working on the food sticks and hot drinks Admiral Aralani's warriors had provided them. All of them looked a little dazed, as if having trouble believing they were actually free of the Vigari. Standing to the side just inside one of the bay doors, Trying to stay out of the way of both the Jeruns and the Chis crewers moving about them, Cardas looked out at the multitude, his heart and mind fatigued beyond anything he'd ever experienced. A thousand times in the past day he'd wondered what he was doing in the middle of this whole thing, wondered how in the galaxy Thrawn had managed to talk him into playing bait for the Vigari. But it had worked. It had all worked. The Jeruns had been freed, not only these particular slaves, but probably their entire world as well. Admiral Aralani had already said that when the transport returned the slaves to their home, she would bring along a task force of Chiss warships for protection. Any Vigari still hanging around the system wouldn't be lunging around there for long. And as for outbound flight, he closed his eaves. 50,000 people dead, the entire populace of the six dreadnoughts. Had that really been necessary? Stratus had said it had, and Thrawn hadn't contradicted him. But had that really been the only way? Cardas would probably never know for sure. Distantly, he wondered what Males was going to say when she found out what her noble hero had done. Even now, they don't seem to believe it. A voice murmured from his left. Cardas opened his eyes. Thras was standing beside him, a strange expression on his face as he gazed across the crowded bay. Syndic Thras? Cardas greeted him. I didn't realize you were aboard. Admiral Aralani suggested I come, Thras said, his eyes still on the Jurans. She seemed to think she and I and my brother could now resolve the question of the Vigari goods being held at Krusty and allow you and your companions to go on your way. He turned his eyes onto Cardas. 
Now that you and I have apparently served our purposes. Cardas held his gaze without flinching. I have no problems with having been a part of your brother's plan, he said evenly. Neither should you. I was manipulated and controlled, Thras said, his eyes flashing with resentment. For your own protection, Cardas countered. If Thrawn and Aarlani had brought you into the plan, your future would have been just as much on the line as theirs were. And as they are now, Thras pointed out darkly, the nine ruling families will not stand for such an illegal and immoral attack. Number one, Cardas said, lifting a finger. This system is within the patrol region of the Chiss expansionary fleet. That makes it Chiss territory. Number two, the Vigari arrived in force with the clear intent of causing harm. That makes Commander Thrawn's action self-defense, as far as I'm concerned. They were here only because you had so enticed them. I'm not bound by your rules, Cardas reminded him. Besides, as Admiral Arlani will attest, your brother had publicly labeled me as a possible spy. If I got desperate enough to go to the Vigari for help in freeing my companions, you can hardly blame that on him. Thrasa's lip twisted. No, Thrawn has always been very good at hiding his hand when he wishes to do so. Which seems to me takes care of the legal aspects, Cardas concluded. As to your other objection, Dash, he gestured toward the Jurans. I defy you to look at these people and tell me how freeing them from tyranny could possibly be immoral. The morality of an action is not determined by the results, Thras said stiffly. His face softened a little. Still, in this case, it's a hard point to argue. I saw the way the Vigari treated their slaves, Cardas said, shivering at the memories of the Jeruns the Mizkara had murdered in cold blood. In my opinion, the universe is well rid of them. I would tend to agree, Thras said. But Aristocra Chafo Arambintrano may not see things so clearly. Cardas frowned. What does he have to do with anything? He and vessels of the fifth ruling family are on their way here, Thras said grimly. I had a brief communication with him just before leaving Krusty. I suspect he intends to place Thrawn under arrest. Cardas felt his throat tighten. Does Thrawn know about this? No. We need to tell him, and fast. Cardas said grimly. Do you know where he is? I believe he and Admiral Aarlani have gone across to inspect outbound flight. Then let's get over there, Cardas said. Come on my shuttles in one of the portside docking stations. With a creak of not quite aligned metal fittings, the turbolift door reluctantly slid open. Looks like we've got our seals again, Yulier commented peering upward into the car. The ceiling was mostly intact, but one of the scams had cracked open and at its edge he could see the faint rainbow discoloration of a massive radiation surge. Had one or more of the reactors gone up? Unlikely. Even down here in the core they should have heard something that catastrophic. That shaft's going to be a mess though, Keeley muttered, stepping tentatively up beside Hillier and the dreadnoughts themselves will be worse. This could take a while. Then let's not waste any more time talking about it, Yolier said. He started to step into the car. No, Jinsler said, reaching out to touch his arm. She, too, was gazing at the car ceiling, a look of concentration on her face. I'm going alone. Alone's never a good idea in this kind of situation. Keeley warned. A loan for a Jedi is sometimes the only way, she said. Her eyes came back to him, and some of the concentration faded. Don't worry. As soon as I've found someplace safe, I'll come back and get you. You sure you don't want at least a little company? 
Yulia asked, eyeing her closely. He didn't really want to go poking around up there, not with all the destruction and bodies and all. But he didn't like the idea of letting this Jedi out of his sight either. Very sure, Jinsler said. Go back and wait until I come for you. Whatever you say, Kili said, plucking at Yulia's sleeve. Come on, Chaz. Okay, Yulia said reluctantly, stepping back as Jinsler got into the car. Make it fast. I'll try, Jinsler said, giving him a reassuring smile. She was still smiling as the door creaked shut between them. They found Thrawn and Aarlani on the bridge of the main command ship, standing amid a bustling crowd of Chiss crewers methodically checking out the still active control consoles. There were a lot of bodies there, too, lying haphazardly all over the deck. For once, Cardas hardly even noticed. Ah, my brother, Thrawn said as Thras and Cardas made their way through the maze of consoles. Are the Jeruns being properly cared for? Never mind the Jeruns, Cardas put in before Thras could answer. Aristocra Chafor and Bintrano's on his way with a fleet of fifth family ships. On whose authority do they fly? A.R. Alani demanded. The Aristocra's own, I presume, Thrawn said, his eyes narrowed in thought. How soon until they arrive? They could be here at any time, Thras said. I suspect he's coming to raise charges against you. In that case, he would hardly need a fleet of vessels, Thrawn pointed out. No, the Aristocra has something far more profitable in mind. Outbound flight? Cardas asked. Actually, I expect he's hoping to take possession of the remains of the Vagari fleet, Thrawn said. But you're right. Once he sees outbound flight, that priority will definitely change. He can't do that, Thras protested. He looked at Aralani. Can he? Not legally, Aralani said, her voice tight. But as a practical matter, if he's brought enough vessels, there'll be no way for us to stop him. The Council of Families dash, Thras began. We'll certainly object, Aralani cut in. But the procedure will be long and complex. And in the meantime, the fifth family will be coaxing the secrets from their new prize, Thrawn said. Thras hissed, a startlingly reptilian sound. We can't allow that, he said. Possession of outbound flight by any one family could destroy the balance of power for decades to come. Cardas nodded, a hard knot forming in his stomach. The thought of getting their hands on droid technology alone had been enough to lure the Vagari to their destruction. How much more of an edge would the droids plus the rest of Outbound Flight's technology give Chafor and Bintrano's family? We'll have to stall him, Aralani said. But she didn't sound very confident. We must keep his people off this vessel until the defense fleet units I've summoned can arrive. They won't be in time, Thrawn said. We need to take outbound flight to a military base immediately and have it declare defense fleet property. How long a trip are we talking about? Cardas asked dubiously. This thing's taken a lot of damage. It will push the systems to their limit, Thrawn conceded. But we must try. It would be better for outbound flight to be destroyed than to let any single family claim it. There was a flicker of movement at the corner of Cardassa's eye. He turned to the canopy. Just as the last of a dozen large chis ships came out of hyperspace. Too late, he said. He's here. Aarlani muttered a word that had never come up in Cardassa's language lessons. We'll have to make do with the crew as you already have aboard, she said. Quickly, before Dash. She broke off at a Twitter from Thrawn's comlink. Thrawn looked out at the ships, 
then reluctantly pulled the device from his belt. Commander Mithra Nirodo. Commander, Aristocra Chafo Arambintrano of the Fifth Ruling Family is signaling the Springhawk, a voice said. He demands your immediate presence aboard the Chaff Exalted. Thrawn's eyes flicked to Arlani. Do not acknowledge his signal, he ordered. It was not a request, Commander, the voice warned. Do not acknowledge, Thrawn repeated, and clicked off the comm link. Thrawn, you can't simply refuse an aristocrat's direct order, Thras objected. I haven't yet received any direct orders from the aristocra, Thrawn said evenly. Cardas, find me the helm. Yes, sir, Cardas said, peering at the nearest consoles. And then Aralani's calm link twittered. All eyes turned to her. Clever, was all she said as she removed it from her belt and keyed it on. Admiral Aralani. This is Aristocra Chafo Arambintrano, a voice boomed. I've been unable to contact Commander Mithra Nurodo, and I suspect he's refusing to communicate with me. As an Aristocra of the Fifth Ruling Family, I order you to find and detain him pending a hearing on his recent military activities. Aralani hesitated, and Cardas held his breath. Then, with clear reluctance, she nodded. Acknowledged, Aristocra. I hear and obey. She shut off the comm link. I'm sorry, Commander, she said to Thrawn. I have no choice but to place you under detention. This will destroy the Chiss, Thrawn said quietly. The defense fleet, and only the defense fleet, can safely take possession of this vessel. I understand, and I'll do what I can to stall the aristocra, Aralani said. But in the meantime, you are under detention. Order your people to assemble in the hangar to return to our vessels. For a long moment, Thrawn stood motionless. Then, slowly, he bowed his head and activated his calm link. This is Commander Mithra Nurodo, he said. All Chiss warriors aboard outbound flight, return to the hangar bay. Thank you, Aralani said. Now if you please, she added, gesturing back toward the blast doors. You too, Cardas. Cardas took a deep breath. I'm not under Chiss command, Admiral, he said. I'd like to stay aboard a while longer. Aralani's eaves narrowed. What are you planning? Surely you can't fly this vessel alone. I'm not under Chiss command, Cardas repeated. And the aristocra's order didn't mention me. Aralani looked at Thrawn, then at the incoming fifth family ships then finally back at Cardas. Permission granted, she said. She started toward the blast doors. I'll also stay, Thras said. Aralani stopped in mid-step. What? I'm also not under Chiss military command, Thras said. And Aristocra Cherim Bintrano didn't mention me either. Aralani sent a hard look at Thrawn. We'll both be destroyed by this. She warned. The role of a warrior is to protect the Chiss people, Thrawn reminded her. The warrior's own survival is of only secondary importance. For half a dozen heartbeats the two of them locked gazes. Then, with a hissing sigh, Aralani turned to Thras. Pesfavri is the nearest defense fleet base, she said. You know the coordinates? Thras nodded. Yes. Then we leave you, she said, nodding to him. May warrior's fortune smile on your efforts. She continued toward the blast doors. Thrawn lingered for a last, long look at his brother, then followed. And a minute later, Cardas and Thras were alone. You really think we can get this thing all the way to a military base? Cardas asked. 
You missed the point, friend Cardas, Thras said grimly. Weren't you listening to my brother? It would be better for our bound flight to be destroyed than to let any single family claim it. Cardas felt a sudden tightening in his throat. Wait a second, he protested. I was just going to try to lock our bound flight down so that the Aristocracy people couldn't get aboard without blasting their way in. I didn't sign up for a suicide mission. Courage, Cardas, Thras assured him. Neither did I. I assume we can set this vessel's course to intersect the local sun, then escape in the shuttle we arrived in? Cardas thought it over. It should be possible, he decided, provided at least one of the dreadnought's drives was still operable and the control cables to it were intact. I think so. Then let us do it, Thras said. Your people built this vessel. Tell me what to do. The turbolift shaft was reasonably clear, and the car reached D4 with only a few bumps and scrapes. The dreadnought itself didn't seem too badly damaged either. Except, of course, for all the bodies. The medical droids had already started clearing them away, probably taking them all to one of the medical labs where, according to the droids' now outdated programming, Living beings would be waiting to give orders on how to proceed. But there was no one to receive the corpses. Lorana stretched out with the force and worked with the ship's comm system, hoping against all her fears that someone might have miraculously survived the cataclysm that had overtaken outbound flight. But no one answered either call. D4, it seemed, was dead. Of defenders and attackers alike and that Lorana found both curious and ominous. Surely the Chiss hadn't gone to all the effort to destroy outbound flight simply to abandon it. But then where were they? She spent only a little time on D4 before continuing on. The turbolift to D3 was inoperable, implying damage to the cars or the pylon or both, so she headed instead to D5. There she picked her way through the same debris and bodies and received the same negative results to her efforts at communication. D6, the next ship on her grisly tour, was much the same. Still, all three ships seemed to be mostly airtight again, with adequate light and heat and gravitation. The service droids had used the past few hours well. If the Chiss truly had abandoned outbound flight, she and the others might be able to make it at least partially operational again. She was in the turbo lift heading for D1 when her senses caught the faint whisper of nearby life. She pressed her head against the wall of the car, stretching out with the force as best her own injuries and lingering horror would allow. There were definitely living beings out there. Alien beings, and not very many of them. But at least there was someone and she and her turbolift car were headed straight toward them. Stepping away from the wall, she got a grip on her lightsaber. Whether by design or simple blind luck, Commander Mithranurodo had made good on his threat to destroy outbound flight. And he had, moreover, destroyed it out from under Jorisk Bayath and the rest of the Jedi. It was time to see how well the Chiss would do in a face-to-face -face confrontation. The turbolift car came up short at the D1 end of the pylon, blocked by a maze of support girders that had broken loose during the battle. Using the force to augment her efforts, she pried open the car door and climbed through the twisted metal to the entrance door. The turbolift pylons connected at the base of each of the dreadnoughts, serving only decks 1 and 2. The bridge was another four decks up, and under the circumstances it didn't seem like a good idea to trust the dreadnought's own internal turbolift system. Making her way to the nearest stairway, she headed up. The door opened in front of him, and with a not very gentle nudge at the small of his back the pair of yellow-clad chis gestured Doriana forward. He found himself on a command bridge similar to the one aboard the Springhawk only bigger and crewed exclusively by Chiss in the same yellow uniforms as his escort. 
It made Mithra Naruto's black uniform stand out that much more in contrast as he stood in the center of the room before a chis in a gray and yellow robe. Behind Mithra Naruto, a female chis dressed all in white stood at stiff attention. The robe chis eyed Doriana as his escort again nudged him forward. He spat something in the chis language dash. So this is your collaborator. Mithra Naruto translated. Hardly, Doriana said, loading his voice with as much dignity and disdain as he could, just in case the robed Chiss was able to pick up on verbal cues. He had no idea of the details, but it was obvious that there was some kind of power struggle going on here. And Kim and Doriana, assistant to Supreme Chancellor Palpatine, was quite familiar with power struggles. I'm an ambassador of a vast assembly of star systems called the Galactic Republic, he intoned. I came here on a mission of goodwill and exploration. He studied the robed chis carefully as Mithra Naruto translated. But the other merely smiled cynically and spoke again. You came to bring chaos and war to this region of space, Mithra Naruto translated. You have brought alien weapons that you intended to use against the Chiss Ascendancy. The robed Chiss straightened slightly as Mithra Naruto finished and spoke again. But you have failed. Those weapons are now the property of the fifth ruling family. I, Aristocra Chafuarambentrano, hereby take possession. Doriana nodded to himself. So it was outbound flight and its technology that was at issue here and he knew enough about internecine conflict to know that letting one Chiss group have sole possession of it would probably create terrible conflict with the other groups, up to and possibly including civil war. Which would, of course, be precisely the situation Darth Sidious would want to see here. A Chiss ascendancy entangled with its own internal problems couldn't pose a threat to the Sith Lord's plans for the Republic and the new order he planned to create. Standing here in the middle of Aristocra Chafor and Bintrano's people, all Doriana had to do was confirm the fifth family's claim, and he would help put the Chiss on that long and bitter road. But as he opened his mouth to speak, he looked at Mithra Naruto. The commander was looking back at him, his face expressionless, his glowing eyes focused unblinkingly on him. Doriana had already reluctantly concluded that Mithra Naruto would have to be killed. But if that death came at the height of a controversy over the disposition of outbound flight. I'm sorry, Aristocra Chafor and Bintrano, but outbound flight is not yours to take possession of, he said instead. As a duly appointed representative of the Republic that sent the project on its journey, I claim full salvage rights. Chafor and Bintrano seemed taken aback as Mithra Naruto finished the translation. He bit something out. Ridiculous, Mithra Naruto said. An aggressor has no rights. I deny your claim that either I or outbound flight have behaved aggressively toward your people, Doriana countered. And I demand a full hearing and judgment before any chis steps aboard outbound flight. Mithra Naruto translated. Chafo Arambintrano's eyes narrowed, his glare shifting to the white-clad female. He said something, she replied, and the argument was on. Doriana looked sideways at Mithra Naruto. His face was still expressionless, but as his own eyes shifted to meet Doriana's his lips seemed to twitch upward in a microscopic smile of approval. Just what the commander would do with the mess that had now been stirred up Doriana didn't know. But to his mild surprise, he discovered he was rather looking forward to finding out. It had taken longer than Cardos had expected to get outbound flight prepped for flight. But at last they were ready. Okay, get to the helm. He told Thras, glancing out the canopy at the Chiss ship still hovering in the near distance. Why they hadn't already sent over a boarding party he couldn't guess. Apparently, Thrawn and Aralani had found a way to stall them. Ready, Thras called. 
Stepping to the navigation console, Cardos gave it one final check. Course set and locked in, ready to take outbound flight on its final voyage. Crossing to the engineering console, he settled his fingers on the power feed controls. Watch out! Thras snapped. Cardos spun around, expecting to see a whole squad of yellow-suited chis charging in on them. But to his astonishment, he found himself facing a lone female human. Out of the corner of his eye he saw Thras snatch a weapon out of concealment in his robe. In reply, the woman produced a short metal cylinder and a green lightsaber blade blazed into existence. No! He barked, waving a hand frantically at Thras. But it was too late. The other's weapon hissed out a blue bolt, which the woman sent ricocheting harmlessly into the ceiling. I said stop. Cardas called again. She's a Jedi. To his relief, Thras didn't fire again. What do you want? The Chiss demanded instead, keeping his weapon aimed. He wants to know what you want, Cardas said, translating the chun for her. Her eyes flicked to him. He doesn't speak basic? No, no one here does except Thrawn, Cardas said. But he knows some side bisti, if that helps. It does. She looked back at Thras. Who are you? She asked, switching to that language. I am Syndic Mithras Safis of the Eighth Ruling Family of the Chiss Ascendancy. Thras identified himself. And I'm George Cardas, Cardas added. Mostly an innocent bystander to all of this. Mostly? I got here through a hyperdrive malfunction, he said. Who are you? Lorana Ginsler, she said. Lowering her lightsaber, but leaving it ignited, she crossed the threshold and continued on into the bridge, limping noticeably. Her eyes flicked across the dead bodies, and an edge of fresh pain crossed her face. Who else is aboard? At the moment, just us, Thras said. He hesitated, then slipped his weapon back into his tunic. But a member of one of the ruling families is trying to claim outbound flight for himself. We're trying to prevent that. Jinsler's eyes narrowed. How? We're going to have to scuttle it, Cardas said, watching her face carefully. Even with nothing left but torn and broken metal, there was an even chance she would be attached enough to the Hulk to object violently to its destruction. People went all weird like that sometimes. Sure enough, her eyes widened. No, she insisted. You can't. Look, I'm sorry, Cardas said as soothingly as he could. But there's nothing left but dead metal and droids dash. Never mind the dead metal, she snapped. There are people still aboard. Cardas felt his heart catch. No, that was impossible. A Jedi might possibly have survived Thrawn's attack, but surely no one else could have. Who? He asked. How many? Including children. Cardas looked at Thras, seeing his own horror reflected in the other's face. Where are they? He asked. Can we get them out of here? In that shuttle? Thras countered before Jinsler could answer. No. There isn't enough room for even ten. And it would take time to get them up here anyway, Jinsler said. They're still in the storage core. Cardas grimaced. The storage core. Of course the one area Thrawn's attack had ignored. What do we do? I don't understand the problem, Jinsler said, looking back and forth between them. Why don't we just leave?
Not even if we had time to get your people up here to help us. Lorana looked around the bridge. We won't need them, she said, her voice tight but firm. I can fly up on flight. By yourself? Thras asked in clear disbelief. One single person? One single Jedi, Jinsler corrected him. Master Kbayoth insisted we all learn to handle all of the major systems. At least, under normal conditions. The conditions here are hardly normal, Kardas pointed out. And it still leaves the question of where we go. We'll never make it back to the Republic, not with this much damage. We have to reach a defense fleet base, as my brother originally intended, Thras said. And then what happens to my people? Jinsler asked. Would they be prisoners of war? Captives held for study? The Chiss aren't like that, Kardas insisted. But the end result might be the same, Thras conceded. If the fifth ruling family chooses to press its claim to outbound flight, even if we go to a military base they may demand that all aboard be placed in holding until the matter can be decided. A prison by any other name, Jinsler said grimly. How long would this decision process take? Thras snorted. With a prize such as outbound flight? It could be years. So we can forget going anywhere in Chis space, Kardas said. Any idea what other habitable worlds there might be out here? Even if I did, I would caution against anything nearby, Thras said. This region is dangerous, with pirates and privateers all around. Not to mention what's left of the Vigari, Kardas agreed with a shiver. Come on, Thras, think. There has to be something else we can do. Thras gazed out at the fifth family ships. There's one other possibility, he said slowly. Within two days flight is a star cluster that the defense fleet has begun to fortify as an emergency refuge. I've seen the data, and there are at least ten habitable worlds within it that haven't yet been explored. Kind of an out-of-the-way homestead, Kardas pointed out doubtfully. And still in Chis space, Jinsler added. But it's a place where vessels of the fifth family wouldn't accidentally discover you, Thras said. Only defense fleet personnel go inside, and only to specific systems as they work on the fortifications. So what's the catch? Kardas asked. Thras made a face. The catch is that I don't have the safe access routes into the cluster, he said. Are your navigational systems capable of finding such routes on their own? Probably not, Jinsler said. But I might be able to. There are Jedi navigational techniques that should be good enough to take us through even a star cluster. So what happens if she can? Kardas asked Thras. They set up shop and wait for all this to blow over? or I return after they're hidden and negotiate in secret with the Council of Families for their safe passage home, Thras said. Even if such negotiations take a few months, the survivors will at least have a habitable world to live on, he looked at Jinsler. There are other hyper-capable vessels aboard that I could use, are there not? Just one, a two-passenger Delta-12 Sky Sprite, Jinsler said but it should have the range you need. So that's it. Kardas asked, not quite believing they'd hammered out something workable so quickly. We hide outbound flight in this cluster, negotiate a deal with the Chiss all the Chiss and everyone gets what they want. Basically, Jinsler hesitated. But then we won't include you. I have something else I need you to do for me. Her lips compressed. A personal favor. Like what? Kardas asked cautiously. Doing a personal favor for a Jedi didn't sound very appetizing. I want you to find my brother when you return to the Republic, she said. Dean Jinsler, 
probably working with Senate Support Services on Karuskant. Tell him Dash. She hesitated. Just tell him that his sister was thinking about him, hoping that someday he'll be able to let go of his anger. His anger at me, at our parents, and at himself. All right, Cardas said, the hairs on the back of his neck tingling. The fact that she was sending him on such an errand implied she wasn't at all sure she'd be coming back. Given the shape outbound flight was in, he wouldn't have bet on it, either. I'll do my best. For a long moment she held his eyes. Then she nodded. You'd better go, then, she said. She looked down at her still-glowing lightsaber, as if suddenly realizing it was still active, and closed it down. Please don't forget. I won't, he promised. Good luck, he looked at Thras. To both of you. Ten minutes later, Cardas eased the Chiss shuttle out of the dreadnought's hangar and flew it clear. Turning the nose toward the waiting fifth family ships, he looked back over his shoulder at the magnificent failure that had been outbound flight. He wondered if anyone would ever see it again. Doriana was gazing out the bridge canopy, listening with half an ear to the argument still going on between Chafo Arambintrano, Mithra Nerodo, and the female Chiss, when outbound flight abruptly made the jump to light speed. For a moment he stared in disbelief. And then, slowly, he felt a smile tug at his lips. So that was what Mithra Nerodo had been up to with this confrontation. He'd been stalling for time while some of his people stole the dreadnoughts right out from under Aristocra Chafor and Bintrano's nose. And even Doriana's own attempt to muddy the Chiss waters had apparently been part of that scheme. Had Mithra Nerodo anticipated Doriana's efforts? Or had he simply incorporated them into his own plan as they occurred? Either way, it was artfully done. Excuse me? He spoke up, lifting a finger. I believe the discussion is over. He waited until he had their attention, then angled the upraised finger to point out the canopy. Your prize is gone. 24. The shimmering hyperspace sky flowed past the dreadnought's canopy as outbound flight drove onward into the unknown. Lorana knew the sky was there, but had no time to actually focus on the sight. Every bit of her attention was tied up with D-1 systems as she used the force to both sense the equipment status and keep the controls in proper adjustment. It was hard work. It was hideously hard work. Vaguely, she felt a whisper of movement at her side. Lorana? Thras asked, his voice distant in her overstretched consciousness. Did you get to them? She asked. The moment of distraction was too much. Even as she finished her question, one of the reactor feeds began to surge. Clamping down hard on her lower lip, she stretched out and cased the flow back to its proper level. I'm sorry, Thras said. I can't even find a way off this ship. All the pylon turbolift tunnels are blocked to one degree or another. Perhaps if you brought us out of hyperspace I could find a vac suit and make my way across to the core that way. No, Lorana said. The word came out tartly and impolitely, she suspected, but she didn't have the concentration to spare for courtesy. Hyperdrive not good. In point of fact, the hyperdrive was very much not good. It was running blazingly hot, and it was all she could do to keep the circuits from looping and ripping the thing completely out of her control. If she shut it down now, there was every chance it would never start up again. Even if she didn't, it would probably eventually collapse on its own. On the other hand, with the extra speed the runaway had given them, the edge of the cluster was now only a few standard hours away. If she could continue to fly the ship and use the Jedi navigation techniques at the same time to get them safely between the tightly packed stars, they had a good chance of reaching one of Thrasse's target systems before that happened. I understand, 
Thras said. I'll keep trying to find a communication line that'll get me through to them. He moved away, and Lorana felt a pang of guilt. If the survivors were still waiting down there like she told them to, they would certainly be wondering where she was. They might even conclude that she'd run off and abandoned them. Across the bridge, a flashing red light warned that the alluvial dampers were drifting. Frowning in concentration, trying to maintain her force grip on all the myriad other controls she was simultaneously juggling, she reached out a hand and carefully adjusted the dampers back into proper alignment. Once they reached their destination and she could finally let the systems ease down to standby, she and Thras could make their way back to Yulier and the rest and explain what had happened. And they would understand. Surely they would understand. At the other side of the bridge, another red light was flashing. Taking a deep breath, wondering how long she'd be able to keep this up, she stretched out with the force. You will pay for this. Chafor and Bintrano ground out, pacing back and forth across the conference room in front of the three prisoners standing silently in front of him. There was a cushioned chair behind the narrow desk, but he was apparently too angry even to sit down. You hear me? You will pay. He leveled his glare first at Doriana, then at Cardas, and finally at Thrawn. And the charge will be high treason. Standing behind the desk, well out of the way of the aristocrats pacing, Admiral A. Arlani stirred. I don't think such a charge will hold, Aristocra, she said. Her expression, Cardas noted, had maintained a careful neutrality as she listened to Chafor and Bintrano's rantings. Still, he thought he could detect a certain relief behind the aloofness. Small wonder. She'd gotten what she wanted. Outbound flight was safely out of Chafor and Bintrano's grasping hands. What happened to a couple of prisoners was probably a matter of complete indifference to her. Or at least, what happened to the two nonchus prisoners. You don't think the charge will hold? Chafor and Bintrano snapped, shifting his glare to her. Aralani stood her ground. No, I don't, she said. Cardas has already stated that Syndic Mithras Safis and the human Lorana Jinsler were the perpetrators. With his assistance and advice. Advice alone is only lesser treason, Aralani said. And as a nonchus, he can't be charged with any level of treason anyway. As for Doriana, he clearly had nothing to do with it. What are they going on about now? Doriana murmured in Cardas's ear. The aristocra wants to roast us over a low fire, Cardas murmured back. The admiral is suggesting he needs to rethink his charges. Ah. The byplay hadn't gone unnoticed. Do the prisoners wish to add to the proceedings? Chafor and Bintrano asked acidly. Actually, the prisoners will go free. Thrawn said the first words he'd spoken since they'd all been herded into the conference room where Chafor and Bintrano could threaten them in private. They've done nothing with which they can be charged. If you wish to blame someone, blame me. I fully intend to. Chafor and Bintrano bit out. After I've dealt with your accomplices. They're not my accomplices, Thrawn said calmly. Furthermore, they're my prisoners and as such fall under the legal authority of the Chiss Expansionary Fleet. He lifted his eyebrows. As do I, for that matter. Not anymore, Chafor and Bintrano said. For the crime of unprovoked attack against sentient beings, I hereby revoke your military position. Just a moment, Aristocra, Aralani said, taking a step forward. You can't revoke his position for a crime for which he has yet to be convicted. I suggest you reread the law, Admiral, Chafor Rembintrano said tartly. Commander Mithranerodo has pushed the limits for the last time and this time we have proof, scattered across the system before us. The Vigari were an imminent threat to the Ascendancy, Thrawn said. And this system is within Chiss space. 
But this time you forgot to let your victim fire first. Chafora Mentrano said, an edge of triumph in his voice. Don't deny it I have the records from your own vessels. The Vigari made threats against both us and outbound flight, Thrawn said. I claim that such threats, backed up by their obvious firepower, were sufficient provocation for Chiss' action. You can claim anything you wish, Chafor Mbintrano said. But the burden of proof is now on you, not me. He looked at Aralani. And until his trial takes place, I can and will revoke both his position and the military protection you so clearly hope to shelter him beneath. Aralani didn't answer. For a moment, Chafor Mbintrano continued to stare at her, then turned back to Thrawn. And your fellow prisoners will likewise be taken to trial, he said. These, along with the other two you have back at Krusty, he paused. Unless, of course, you have enough concern for their well-being to make a bargain. Thrawn looked at Cardas and Doriana. Such as? You will resign your position, completely and permanently, Chafor Mbintrano said. You will likewise renounce your status as trial born of the Eighth Family and disappear back into the great mass of Chis citizenry, never again to rise to a position where you may threaten law or custom. You asked my entire life for the trade of a few alien prisoners, Thrawn pointed out calmly. Are you certain you're willing to live with the consequences? Chafor Mbintrano snorted. What consequences? To begin with, the Eighth Family will not permit a trial born to simply renounce his affiliation, Thrawn said. They'll insist on a hearing. And I don't believe they'll let me go. Not when they see the prize I'll be bringing them. Chafor Mbintrano stiffened. You wouldn't dare, he rumbled, his voice dark with menace. If outbound flight reappears at an Eighth Family stronghold dash, Outbound flight is gone, Thrawn cut him off. And I refer to another technology entirely. He waved a hand out at the stars. To be specific, the device I used to bring both outbound flight and the Vigari fleet out of hyperspace. Chafor Mbintrano sent a startled look at Aralani. The dash? Are you saying they didn't come here of their own choosing? The choosing was mine alone, Thrawn assured him. I can provide you a demonstration if you'd like. That device is not your property, Aralani warned, her neutral expression suddenly gone. It belongs to the Chiss defense fleet. And if I remain a member of the expansionary fleet, I will of course turn it over to you, Thrawn assured her. But if my military position is revoked, I will no longer have any official loyalty except to my adoptive family. At that point, he left the sentence unfinished. Chafor Mbintrano was clearly having no trouble connecting the dots. Admiral, you can't permit him to manipulate you this way, he insisted. This is nothing less than extortion. This is nothing less than reality, Thrawn corrected. And Admiral Aralani has nothing to say about it. You're the one threatening to revoke my position. For a long minute the two chis locked eyes. Then, abruptly, Chafor Mbintrano turned and stalked out of the conference room. That didn't look good, Doriana murmured. Actually, it was, Cardas said, looking at Thrawn. At least I think so. Yes, Thrawn confirmed, his face and body sagging a little. He's furious, but he doesn't dare revoke my position now. He looked at Aralani. And once the defense fleet has the gravel projector, I'm certain they'll protect me from any future efforts on his part. Aralani's lips twitched. We'll do what we can, she said. But understand this, Commander. If you continue to act outside the legal boundaries set by the Defense Fleet and the Nine Families, 
There may come a point where we can no longer stand with you. I understand, Thrawn said. Understand in turn that I will continue to protect my people in whatever way I deem necessary. I would expect nothing less from you, Earlani said. Her eyes flicked once to Doriana and Cardas. I release your prisoners to you. Return to Krusty and leave me to deal with the rest of the Vigari debris. I obey, Thrawn said, bowing his head to her. The Gravild projector will be waiting for you at Krusty whenever you wish to retrieve it. Earlani bowed in return and left the room. Thrawn took a deep breath. And with that, I believe it's finally over. He said. A shuttle is waiting to take us back to the Springhawk. He gestured to Doriana. And then I will return you and Vice Lord Calf to your vessel. Thank you, Doriana said. We're looking forward to returning home. And as they filed out of the room, Cardos wondered at the odd stiffness in Doriana's back. They were passing through one of the systems midway through the star cluster when the hyperdrive finally died. No chance of fixing it? Thras asked. Lorana shook her head. Not by me, she said. Possibly not by anyone, at least outside of a major shipyard. Thras gazed out the canopy at the distant sun. You have five other dreadnoughts here each with its own hyperdrive, he reminded her. Could we move across to one of the others and use its systems? Lorana rubbed her forehead, wincing as the pressure accentuated the throbbing pain behind her eyes. According to the status readings back in ComOps, none of the other hyperdrives is operational, she said. And all the control lines to the other dreadnoughts are down, besides whatever your brother used to. To stop Kbeathus' attack, it scorched a great deal of the delicate equipment aboard. It's going to take months, maybe even years, to tear them apart and fix them. Thras tapped his fingers thoughtfully on the edge of the nearest console. Then this system is where we stop, he said. We'll shut down the drive, take the Delta-12 craft you spoke of, and go try to make a bargain for your people. I don't think we should shut down the drive, Lorana said, trying to think. The shape it's in, if we shut it down we might not be able to start it up again. But if we don't shut it down, outbound flight won't take long to travel all the way through this system, Thras pointed out. We could be away for a month or more negotiating with the Defense Force and Nine Families. By that time, the vessel could have passed into interstellar space, where we would have difficulty locating it. And if the hyperdrives proved unfixable, interstellar space would be where outbound flight would remain. Then we'd better find some place here where we can park for a while, she said. A nice high orbit around one of the planets, say. Let's fire up what's left of the sensors and see what our choices are. The survey took most of two hours. In the end, there turned out to be only one viable alternative. It's smaller than I'd hoped for, Thras said as they leaned side by side over the main sensor console. Less gravity means less stability to the orbit from the perturbations of passing objects. But it also means less atmosphere that might cause the orbit to decay, Lorana pointed out. And it's almost directly along our vector, which means no fancy maneuvering to get us there. I say we go for it. Agreed, Thras said. Let's hope the drive holds out that long. They had reached the target planetoid and were on their final approach to orbit when the drive gave one final surge and shut down. Report, Lorana bit out as she stretched out with the force trying unsuccessfully to coax the system back to life. Thras? The red curve bends too far inward, Thras reported tightly from the NAV console. Fifteen orbits from now, it intersects the surface. 
A wave of despair rose like acid in Lorana's throat. Resolutely, she forced it down. After all they'd been through, outbound flight was not going to end up destroying itself. Not now. Get to the sensor station. She ordered him. See if there's a place any place where we might be able to land this thing. This vessel was not designed with landing in mind, Thras warned as he hurried to the proper console. Could we possibly still make orbit? I'm working on it, Lorana said, crossing to the cluster of engineering monitors and searching among the red lights for something that might still be showing green. Two of the forward braking and maneuvering jets, she saw, were still operative. If they could somehow rotate outbound flight 180 degrees and then use those jets to give them a boost along their current vector. They had slipped into the planetoid's gravitational field and used up the first of their 15 orbits before she reluctantly concluded that such a maneuver wouldn't be possible. There was simply too much mass to be moved, and too little time in which to move it. No luck, she said, stepping to Thras's side. You find anything? Perhaps, he said hesitantly. I've located a long, enclosed valley that I believe will be deep enough to hold us. I don't see how that gains us anything, Lorana said. Enclosed valleys imply valley walls, which imply a sudden stop somewhere along the line. In this case, the stop would be somewhat less violent, Thras said, pointing to the display. This particular valley is full of small rocks. Lorana frowned, leaning over for a closer look. He was right. The whole valley was filled nearly to the top with what seemed to be gravel-sized stones. I wonder how that happened, she commented. Multiple asteroid or meteor collisions, most likely, Thras said. It doesn't matter. This is the only place on the planetoid that offers a chance for survival. Lorana grimaced. But he was right. With the drive gone, coming down anywhere else on the planetoid would mean a full-bore collision at near-orbit speeds. With the gravel, at least it would have a slightly more gradual slowdown. Can we reach it with the drive gone? She asked, keying for an analysis. The valley is not far off our current orbital path, Thras said. I believe the maneuvering systems will be adequate to move us into position and to give us at least a little deceleration before impact. The analysis appeared on the display. The computer agrees with you, she confirmed, looking out at the dark world rotating beneath them as she tried to think. All right. We're here in D1. The Delta-12 is in D3, and the rest of the survivors are in the core. If we want D3 to end up on top of the gravel heap, we'll need to rotate outbound flight to put D6 at the bottom. It'll hit first, taking the initial impact and hopefully slowing us down enough that the damage to the other ships will be minimal when they dig in. Including the damage to this one? Thras asked pointedly. Lorana made a face. I know, but we have no choice. We need D3's hangar bay to stay above the surface if we're going to get the Delta-12 out. So we rotate D6 to the bottom, as I say, then move the people out of the core to dash. Hello? A voice came suddenly from the bridge speakers. Jedi Jinsler? You there somewhere? This is Chaz Yulier. We got tired of waiting, so we all came up to D4. Jinsler? For a stretched out second, Lorana and Thras stared at each other in horror. Then, snapping out of her paralysis, Lorana dived for the calm station. This is Lorana Jinsler, she called urgently. Yulier, get everyone back to the storage core right away. You hear me? Get everyone back to Dash. 
Jinsler, are you there? Yulia's voice came again. Jedi, if you've cut out on us, I'm going to be really upset with you. Yulia? Lorana called again. Yulia! But there was no reply. He can't hear you, Thras said grimly. The comm isn't tra transmitting at this end. Lorana twisted her neck to look out at the planetoid, her pulse throbbing violently against the agony in her head. D4 Why did they have to have gone to D4? Because it was the one closest to the Jedi school where she'd left them, of course. And now there were 57 people wandering around down there, completely oblivious as to what was about to happen to them. Thras was watching her, a tautness in his face. We have no choice, she told him quietly. We'll have to rotate and put D4 on top. His expression didn't even flicker. Clearly, he'd already come to the same conclusion. Which will put D1 this one at the very bottom, he said. Where it would take the full brunt of their crash landing. We have no choice, Lorana said again. It's only an assumption that the bottom dreadnought will take enough of the impact to leave the others intact. For all we know, they might all hit hard enough to be ripped open to vacuum. We have to try to keep D4 as far out of the rock as possible. I understand, Thras hesitated. There's still time for you to leave, you know. You may at least be able to get to the core before we hit, perhaps even all the way to D4. Lorana shook her head. You can't handle the landing alone, she reminded him. But I could do that while you go. And who would keep the remaining systems from self-destroying while you cleared a path through the pylons for me? Thras countered. No, Jedi Jinsler. It appears we will both be giving our lives for your people. Lorana felt her vision blurring with tears. Deep in the back crevices of her mind, she'd wondered why she'd felt so strongly about sending Cardas home with that message for her brother. Now she knew it had been the subtle prompting of the Force. This is hardly the temporary home I'd envisioned for them, Thras went on, as if talking to himself. It's likely to be far more permanent than I had hoped, too. Your people will come here someday, Lorana assured him, wondering why she was saying that. Wishful thinking? Or more prompting from the Force? Until then, they have enough food and supplies to last for generations. They'll survive. I know they will. Then let us prepare for the end. Thras hesitated, then reached out his hand to her. I've known you and your people only briefly, Jedi Lorana Jinsler. But in that time, I've learned to admire and respect you. I hope that someday humans and Chiss will be able to work side by side in peace. As do I, Syndic Mithras Safis of the Eighth Ruling Family, Lorana said, taking his hand. For a minute they stood silently, their hands clasped, each preparing for death. Then, taking a deep breath, Thras released her hand. Then let us bring this part of history to a close, he said briskly. May warriors, fortune smile on our efforts. Yes, Lorana said. And may the force be with us. She gestured downward toward D4. And with them. As you can see, we have left your ship and equipment undisturbed. Mithra Nurodo said, gesturing as he led Doriana and Cav through the Dark Venge's bridge toward Cav's command office. I know certain of you were concerned about that, he added, looking over his shoulder at Cav. The Nymoidian didn't reply. At any rate, I imagine you're looking forward to returning home, Mithra Nurodo continued as they walked into the office. There are just one or two points I need to clear up before you leave. 
Of course, Doriana said, taking a hasty step to the side as Kev pushed past him, brushed by Mithra Narodo, and circled the desk to drop rather defiantly into his ornate chair. We'll do whatever's necessary, he added as he took a chair at one corner of the desk. Thank you, Mithra Narodo said, sitting down in a chair at the other corner and gazing across the edge of the desk at Doriana. Basically, I believe we both wish to make certain that this one contact between our peoples remains the last. I don't understand, Doriana said, forcing puzzlement into his voice. Our relationship thus far has proved mutually beneficial. Why wouldn't we want it to continue? Come now, Commander, Mithra Naruto said mildly. My side of the arrangement is already secure, of course. You have no idea where my base is, or where the worlds of the Chis ascendancy lie. We can remain hidden from you as long as we wish. He paused. It therefore remains only for you to ensure to your own satisfaction that I will never bring news to the Republic of your betrayal of outbound flight. Doriana stared at him, a cold hand closing around his heart. Did Mithra Naruto know about his conversations with Cav? Had he or one of the other Chis seen Kev pass him that hold-up blaster? Or had he merely deduced that Doriana would decide to murder him? Slowly, almost unwillingly, his hand crept toward the hidden blaster, the movement blocked from Mithranur Odo's view by the edge of the desk. Certainly it made sense to cover his tracks this way, he reminded himself firmly. Loose ends could be fatal to someone living his kind of double life. Sidious would insist on it, as well, especially given that Mithra Naruto had seen the Sith Lord and heard his name. And after helping to bring about the deaths of 50,000 people on outbound flight, one more death certainly couldn't matter. Mithra Naruto was still waiting, watching him silently. Doriana closed his hand around the grip of his blaster. And paused. Mithra Naruto brilliant tactician, equally brilliant strategist, a being who could take on Republic warships, nomadic pirates, and even Jedi, and win against them all. And Doriana was actually considering killing him? What are you waiting for? Cav broke impatiently into his thoughts. You have him alone and unprotected. Shoot him. Doriana smiled tightly, and with that, the underlying tension that had been nagging at him ever since his task force's destruction finally faded away. Don't be absurd, Vice Lord, he said. Pulling out the blaster, he leaned over and set it on an empty chair between him and Mithra Naruto. I would as soon shatter thousand-year-old crystal as kill a being such as this. Mithra Naruto inclined his head, his eyes glittering. So I was indeed right about you, he said. Eventually, Doriana conceded. But then, I don't imagine you're wrong very often. Then let this be your final mistake, Kev bit out, slapping at his desk chair's arm and popping open a hidden panel. In a single smooth motion he scooped out another holdout blaster, pointed it at Mithra Naruto, and fired. The shot never reached him. Instead, it struck the faint haze that had suddenly appeared between them, then bounced straight back into Cav's torso. The Nymoidian had just enough time to look startled before he collapsed forward onto the desk and lay still. It was only then, as Doriana shifted his stunned gaze from Cav's body to the haze surrounding the desk, that he recognized its shape and coloration. He looked through the edge of the shield at Mithra Naruto. It was still something of a risk, wasn't it? He asked, striving to keep his voice conversational. Not really, the other assured him. The shield generator was simple enough to remove from one of the droid decas you provided for me. As I said at the time, we've had some experience with reversing the polarity of such devices. He gestured. 
and it was easily predictable that Vice Lord Cav would claim his chair and desk for his own, and thus position himself for his own destruction. I meant the risk you took with me, Doriana said. The shield wouldn't have blocked my shot. No, it wouldn't, Mithranurodo agreed. But I had to be certain that you were someone I could trust. Doriana frowned. Why? For a moment Mithranurodo didn't answer. Then, leaning over, he picked up the blaster Doriana had discarded. You and your master, Darth Sidious, told me of a people you call the Far Outsiders gathering at the edge of the galaxy, he said, turning the weapon over in his hands. Have you ever actually seen these beings? As far as I know, we haven't, Doriana admitted. I thought not, Mithranurodo said, suddenly intense. But we have. A cold chill ran up Doriana's back. Where? At the far edge of the Chiss Ascendancy, Mithranurodo said, his voice dark and grim. It was a small reconnaissance force, but it fought with a savage ferocity before it was finally repulsed. How many ships were there? Doriana asked, his mind kicking into high speed. Darth Sidious coveted information of this sort. Enough of it might even persuade him to forgive Doriana the loss of his Trade Federation task force. What sort of weaponry did they have? Do you have any combat data? I have some, Mithranurodo said. Admiral Aarlani was in command of the force that ultimately drove them away. That's why she came personally to investigate Cardas and his companions. We wondered if the Republic they spoke of might be allied with the invaders. And that's also why she was willing to look the other way while you dealt with the Vigari, Doriana said as a final nagging piece of the puzzle finally fell into place. A two-front war would be exceptionally nasty. Correct, Mithranurodo said, and Doriana thought he could hear a note of approval at his quick deduction. My actions were contrary to official Chiss policy, but she knew as well as I that the Vigari had to be dealt with, as quickly and decisively as possible. I will speak to her. If she's willing, I'll provide you with copies of the information you seek. Thank you, Doriana said. Now. A moment ago you spoke of trust between us. What exactly did you have in mind? For the moment, nothing, Mithranurodo said. Each of us has our own peoples to defend and our own politics to deal with. But in the future, who can tell? Perhaps someday our peoples will end up fighting side by side against this threat. I hope so, Doriana said. I, for my part, intend to work with our leaders to prepare as best I can for that day. As will I. Mithranurodo said. Though the obstacles at my end may be difficult to overcome. Doriana thought about Lord Sidious and his hatred of non-humans. It wouldn't exactly be easy at his end, either. I've seen you work military miracles, he said. I'm sure you can work political ones as well. Perhaps, Mithranurodo said. My brother may be able to assist in that area when he returns. He stood up and held out the blaster. At any rate, you and your ship are free to go. Doriana waved away the proffered weapon. Keep it, Commander, he said. Think of it as a souvenir of our first victory together. Thank you, Mithranurodo said gravely, slipping the blaster into a pocket. May it not be our last. Indeed, Doriana agreed. Which reminds me. There's one other small matter I'd like to discuss with you. You're joking, Cardas said, frowning at Thrawn. He's offering me a job. Not just a job, but a highly placed leadership position, Thrawn said. 
He wanted me to invite you to accompany him back to the Republic on the Darkvenge so that you could discuss it. This doesn't make any sense, Cardas protested. I'm barely out of school. What kind of high power position could I possibly be qualified for? Age is not necessarily the best indicator of talent and ability, Thrawn pointed out. In your case, he was highly impressed by the role you played in luring the Vigari into position for the attack. You've shown yourself to be intelligent, resourceful, and able to remain cool under fire, qualities he prizes as well as I do. Cardas rubbed his cheek thoughtfully. It was still ridiculous, of course. But it was also far too intriguing to simply dismiss out of hand. Did he say what sort of job it would be? I gather it would involve some of the same smuggling work you're doing with Captain Kento, Thrawn said. But beneath such surface activities, your primary task would be to create and operate a private information network for him. Cardas pursed his lips. Smuggling alone he could take or leave, but this other part sounded a lot more interesting. He's not expecting me to build this network on my own, is he? Thrawn shook his head. He would begin by giving you several months of training and on-the-spot instruction. After that, you would have some of his contacts and resources in the Republic to draw on. Which I would guess are pretty impressive, Cardas said, thinking hard. It would mean no more of Kento's casually lunatic way of dealing with clients and competitors. No more ships falling apart underneath him for lack of funds or interest. Best of all, no huts. It's your decision, of course, Thrawn said. But I believe you have the necessary gifts to excel at such a job. And as an extra added bonus, it would also enhance my usefulness as a possible future contact with the Republic? Cardas asked Riley. Thrawn smiled. As I said, you have the necessary gifts. Well, it can't hurt to check it out. Cardas studied Thrawn's face. Was there something else? To his surprise, the other actually hesitated. I wanted to ask a favor of you, he said at last. Whichever ship you choose to return on, I'd ask that you never tell Kento or Ferrisai what happened to outbound flight. Cardas grimaced. He'd thought about that himself. Thought about it a lot, in fact. Especially Ferrisai? Especially her, Thrawn said, his voice tinged with sadness. There are all too few idealists in this universe, Cardas. Too few people who strive always to see only the good in others. I wouldn't want to be responsible for crushing even one of them. And besides, you rather liked all that unquestioning adulation coming your way? Thrawn smiled faintly. All beings appreciate such admiration, he said. You have excellent insight into the hearts of others. Stratus has chosen well. I guess we'll find out. Cardas held out his hand. Well, goodbye, Commander. It's been an honor knowing you. As it has for me, as well, Thrawn said, taking his hand. Farewell. George. I don't know. Kento said, shaking his head. For my money, it sounds like a really bad idea. I'll be fine, Cardas assured him. Thrawn says Stratus isn't the sort to lure me aboard just to make trouble. It's not his style. Maybe, Kento rumbled. Maybe not. The last thing a guy like that will want is someone like you planting yourself on a Coruscant street corner and shouting his past activities from the bottom of your lungs. And what about us? Maris added. We knew what he was planning for outbound flight, too. But you never knew his real name, Cardas reminded her. 
All you have is an alias and a rumor. That's not going to get you any traction. Even if we were stupid enough to try? Kento asked, throwing a warning look at Maris. Something like that, Cardas agreed, hoping neither of them would bring up the fact that they had known Cav's real name. Still, Kai was a common enough Nymoidian name, and since the Vice Lord himself was dead, that wasn't likely to be too much of a problem. Certainly Stratus himself hadn't seemed worried about it. Anyway, Thrawn vouches for the man. That's good enough for me, Maris declared. I just hope Drixo the Hut will be as reasonable. Don't worry about Drixo, Kento said with a grunt. She won't be a problem, not with all this extra loot to calm her down. In fact, I'll bet I can even talk her into giving us a bonus. Maris rolled her eaves. Here we go again. Hey, I'm a businessman, Kento protested. This is what I do. Just do it carefully, okay? Kardas said. I don't want to have to worry about you too. You worry about yourself, Kento said ominously, jabbing a large finger into Kardas's chest for emphasis. Whatever Thrawn says, this stratus sounds about as slippery as a grease dug, and twice as unfriendly. And having Thrawn foil his attack on outbound flight won't have helped his mood any, Maris said. Her forehead wrinkled slightly. Thrawn did stop his attack, didn't he? Kardas felt his stomach tighten. Maris had been a shipmate, someone he'd spent half a year living and working and fighting alongside. More than that, he considered her a friend. He'd never lied to a friend before. Did he really want to start now? And with a lie as terrible as this one? And then, Thrawn's voice seemed to float up from his memory. There are all too few idealists in this universe. The truth wouldn't help the dead of outbound flight. All it could do was hurt Maris. Of course he stopped Stratus's attack. He assured her with all the false hardiness he could create. I was right there when outbound flight flew away. The wrinkles in her forehead smoothed out, and Maris smiled. I knew he could do it, she said, holding out her hand. Good luck, George, and take care of yourself. Maybe we'll run into each other again sometime. Cardas forced himself to smile as he took her hand. Yes, he said softly. Maybe we will. The shattering impact had passed, the violent shaking had faded away, and the dust was beginning to settle onto the darkened deck. Slowly, carefully, Yulia lifted his head from the mass of chair cushions he'd curled up against, wincing as a twinge of pain arced through his neck. Hello? He called, his voice echoing eerily through the silent room. Yulia? A voice called back. It's... He broke off as a sudden coughing fit took him. It's Presser, he said when he got the cough under control. You all right? Yeah, I think so, Yulier said, getting up and walking unsteadily toward the voice. All the lights were out except for the permlight emergency panels, leaving D4 looking and feeling uncomfortably like a tomb. You. I think so, Presser said. A pair of shadowy figures crawled out from beneath a desk across the room, resolving into Dillian Presser and his son, Jorid, as they stepped beneath one of the perm lights. Where are all the others? I don't know, Yolier said. Everyone scattered for cover when you gave the collision warning. He looked around. What a mess. That's for sure, Presser agreed grimly rubbing at some blood trickling down his cheek. I wonder what happened. It didn't feel like laser blasts or energy torpedoes, Yolier said. Aside from that, I haven't the faintest idea. Well, first things first, Presser said. 
We need to get everyone together and check for food, water, and medical supplies. After that, we can see about power and living quarters. After that, we can see if we can get to the bridge and figure out what in blazes happened. He started picking his way through the debris, Jorid at his side, clutching his hand tightly. Yeah, it's a good thing you gave us that warning, all right? Yolir commented as they reached the door. How come you knew it was coming? Presser shook his head. I don't know, he said. It just sort of popped into my head. You mean like some kind of Jedi thing? I'm not a Jedi, Chaz, Presser said firmly. I probably heard something moving or scraping against the hull. Precursor asteroid gravel, or maybe atmospheric friction. Something like that. Sure, Yolier said. That's probably it. But whether or not Presser was a Jedi, there was definitely something strange about him. And after what the Jedi had done to outbound flight, Yulia would be watching Presser and his family. He would be watching them very closely. In the meantime, there was a little matter of survival to deal with. Ducking under a twisted section of ceiling panel, he followed Presser down the corridor. End of Star Wars Outbound Flight by Timothy Zahn